This is an unabridged audiobook by author Megan Linsky. To maintain content guidelines, certain scenes have been removed from this audiobook. Summaries of these deleted scenes can be found within this audio. To listen to this full audiobook with deleted scenes, please visit meganlinsky.com. The Fae Queen Hidden Legends University of Sorcery, Book 6 Written by Megan Linsky Narrated by Liana Walsh and Max Pinkins Chapter 1 Ethan The quiet was so jarring it could wake the dead. Midnight darkened the ruins of Dolinska. There was nothing left of the city besides crumbled buildings and piles of rubble. Amongst it all was the scent of blood and corpses buried beneath the concrete. We moved as a small group through the disaster, specters congregating at a mass grave as a light snowfall coated the once perfect streets. Arthur and Finlay roamed beside me, my only companions within this dark night. We'd taken a portal to the forests outside the city and snuck our way into Dolinska in order to search for our missing friends that might have survived the destruction. I was losing hope that there were any. As I surveyed the carnage, a lullaby I knew as a child struck me, such a distant memory that it almost seemed like someone else's recollection. Droga, Droga, master of night, came to eat my soul, slipped in at night to take a bite and swallowed me up whole. We remained close together as we continued on our mission. We couldn't afford to lose each other in this mess. We forged in the direction of the palace, shivering as a winter breeze rushed through the husks of trees still standing in the local park. There was a depraved snarling up ahead. Hunched forms loomed over frozen bodies accompanied by the tearing of flesh. As we neared, I took in their bare, naked humanoid bodies, soulless eyes and gnashing teeth. They ran on four-clawed paws, bits of jagged flesh hanging off their forms. Ghouls. Dozens of them. I readied to defend myself, but the monsters merely hissed and ran away, fading into nests they'd created out of rubble. Ghouls were vile creatures. They were disgusting monsters that fed on carrion. They loved digging up graveyards to devour those who'd been laid to rest. They were always violent. They hadn't attacked us, which meant there were plenty of bodies for them left to feed on. I grimaced, and we moved onward. I heard screeching up above, and we ducked behind a fallen building for cover. Skeletal figures in dark cloaks flew overhead, faces shielded by hoods. They made wicked, screeching sounds that pierced the night and turned my blood cold. Wraiths. I hadn't seen one in years, since the last time I'd banished one from Dolinska as the Phantom. Wraiths were formed from the souls of those who'd been wronged, and there were many Fae who'd been cheated out of life, killed off here during Dolinska's siege. Best to avoid them, Finlay whispered. I nodded, and we crept as quietly as possible in the opposite direction the wraiths had flown. One wraith we could take, two maybe, but a whole host of them like that would certainly mean our doom. We'd come here to do one thing only, and damn it, I planned on accomplishing something other than our deaths. Droga, Droga, stag of wrath, took his teeth and chomped. His antlers smashed my bones to bits cut and sliced and chopped. Monsters were running reckless here. Even if the city managed to repair itself, somehow it'd take a legion of fae to clear all of them out. Everything had been ruined. I saw a thin outline in the distance, nearly appeared like a crowd. They almost looked like fae, but they were so still and too far off the ground. I didn't see any wings. What's that? Finlay asked, but his voice died with horror as the image came closer into view. Lining the city streets was a fence made of bodies. The limp forms of sorceresses and shifters hung suspended on pikes. They'd been impaled with stakes mounted along the city's barren streets. I recognized them as the same soldiers who'd fought for me and lost their lives at the fortress. I sneered. Gabby had put the corpses of her enemies on display to serve as a warning against anyone who dared to rise up again. The image of the hanging soldiers reminded me horribly of my father, run through and hanging on the Lachane's root. 
Droga, droga, dark lord of death, bury him so deep. Leave him to rot beneath the ground and put him back to sleep. I turned my back on them, hard to do, for it felt like a betrayal, and looked to Arthur. Anything? I don't see any recent tracks with my shifter sight, and I don't smell anyone either. The last person who came through here had to have run by weeks ago, he said. It's not a sure thing they won't come by now, Finlay said. I shifted into a woven. Stay low to the ground. We don't want anyone to see us coming. The ruins weren't heavily guarded, if at all. There wasn't anything left to guard. All that remained of Dolinska was rubble. Over the past month, Gabby and Droga had made their residence at Arcania University, and most of their devoted followers lived inside the school walls. Their soldiers and other general supporters lived outside the university, in elaborate new complexes that had been built in the woods beyond. Thus, all the action was on the other side of the city. Here, everything had been mostly deserted. That didn't mean the occasional soldier didn't wander by every now and then, and the last thing we needed was him sounding the alarm and alerting Droga to our presence. The Dark God still wanted Emma. I would not allow myself to be taken as a hostage and used as a weapon against my wife. If we were caught, we'd all agreed to end our lives first before we allowed ourselves to be captured. I had a dagger to do so, though I sincerely hoped I didn't need to use it. We came to the site of the collapsed palace. Sorrow overcame me like I'd never felt before. The jewel of the city had been smashed to rubbish. Heaps of stone lay where the fallen towers were. The gardens that had been enchanted to be forever spring lay black and dead, spells broken beside ruined courtyards and demolished rooms. The three of us changed back to start sifting through the wreckage, we were looking for anything, really. Traces of the living or dead, scraps of clues. I'd promised Arthur and Finlay we'd get their girls back, whether that be alive or just to give them a decent burial. I wasn't sure if there was anything out here to find. We'd found a couple of bodies amongst the rubble, kept preserved by the extreme cold, but nothing else. Finlay overturned a couple of boulders while Arthur and I moved a large beam, searching for hints underneath. We kept finding corpses, corpses, and more corpses. Nobles and servants alike lay in a stone grave beneath the fallen castle. I located a couple of my council members amongst the stones, Lord Grey, Lady Raylin. The circle had been at the palace when it fell inward. I doubted any of them were alive now, and if they had managed to escape, Gabby had probably run them down and killed them. Vera could be anywhere, Arthur said in an aching way. She might not be here at all, I said, though I doubted it. We won't return until we find something. Can't you feel through your bond if she's still alive? Finlay asked. Our bond is weak. We've been so far apart for so long I can't tell. Arthur gave a saddened sigh. I walked to the east, to where I believed our quarters had been. I shifted through the rubble. I found some of our old clothes and a couple of books I'd been reading before our wedding. Somewhere near the top of the pile, I located our hand-fasting cord, along with the gold rose I'd given Emma as a wedding present. I pocketed them in my cloak before sifting through the rest of the bricks. I wanted to find Emma's grimoire, as it had been in her office when the palace collapsed. I didn't locate it. It was probably buried at the bottom. I gave up searching and sighed as I took over the remnants. If anyone had survived the collapse of the palace, they'd either suffocated or starved to death in the meantime waiting for help. Dolinska had been flattened over a month ago. There couldn't be anyone who still remained in this. There was a buzzing in my ear, like insect wings, and a soft mewling. Astonishment flooded through me as a tiny fakin levitated out of the stones. Tigris, you made it out. I opened my hand, and the Maladui landed on my palm. He purred as he rubbed himself against my skin. Emma's going to be thrilled, Arthur said, peering at Tigris. How did you survive? Tigris gave a little growl before he let out a sneeze. He fluttered his wings impatiently and soared off my hand, doing little circles before he tugged at the edge of my cloak with his teeth. I think he wants us to follow, Finlay said. Lead the way, Tigris. We maneuvered around the wreckage and followed Tigris. He buzzed ahead, bringing us to a pile of boards lying on the ground. He flew in manic circles, and Finlay said, Must be something underneath here. Arthur and I moved the boards aside. Below us was the familiar sight of the spiraling staircase that went down into the basement of the palace. It was still standing. The Hall of Wonders, 
I marveled. I shifted aside the rest of the rubble and took the stairs downward. Arthur and Finlay followed me. They creaked under our weight, and I worried the whole structure might collapse. We finally got to the bottom floor. The door to the Hall of Wonder stood before us. I opened it cautiously, wondering if the magic still worked. The Hall of Wonders had been transformed into some kind of shelter. The walls were fortified metal. There was a group of small beds inside, as well as a radio sitting on a nearby table. A group of four people were huddled around a lantern for light. Tigris zoomed forward, whizzing over their heads, and they all looked up. Vera! Arthur cried. He rushed forward to embrace his mate, weeping tears of relief. Vera hugged him back, clutching her stomach. She was heavily pregnant now with their twins. Finn! Amantha screeched his name as she tore across the length of the hall to throw herself on him. He squeezed her tight and rocked her back and forth, muttering something in Gaelic. Jasper rose from his seat, grasping Ozzy's hand. About time you showed up. Yeah, Ozzy said. I thought we'd be waiting down here forever. I could hardly believe it. We'd found Vera, Amantha, Ozzy, and Jasper, and what was more, all of them were alive. They were filthy, covered in cuts and dried blood with clothes that looked near rags, but they'd survived the collapse. It's good to see all of you made it, I said with a sigh of relief. But how? When Gabby's troops infiltrated the city, we knew we'd never get out, so we decided to hide, Jasper said. Vera had the idea to go to the Hall of Wonders, and it was a good thing she did. Once Droga destroyed the palace, the hall turned into a bomb shelter, and the magic that Lady Magdalena used to build it made the illusion real. It protected us from the building caving in. It didn't get past me that Vera had made the suggestion to hide in the Hall of Wonders. It's like she knew the attack was coming, but I held my tongue for now. How did you make it this long? Finlay asked, squeezing Amantha to his side. We've been sneaking out every so often to gather food and water, Amantha said. When we came back, we put things over the staircase so no one realized it was there, Ozzy said. That was my idea. Jasper has been using the radio to try and get in contact with someone, or at least to find out what's going on out there, Vera said. The only broadcast we can tune into was one run by Gabby supporters. I can't imagine they've been saying kind things, I said sarcastically. No, Vera shook her head. The broadcast has been repeating for days that you and Emma are both dead and Gabby's the rightful ruler of the Arcania. We feared they were right and that you were all gone. But we had hope that you weren't when she failed to display the bodies, Jasper added. It's the only thing that kept us going. Did the broadcast say if... Droga has undergone the ritual to turn Gabby into a goddess? I asked. We'd been worrying about that for weeks. We had no sort of intelligence anymore. We couldn't spy on what Gabby or Droga were doing. They didn't say anything of the sort, Vera said, though that doesn't mean it hasn't happened. Has the broadcast mentioned what they're planning on doing next? I asked. We don't know what he's up to. Things have been quiet since they took over, Jasper said. I mean... What is there left to do anymore? Ozzy said with a shrug. They won the war. What more do they want? Droga always wants more, Vera said, haunted. He's just enjoying his time back in the mortal realm after being trapped for so long, ordering Fae around and consuming their souls. Once he gets bored, he'll start conquering again. Why didn't you try to escape the city? Finlay asked. We thought about leaving, but weren't sure where everyone had gone. Amantha dropped her gaze. None of us are strong enough to create portals like the rest of you. Doesn't matter now. We're together. Let's make a portal and go, Finlay said roughly. He hadn't removed his arm from around Amantha's shoulders since we'd gotten here. Portals won't work inside city walls. Droga's put a ward around Delinska to prevent them, Amantha said. Another reason why we couldn't leave. We agreed that it'd be better to wait for a rescue instead of trying to get out of the city ourselves. But so much time passed and... No one showed up. Tears marred her gaze and guilt sucked me inward. We'd been recovering in Ireland, but the four of them had been barely surviving out here for the past month. Weeks had gone by with no sign of us returning. I wished we'd come sooner, no matter how dangerous it had been. I'm sorry we took so long, Arthur apologized. Gabby's troops surrounded the perimeter of the city until just a few days ago. We weren't able to break through the line without getting caught. It doesn't matter I always knew you'd come, Vera insisted, and she kissed Arthur. 
You wouldn't leave me or your babies behind. We portaled in outside of Dolinska. Looks like we'll have to make it back to the woods if you want to escape, I noted. Sneaking a group this large out of the city stood a great risk of attracting attention, but what choice did we have? We took the spiraling staircase upward and returned to the ruined streets. Arthur and Finlay shifted into wolves, boosting their sorceresses onto their backs. Jasper shifted into an alicorn. Gods, I haven't gotten to stretch my wings in about a month, Jasper moaned. He let out a groan as his wings unfolded at his sides. Ozzy tried to change into a dragon, but couldn't manage. He stumbled forward and said, Jazz, I'm weak. I haven't eaten in... I know. Get on my back, Jasper ordered. Ozzy pulled himself onto Jasper by use of his mane. I counted quickly and scowled. The rest of you should fly out of the city. It'll be the quickest way, I said. We shouldn't split up now, Finlay growled. Arthur doesn't have wings, and I can't carry him and Vera both, I said. We'll proceed on foot. Are you sure? Amantha asked. It's the only way. We can't waste precious time arguing about this. Finlay can make a portal once you're in the woods, I said. He knows where to go. Finlay nodded, though reluctantly. He spread his wings and flew Amantha into the air. Jasper and Ozzy followed him into the gray clouds above. Arthur turned to me with a low growl. You have wings now, Ethan. You can go with them. He was the only fay among us who couldn't fly, as he hadn't earned his wings and his mate wasn't able to fly herself. She was just too weak. I gave a humored smile. If I come back home without her brother, my wife will have my head. I'll stay with you. My time as the Phantom gave me expert knowledge of these city streets, even ruined as they were. I could get Arthur and Vera out of here quicker. Tigris hummed at my side as we proceeded toward the eastern gate. We had to pass by the impaled soldiers again if we were to get out of here. My gut grew hollow as their lonely forms loomed above us. Vera gasped as she saw the mounted bodies and turned her sights away. I never left the Hall of Wonders because I was too pregnant to hurry through the streets quickly, she hushed. I didn't think. Don't look at them, Vera, Arthur rumbled. He set his gaze ahead as if he too could not bear the sight. I could see the trees. We could escape and leave this cursed city behind us. There was a loud noise, and Vera let out a wail of pain behind me. I spun around. A spell had knocked her from Arthur's back. She clutched at her belly, face twisted in pain. Vera! Arthur struggled to help her up. I turned in the direction the spell had come from. Black claw enforcers prowled out of the shadows, black cloaks and skull masks streaked with blood. These streets were ripe for picking sacrifices. Hatred unlike anything I'd felt before inside of me. I wanted to take the anger of losing my city out on the first unlucky bastard that strolled in my path. i have been waiting for weeks to get such an opportunity, and now that it was presented, my grief became unbound and uncontrollable. I snarled and changed into a wolven. My teeth ripped out the jugular of the first cultist I got my paws on before I plunged my teeth into another. Unseely spells began flying against the night, but I dodged them all and ripped apart whatever cultist was closest bit by bit. Tigris flew forward, giving a yowl. His magic exploded out of him, and when it hit the nearest cultist, immediately blew him to pieces. Vera remained curled on the ground. She clutched her belly and didn't get up. She was too weak. Arthur gave a vicious snarl, and his form became a dark shadow. His body turned into black smoke as he flew forward, slamming into the cultists one by one. They gave dying gasps as they hit the ground. Arthur's unseely magic stealing their lives the moment his shadowed form made impact. We killed them all. There could be no witnesses left alive. I stood over their corpses, dripping with gore and heaving with bloodlust. I felt manic, nearly like a monster. But this was a small taste of revenge. It wasn't quite enough. Can you stand? Arthur had changed back into a man and went to help Vera. No, she gasped. I don't have the strength. Arthur hefted Vera into his arms. Ethan, we need to get out of here now. We're almost there. I kept my eyes, ears, and nose on the lookout for cultists as we fled through the eastern gate. We hurried through the trees to create some distance between the city and us before we dared making a portal. Arthur and Vera were terrified, but not I. I felt a kind of madness overtake me as my wolf raged inside. Where were Gabby's soldiers? More cultists? Droga himself? As foolish as the thought was, I wanted them to find me, 
I wanted to kill more. Kill them all. Here, Arthur put Vera down. She slung her arms around his shoulders to keep herself standing as he conjured a portal. The sights of Ireland and the mansion formulated inside. I changed back into a man and opened up my cloak. Tigris flew inside to hide in one of my pockets as I observed the portal. I hesitated to step on through. I wanted to remain here, go back into the city, and see who I could find. Slaughter them. Execute them all. Ethan, Arthur insisted. He shoved me through. I stumbled through the portal, though not of my own choice, and Arthur followed me with Vera. I felt sour once the portal closed behind us. The sound of the rushing sea filled my ears, though it was barely distinguishable from the roaring of rage within my soul. I hadn't realized I was this angry. Vera needs help, Arthur said roughly. He started toward the estate, and I didn't have anything else to do, so I followed. Jasper, Ozzy, and Amantha were gathered around the fireplace in the main foyer. They all had mugs in their hands and hot meals on their laps. They'd be safe, and they'd heal. I wasn't so sure about Vera. She looked deathly pale. Arthur looked at me desperately, wanting help. I didn't know what to do. All I wanted to do was destroy. Stefan came rushing in from the other room. He glanced at Vera, then shouted, Mom! Miroslava Slavsky threw back the doors to the kitchen. She frowned as she placed a hand on Vera's forehead, then said, Get her to the bedroom. Arthur carried Vera up to his quarters. He laid her on the bed, and Miroslava began rustling for things in her bag. She placed pills on the wardrobe and potions. My babies, Vera said weakly, head lolling. The babies will be fine, Miroslava said, though she worked quickly. Arthur, I need you to remain by her side. She needs rest and medicine. What can I do? I asked. Stay out of the way. Miroslava's answer was brusque. I felt cowed. I stepped out of the room to give her the room she needed to work. Stefan was waiting for me outside. It's amazing you got everybody back. I thought for sure. Well, he shrugged. I leaned against the wall and said, I thought we'd find them dead too. Though Vera took them to the Hall of Wonders before the palace collapsed, it's the only reason they survived. I crossed my arms. It's like she knew the assault was coming in advance. Stefan raised an eyebrow. You really think she's the traitor after all this? She's practically on death's door. I can't be sure. But things just aren't adding up, I said. Regardless, she's here now, and so are the others. Whether they be enemies or friends, we need to keep both close. Ethan, you can't go distrusting the people around you. We're all each other's god now, Stefan scolded. Somebody turned their back on us, I hissed. I need to find out who. Stefan stared at me. I think you just want somebody to take your anger out on, he said slowly. And if you want to go a few rounds to get some pent-up aggression out, I'm all for taking this outside and tossing a few punches. But throwing around accusations at a time like this is uncalled for. I huffed. I don't want to fight. I want someone to take some God's damn responsibility for what happened out there. What are you going to do? It's all our fault, if we're honest, Stefan pointed out. I ground my teeth together. I'm more responsible than the rest of you. I'd been king, and my disastrous rule had resulted in all of this. I know you want vengeance, but that isn't going to mend what's been done, Stefan argued. The only way we can fix the past is by preventing the future. I gave a harsh scoff. Thanks for being my voice of reason. I'm always your voice of reason, Stefan paused, which is actually terrible because I have the worst judgment. No wonder you're such a fuck up. He meant it in jest. But I didn't laugh. I hadn't laughed for days now, not since my wedding. That seemed so long ago now. His face fell when I failed to respond. I have to check on Emma. She needed me. Though it was past midnight, I could feel through our bond she was awake. I left Stefan behind me and proceeded toward my own quarters, feeling watched by the portraits in this old house. I'd thought the ghosts of my past had haunted me. They were tricks of the light compared to the monsters that plagued me now. Our room was dark. I failed to turn on a light and instead navigated the area by the moonlight coming through the window. I sat at the edge of the bed. Emma looked out at me, eyes glossed over. I stared down at my mate. Emma still hadn't healed from the battle a month ago. She'd sustained three broken ribs, a cracked hip bone, not to mention several bruised organs. 
My mate had been on bed rest for most of the month, as ordered by Miroslava, though I worried she wasn't getting any better, but worse. Not even healing potions were working to mend her body. Did you find them? Emma rasped. I could tell by her voice she was in a great deal of pain. Everyone's back. They survived. I went to move her hair out of her eyes, but she cringed at my touch. Even my fingers against her skin was too much for her to bear. The very act of being touched was torturous to her. Good. Emma grimaced and shifted on the bed. The rustling in my cloak became frantic. Someone's excited to see you. I opened up my cloak. There was a thrilled humming as Tigris flew out of it. Tigris! Emma's expression was delighted. She stroked his fur with one finger as Tigris cuddled up to her cheek. Found him in the wreckage. It's a miracle he got out, I said. Oh, I thought he was dead. Tears rose in her eyes, and she kissed his tiny form. Thank you for bringing him back. Of course. Tigris nestled in her hair, and Emma's eyelids fluttered. She gave another wince of pain. I wish I could sleep. This will help. I placed two fingers on her temple and drew them down her eyelids. She immediately was out of it. I watched her carefully as her chest rose and fell, though her nose still scrunched in pain, even deep within her dreams. I'd been having to bewitch her to sleep every night. She just couldn't get any rest. She felt guilty and responsible, and I was past the point of blaming her for it, more so myself. I just wanted her to get better. She hadn't cast a single spell since she'd been here. She hadn't been able to, though she'd tried. Emma needed time to rest, and that was time she didn't have as the world weaver. The crystals of harmony needed to be united in a year's time. Otherwise, the portal to Edenmire would close, and the Fae would turn to dust. She couldn't afford to take time off. But seeing her like this, she couldn't fight even if she wanted to. We couldn't spend our time searching Malovia for the Unseelie Stone if she could barely make it out of this bed. She'd barely left this room in weeks, sustaining herself on broth that she choked up the moment she got it down. Part of me wondered if we would have to do this without her, and I knew that wouldn't work. This was dependent on her, but Emma had never been at a weaker point. I wish I could just take you away from all of this, I whispered. I'd never felt like a bigger failure as a husband, and we hadn't been married that long. So much for newlywed bliss. Droga was looking for her, and though he hadn't found her yet, I wasn't certain the estate would remain safe forever. Once Droga located Emma, he'd send his minions and his armies to retrieve her. They can come. I'll enjoy mutilating every last one. I failed to curl away from the cruel voice within. It was eerily similar to the Lachanes during my time of possession, but I knew the person who was speaking to be no demon. It was the beast inside, the part of me that festered for some sort of justice and a way to make this right. I thought the only way to do so was to make our enemies pay with blood, and I thirsted for it. Chapter 2 Emma Dying couldn't be as painful as this. There wasn't a part of me that didn't ache. The strands of my muscles felt like they were being pulled apart bit by bit, whether I was moving or not, mashed and crushed underneath my own weight. I constantly checked the mirror for bruises, but saw nothing, though I was certain that if my body was to show what I felt like, every part of me would be purple and yellow. My broken ribs and cracked femur sent quaking jolts of agony through my body whenever I took a step. My skin was sensitive to every shift of my clothes. It nearly felt like I was being scratched whenever the cloth drew across it. When I inhaled to breathe, each gasp of air felt like fire pouring down into my lungs. The feeling was constant, a mixture of someone beating you up with a baseball bat and stabbing you everywhere and in all places all at the same time. Even the follicles of my hair hurt. My scalp tingled and twinged, like I had a variety of needles sticking into it and drawing blood across the surface. I'd never been in more pain. I was used to flare-ups. With my illness, they weren't unusual. But this one had already lasted more than a month. I hadn't dealt with such immense pain for such a long time before. I'd put up with this kind of pain, at most, for a week or so. This seemed like endless torture. And there was no escape. The pain was all I could think about. 
It consumed my every thought and followed me even in my sleep where I'd have dreams about it. The agony made me delirious and left me broken into pieces, someone who wasn't even a person, but a nameless thing that was deliriously hanging on to life. I knew pain, I recognized it, and dealt with it every day. But this wasn't any regular pain. It wasn't living at all. I had the thought one too many times that if I had a poison, I'd drink it just to put myself out of my misery, and it frightened me. It was some time in the afternoon. Ethan had gotten up a while ago, though he hadn't left my side until I'd begged him to go. Being in pain was hard, but having someone watch you suffer was humiliating, especially when it was someone you loved. It was easier to be alone than it was to look at the sympathy in someone else's eyes as they realized they could do nothing for you. I felt obligated to pull myself together instead of fall apart when I had my loved ones around me, and there was nothing to pull together, which only made it that much more unbearable. I had a goal today. Walk to the end of the hallway and back. It seemed like a tremendous task, but I'd made it halfway there yesterday, so I was determined to beat that goal today. As I prepared to swing my legs out of bed, thoughts downpoured over me. What if I can't make it? What if I fall? Shit, what if I faint and hit my head on something? What if I fall down the stairs and break my neck? What if... <sighs> Weeks ago, I'd been one of the fiercest warriors the Fae had ever known. I'd been able to summon monsters to my command, overpower the minds of other Fae, and cast incredible magic as I swung my sword and eliminated my foes. Now... I was terrified to walk around my own house. I didn't think I could perform a powerful spell no matter how hard I tried. I forced myself to sit up and let out a cry of pain as I did so. The room spun. I reached for the bucket Ethan had left by my bedside and heaved into it, but nothing came up. I must have done something to deserve this. I'd offended the gods, in a past life or otherwise, to earn this pain. There was no other explanation. Tigris, who'd been sleeping on the pillow beside me, flew up and anxiously pulled a few strands of hair out of my eyes. He yanked too hard and ended up tumbling into the mattress. I opened the side table drawer and rummaged through it for my pills. I choked down some morphine along with a sip of water. The morphine was nearly like taking candy. It made me functional, but didn't relieve the pain, only dulled it. But at least with it, I could pretend like I wanted to survive. Miroslava, along with her husband, Jonathan, had relocated to the estate to help us out. Miroslava had been obtaining my medicine by getting help from doctor friends she knew, but everything I needed had to be smuggled, as we couldn't risk Droga catching wind of where I was. She was putting her medical license on the line for me, and I felt as grateful as I did guilty. I wanted to recover. I hoped my medicine would help me do that, but it failed to provide a miracle cure. I'd really messed up my body this time. I'd pushed myself too hard when we fought Gabby, and I'd been paying for it ever since. My legs wobbled and felt like water underneath me as I forced myself to stand. The world rocked like I was on a boat, but I remained conscious, so I took it as a good sign. I shuffled forward and put a hand on the wall to steady myself. To think that I'd been chosen to be an Olympic athlete and now I was this. I couldn't reconcile the two. It was like that girl before was a stranger. I couldn't remember the gravity-defying jumps I performed once upon a time. To be honest, I couldn't remember a time when I didn't feel like a walking corpse. Existing itself was tormenting. It erased all thought of who I'd been and who I was. I didn't have an identity when I was like this. I was reduced to a life form that was less than animal, my only thought being when this might possibly end. I hobbled like an old lady down the hallway. I was held captive upstairs. I didn't think I could make it back up here if I made it down to the first floor, so I was too afraid to try. Tigris coaxed me onward, bobbling ahead of me like a coach training a world-class runner. Ethan brought me food, or at least he tried. I could take down water, but that was it. 
Even my grandmother's delicious food couldn't touch my lips without sending me into nausea. I'd spent most of my time here lying in bed, slipping in and out of it. I was so exhausted that I was hardly ever coherent, but when night came, my anxiety kept me awake. I stayed up worrying about what would happen if Droga found me and what he would do after he captured me. The room blacked out for a moment and my knees buckled, but I managed to stay on my feet. Good. I was proud of myself. I heard a cute little snuffling noise ahead. Tigris grumbled, and my eyes flashed up. There was some sort of creature. It walked on two legs, and was covered in a mess of long brown fur, with green eyes and cute, soft paws. It looked kind of like a sloth. When the creature heard me take a step, its big brown eyes widened at me. It tottered out of the way before it began wiping off a window with a little towel. Such a strange creature. I didn't know what it was, but it seemed harmless and very intent on getting a smudge off the window. Maybe my grandmother had summoned it to clean. I moved past it and then slipped into the library. The library at the estate was beautiful, as most libraries were. It had grand, open windows with seats that overlooked the ocean. It had a lot of natural lighting, and the shelves were painted white. There was a fireplace in the middle of the room and lots of cozy armchairs to read in. I collapsed into the nearest armchair. I flicked my fingers to try and summon a book from the shelves, but nothing happened. I sighed. Tigris hovered the book off the shelf with his magic and set it in front of me. I couldn't use my powers whatsoever. I hadn't cast a single spell since I'd arrived at the mansion. I mean, it made sense. If I couldn't remain standing long enough to go downstairs, no way would I be able to perform a spell. I just had to wait to get better so I could use my magic again. I feared terribly that I'd never get better. That very idea made me want to throw myself off the nearby cliffs and into the raging sea. I couldn't live the rest of my life reduced to a shadow of who I'd been before. Tigris perched on my shoulder as I turned pages aimlessly. The words on the page were written in English, but I couldn't comprehend them. Might as well be written in a language I didn't know. Tears beaded my eyes as I thought of the powerful queen I'd been before and what I'd been reduced to now. Encaptured by these memories, under my breath, I began humming the words of the Malovian National Anthem. From a place there far beyond, we defend this glorious land. For our children and our people, for our country, we will stand. We raise up our sword and shield. We seek war within our mind. Victory be ours and conquering shall be mine. All shall bow their heads and pledge allegiance to the king and queen. In every nation round the world shall our glory be seen. All people before us will surely fall down to their knees. From a place there far beyond, we defend this glorious land. For our children and our people, for our country, we will stand. From a place there far beyond, we find our bravery in this song. Emerging from the pale, a battle dawns. A tear slipped down my cheek as I mumbled the words. The anthem was so powerful and strong. It was everything I felt I wasn't and could never be again. There was a click as the door opened and I hastily wiped my tears away. Odette, Chiara, and Delmer stepped in. Odette was holding a cup of coffee, while Delmer had come to return a book. Chiara was following them, though she didn't seem to have a reason to be here. Odette said something. I recognized her voice, but didn't truly hear her words. Whenever someone spoke to me now, there was always static. A buzzing accompanied their words that made everything so hard to understand. Sorry, could you repeat that? I felt stupid. I didn't comprehend what she'd said. I set the book aside and looked up at her. Odette clutched her coffee mug, and her fingers turned white. In a small voice, Odette said, I hate you. What? I blinked. I must have misheard again. She doesn't mean that, Delmer rushed to say, giving a harsh glance at Odette. I hadn't spoken much to my friends since we'd gotten here. I'd spent so much time in recovery, I didn't have much energy left for conversation. I, I don't. This is all your fault. Odette stamped her foot. 
We shouldn't be here. Not in this country, not in this place. Dolinska is gone, and you ruined it, Emma. She's just upset, Kiara added. We hadn't seen pictures of what was left of the city yet, but they were on the supernatural news today, and... So they'd been confronted with the terrible truth. Here in Ireland, so far away from Malovia, they could continue to pretend that the news they'd been given was all a bad dream. Confronted with footage of what the city looked like, they were no longer able to ignore reality. My mouth flattened. I'm sorry. I knew you'd have to see it someday. It never should have happened at all, Odette hissed. I'm so furious that you allowed Gabby to take your blood and raise Droga from the dead. She wasn't the only one. I was pissed off about how dumb I'd been and how my reckless decisions had destroyed lives. It wasn't like I had a choice. I growled. Bullshit. You knew it was going to happen. You had forewarning and a prophecy, but you did what you wanted anyway. Odette snapped. Did what I wanted? I repeated. Nothing that went down that day was easy. You could have made it easy if you just stayed behind like we told you. Tears were brimming in Odette's eyes now. We were so devoted to you and were willing to do everything to make sure you didn't put yourself in danger, but you didn't care about that. You didn't think about your friends, only what you felt like you had to do. Guys, Dalmere said, trying to break us up, but her cry fell flat. In her tone, I noticed something. Deep sadness. A part of her, even small, blamed me for what I'd done, just like Odette did. I was a queen. I made a decision that I felt was best for my nation, I said, seething. Accompanied by the pain now was anger, and it was so overwhelming it wanted to burst out of me and consume everything in this room. If you hadn't snuck off, Droga wouldn't have destroyed Dolinska. Lady Magdalena would still be alive, Odette cried. A pang ran through me at the mention of her name. Her face... I couldn't get it out of my head. You think I don't know that? I screamed. Don't you think I've paid for what I've done? Girls, Kiara said, attempting to calm us. Fuck you, Emma! Odette threw the cup at me, and it shattered against the wall next to my armchair. She slammed the door as she ran out. I wanted to follow her, but there was no way in hell I was getting my ass out of this chair. It'd taken me all morning to prepare for the journey down here, so it'd take all afternoon to get back to my quarters. I leaned forward over my knees and huffed, pissed off I couldn't do so much as storm out. I had no control over my body or how I felt. Then I knew. I wasn't angry at my body for feeling this way. No, I was grieving. For Lady Magdalena, for Dolinska, but most of all, for the person I had been. For that once, noble queen was dead, and there was no bringing her back. Gabby might as well have killed me. It would have been more merciful than this fate. It's not your fault, Delmere said. She went to lay a hand on my shoulder before she drew it away. But it is. I'm the reason this happened, I said miserably. We're all upset about Nolinska, but being sad over it won't change the fact that it's gone now, Delmere insisted. We can rebuild it after we defeat Droga. I gave a skeptical noise. You're acting like it's a sure thing. One more crystal left to find. That's what we promised, Delmer reminded me. We can't lose faith now. I forced my feelings to shut off. The more upset I got, the worse the pain became. It was easier to keep myself flat and emotionless. Otherwise, the pain would become so white-hot and blinding that I'd lose my mind. You're right. I gave a deep sigh. I hope she can forgive me. I sure as hell can't. She'll apologize once she gets her feelings out. That footage wasn't easy for any of us to watch. Dalmere's voice was heavy. Kiara didn't say a thing. I think she'd followed Odette in here because she knew what was going to happen and wanted to run interference, though her words had died against Odette's anger. Did you find out what happened to Siona? I asked. 
We hadn't been able to locate Kiara's sister since the collapse of Dolinska, and I was worried about her. I actually got in contact with my parents. She was one of the few people who made it out. She's living with them in the Griffin village, but her store is gone. She lost everything, Kiara said sadly. Enchanting Whispers had been one of my favorite stores in Dolinska. I knew the shop had been Siona's life. I'm so sorry. She survived. She knows she's lucky for that alone. Kiara nibbled on her lip. I should find Odette. She needs someone to talk to right now. Kiara dipped out. Delmere dropped a hand to her pregnant belly and rubbed the top of it. Not long now, I told her as she took a seat across from me. No. Delmere stared out the window. I wish it wasn't so soon. We need more time. This world isn't safe for my child. I don't think it ever was safe for any child, I stated. But the estate is protected. Droga hasn't found us yet, and he would have by now if he had any idea where we'd gone. As long as your baby stays here, they'll be okay. Delmere nodded. That's what I'm counting on. The door swung open again. I cringed, thinking it was Odette coming back to give me another piece of her mind, but it was only my grandparents, accompanied by my brother and Lord Lucian. Would the lot of you mind keeping it down? Bobka said crossly. This is a home, not a boxing ring. Sorry, I said sheepishly. My brother took a seat across from me, and I asked, How's Vara? Much better, now that she's got some food and medicine in her. She should be fine in a few days, Arthur told me. That was a huge relief. Puck the dog wandered in, laying his head on my lap. I gave him a few pats on the head before he laid down at my feet. Papa was carrying a tray. He sat it on the coffee table in front of me and said, Thought some tea might help your stomach. Thank you. I sat forward and took a cup and a saucer. Papa poured me some tea, and I set it aside to let the leaves stew. Lucian gave me a smile. It's nice to see that you're up and around. In a way, I hadn't left my room in days. I knew my father was worried about me. Things have been busy here, Lucian poured himself some tea. Seep tore through the fence just yesterday. I had to replace it for the second time this winter. The estate was a working farm. Bobka and Papa had hired farm hands to tend to the animals in their absence, but had let them all go once we'd gone into hiding, as we didn't want some servant running off and telling everyone where we were. That meant the share of the farm chores fell to all of us. It was a good thing. We needed a distraction. We'd promised to go searching for the Unseelie Stone, but to be honest, with me out of commission and things being what they were, we'd all been too depressed to start looking for them, even while on a deadline. The various farm creatures around the property had given my friends something to do in the meantime. I have to say, none of you would make very good farmers, Papa grumbled. Lucian gave a chuckle, and I realize now how similar their accents and mannerisms were. They sat in the same way, moved in similar ways, and even had similar expressions. How hadn't I figured out Lucian was my father? I should have known the moment I met Papa. I just hadn't put two and two together. Yes, Stefan nearly smothered himself with wool trying to pick up that ram. And just this morning, Ethan fell on his face trying to wrangle the cows into the pasture. Delmere laughed. A noise burst up from my belly and out my throat. I didn't recognize it because it wasn't familiar until I realized what Delmere had said was funny. It was the first time I'd laughed since. Well, but it was funny. The thought of my dignified mate clumsily clomping through the muck after a herd of bovines only to go splat in the mud was hilarious. It made me crack a smile, though it didn't last. Lucian chuckled. I dare say your mate didn't find it as funny as the rest of us did. Speaking of cows, we shall leave out some cream for Bumble, Bobka added. The good stuff from the best cow. Bumble? Is that the funny creature in the hallway? I asked. It was some big brown furry thing. Oh yes, that's our brownie. He's taken care of the estate for ages, Bobka said. Brownies were a type of fakin. They were obsessed with cleaning things and usually bound themselves to one family for generations. But I didn't think they still existed. I thought brownies were extinct. Didn't they disappear after the Seelie and Unseelie War? I asked. When the Unseelie left Malovia and went into hiding, 
They took many of the other fake in with them, including brownies and others, Babka explained. Bumbo keeps the house tidy and helps with the cooking and laundry, Papa said. He kept things up while we were living in Malovia. You mean there are other Fakin here in Ireland? Down there asked in surprise. And Scotland, Papa replied. The Unseelie were worried the Seelie would try to exterminate the other Fakin like they hid the Dark Fae, so we hid them in Celtic lands. Brownies, sea, and many other types of Fakin. Ethan had told me long ago that no Fae knew of our distant relatives, the Brownies and other fairies had survived the Seelie and Unseelie conflict, and no one knew if they still existed. That they were indeed still alive gave me a tiny bit of hope that the world could get better, for as terrible as it seemed right now. Bumble is a gentle soul. We pay him in milk and honey. Brownies are usually loyal to one family their whole lives, and being immortal, that is quite a long time. Babka sipped at her tea. Though they remain at the houses they clean out of their own free will, if you put them out of sorts, they leave. We make sure not to cross Bumble. He does his own thing, and we do ours. Giving orders to a brownie is a sure way to find your china rearranged. Or well, broken, Papa added with a huff. What about the she? I asked. You said that Unseelie brought them here, but what are they, exactly? Ethan told me once that they were fairies of the underground, but failed to say more. The she are descendants of the seven gods themselves. Papa explained. They're a noble race of great beauty and power. Aren't the she technically demigods? Arthur asked. Yes, she is the fair word for demigod, Babka said. I'd rarely heard about demigods. We'd touched on them as a topic at Arcania University, but demigods were rumored to be extraordinarily rare, so we hadn't covered it much. Demigods don't have to be descended from an actual god, right? One can be created by two powerful supernaturals. That is true, but the she are different, as they directly have god blood and are born of one of our goddesses, being Melona, Neva, or Fesna. Babke replied, The she have a goddess mother and a mortal father, but they still identify as demigods. But demigods aren't limited to the fae, I said. From what I know, demigods can be from any supernatural race, but to be a she, you must have fae goddess heritage, and the she are more powerful than any fae alive. Even you, Emma, Papa said around his pipe. I can't even imagine, Delnair said. More powerful than Emma? The she's power must be legendary. Are there she in Ireland or Scotland? I asked. They're rumored to be, Papa said. We unsealy hid them centuries ago, but who knows if there are any still around? They're not known to be immortal. It is said that the she hide in the fairy forts around Ireland and Scotland. That's why they're called fairies of the underground, because they live beneath the mounds scattered across traditionally Celtic regions. Yet Hilbatha and I have searched them, and we've come across nothing. Babka scowled as she set down her tea. Her words prompted bitterness inside of me. I hadn't asked them the question yet, but the burning inside my chest told me I couldn't avoid it any longer. I clutched onto my teacup and averted my eyes as I asked, Why did you leave Malovia when I was crowned queen? I needed you. It felt like my entire family had done that to me all my life. My mother, my father, now my grandparents. I'd been abandoned by all of them. I wanted to know why. Babka frowned. We're sorry, Hema. We didn't wish to leave you, but we had obligations. Obligations to what? I snapped. To your prophecy, Papa replied simply. What else would we travel for? I paused, and Babka went on. We knew that you were on a mission to unite the Crystals of Harmony, but once you had them, what were you to do with them? Your quest was to bring them together to open up a portal to Edenmire, but where and how would you do such a thing? I was aghast. I'd never even thought of that. I don't know what I was thinking, that we'd get the crystals and everything would magically be all right. How silly. I should have realized there'd be a ceremony to open up the portal. Everything else in the Fey world required one. Did you find anything? I asked. Puck was drooling on my socks. I moved my toes out of the way, and he gave a bark. Indeed, Bapa replied. As you know, we've been here for several months. We've spent our time in Ireland looking into any bit of information we could get about the Crystals of Harmony. Through our research, we've concluded that the Crystals must be united at the Sacred Gathering, 
That is the original portal to Inmire, and where the crystals were first formed by the gods. How do you find out about this? Arthur's eyes narrowed as he adjusted his glasses. We figured if anyone had information about the druids, it would be the Onsili. The library here is very old, Babka said. Duek de Rosanna was one of the first Onsili manors in Ireland. It's been passed down through our family for generations. It was also a refuge for druids when they were alive. You see, the druids didn't write down their history. Most everything they taught was passed down orally, but we were lucky enough to have Onsili historians write down what they'd learned from the Draka through the ages. Papa said, We figured somewhere in this library there had to be knowledge of the Crystals of Harmony. But even with the two of you, how'd you manage to find the right information? There have to be hundreds of Draka scrolls and books here, Arthur said. You forget I was here with them, hiding out for many months while faking my own death, Lucian said. He devoted a lot of time to going through the Draka records. What they found was extraordinary. Lucian went to a nearby shelf. He pulled out a tome that appeared very old. He sat back down and opened it up on the coffee table, rifling through the weathered parchment pages. The words were fading. They'd been inscribed with a quill and ink and were written in a language I didn't know. This is a transcription of how the crystals of harmony were made, Lucian said as he turned the book toward me. The gods put some of their power into the stones, then gave them to the Fae so they'd have the ability to travel back and forth from Edemire to Earth. The druids were in charge of the stones, until Domhir scattered them once the Sili and Unsili conflict came to a head many years ago. This when the portal to Enmire was shut. The gods didn't agree with the war between the Fae, so they cut off our connection to our homeland completely. The Fae should have died right then, when they could no longer go back and forth. Arthur said, But Neva, the goddess of time, put a time loop on Edenmire so that didn't happen. That's why time passes differently in Edenmire than Earth, because it doesn't really move forward or backward. Days come and go, but the year remains the same. And that's why Fae are still able to draw their magic from Edenmire today, I stated. That's about to come to an end. If the portal isn't opened in time, a thousand years will pass in the blink of an eye severing the connection between Edenmire and Earth forever, Delmere said. Then the Fae living here on Earth will all die at once. That's what Milana told us. Very good. All of you have done your research, Lucian said. It's the secret gathering is the original portal to Edenmire, and it's there the connection has to be reforged by Emma. The record that this historian left insists that the crystals may only be united at the place where they were first created, and that would be the gathering itself. Do you have any information on the ceremony to reopen the portal? I asked. Lucian sighed. Unfortunately, that information was sealed in a different scroll. We managed to locate it, but it won't be easy to obtain. The scroll is actually locked up in the Dara College archives. Dara College was one of Ireland's oldest universities, but it was also an institution for humans. How do you know it's there? During my research, I found that the historian who left this document behind also wrote another scroll pertaining to the Crystals of Harmony, but the only living copy came into the acquisition of a professor many years ago. Before he died, he donated his existing library to the college, Lucian said. Do humans have a lot of supernatural items in their hands? I asked. More than we think. Dara College actually has loads of fey historical items, though they're regarded as medieval lore. Humans have no idea they're in possession of magical artifacts, Arthur said. Good thing, too. They can't use them against us if they have no idea what they are, Delmere said. Lucian sighed. We offered the university a generous donation for the scroll, but as it is a thousand-year-old document, and therefore priceless, they refuse to part with it. Which means we're going to have to be sneaky fey and steal it, I stated flatly. Precisely, Lucian replied. There is no other way. Excitement stirred within me for the first time since we'd found the Sealy Stone. If we could get into those archives, we could learn the ceremony to unite the crystals. Then, once we found the Unsealy Stone... We could go to the sacred gathering and reopen the portal. Only then this nightmare could end. It sounded so simple, 
I feared it was going to be anything but. If there was one thing I knew about Fay history, it was always more complicated than it appeared at first glance. So how do we plan on stealing the scroll? I asked. It won't be easy getting into those archives. Lucian smiled. Do not worry, my child. I already have a plan in place. God, I hoped so. I needed the help, because all my energy went into my health these days. I knew I was out of ideas. I spent most of that night tossing and turning. The pain coursing through my body was so fierce that I couldn't sleep, not in any position. Ethan was still up, talking with Lord Lucien. I wanted him at my side, and at the same time, I didn't want him to see me like this. The burning sensation spreading through my muscles and bones was so terrible that it brought tears to my eyes. I managed to cast a halfway decent silencing spell around the room before I rolled onto my stomach, buried my face in a pillow, and screamed as loud as I could. It wasn't a scream like any other I'd ever heard before. It was rattling, and it came from a tortured woman, someone who pleaded with death to take her. As I sobbed into the pillow, Tigris gave concerned whines above me, shoving his nose into my hair and making sad little mews. I couldn't take this anymore. I'd rather die than feel like this. I raised my head off the soaked pillow as my mind desperately searched for a solution. Any solution. My mind grasped at the Crystals of Harmony. They had healing abilities. Delmare had used the Dragon Stone to restore Stefan's heart and bring him back to life after he was near certain death. But she'd had to stab him in order to do so, in the heart, no less. I had decided not to use the crystals to try and heal my own disability, because using one of the crystals to take my life, in the hope that it'd end up healing me instead, was too great a risk. That was then, and this was now. I was desperate. I closed my eyes and willed myself as hard as I could to get to Edenmire, transporting my spirit to the hearth fire there. I found myself standing in the living room of my cottage in moments. I felt relief. Here, my spirit didn't feel the pain that my body did, so I got a bit of a reprieve. I'd be in agony once the meditation ended, though, and I swore that I wasn't going back to that. I'd either be dead, or I'd be healed. I couldn't take being sick any longer. I hurried to the armory. I flung open the door and reached for the dagger that held the dragon stone that was mounted on the wall. I snatched it, then placed the tip of the blade against my chest. I took a few steadying breaths. All I had to do was push the blade into my heart, then rip it out like I'd seen Delmere do to Stefan. It would hurt, but not as badly and not as long as the endless torture my disease provided. I'd get it over with quickly, and then I'd be better, or I'd be dead. At least I had tried. I began to push it in until I heard someone utter, Put down the blade, Onawilka. Ethan was standing in the doorway of the armory in his wolf form. His ears were perked up, and his dark eyes bore into me. He appeared calm, although nothing about this situation was okay. How did you know I was here? I rasped out. I was pissed he'd interrupted me. I could not wake you from your sleep, and I realized you had to be meditating. I sensed something was wrong. Ethan said, I understand what you're feeling is unbearable, but this is not the way. You don't know what it's like to live like this. None of you do, I yelled. If I have to bargain with my existence to get a chance of having a normal life, then it's worth it. It's not, Ethan insisted. You don't know what that crystal will do. Their power is unpredictable. It could kill you as easily as it could heal you. How is this any different than me trying an experimental treatment or surgery? I snapped back. I didn't want to listen to him. I just wanted a way out. Because that's not what you would decide. It's not what you want for yourself, Ethan said. You've told me time and again you can live with this disease, that it doesn't define who you are. Well, I can't live with it anymore, I shouted. If I can't get better, I want it to be over with. I'm no use to anyone this way. I don't need you to be useful to me. I need you to love me, 
and that means you need to stop this. Ethan pleaded. What will happen if you use that blade on your spirit here, in the astral realm, and your body remains on Earth? It could be cataclysmic. Then I'll take the dagger back to Earth and use it there, I said firmly. No, you won't, Ethan said, and he crouched down as he prowled forward. We'll find another way. There is no other way, I said weakly, but already my resolve was failing. I couldn't do this while Ethan watched. The dagger slipped out of my hand and clattered onto the floor as I let my arm drop. I sank to my knees, and Ethan rushed forward to catch me. I wasn't sure if there'd ever be a cure or a way out of this pain. I couldn't resist it, fight it, or end it. All I could do was find a way to endure it. Losing all hope, I collapsed into Ethan and wept. Chapter 3 Ethan Emma, you can't go. We were preparing to set off for Darig College. I planned to take a small group with me in order to locate the archives and find the document that would unveil the ceremony Emma needed to perform in order to unite the crystals. My wife was insistent upon coming, even though she could barely stand. This is my duty. I refuse to let you go alone. She stood from our bed, but wobbled as she fell back on it. I could see the semblance of pain written across her features. How do you expect to help us search when you're too weak to travel across the room, let alone through a portal to another part of the country? I crossed my arms. I understand your pride, but it needs to be set aside. She sighed and gave in. You're right. I'll just slow you up. It won't always be that way, I said. Stay here and keep recovering your strength. Once we have the documents, we'll return here immediately. It shouldn't take long, Emma mumbled under her breath. Arthur will be able to find them quickly. I immediately balked. I can't take Arthur. We don't know if we can trust him. More appropriately, I wasn't sure we could trust Vera. But Emma gave me a glare. You're going to need Arthur's expertise in fey lore and history. He's the best chance we have of locating those documents. We have Kiara. She's a good researcher, I objected. It's better if we have two scholars than one. The archives at Derrick College are huge. They'll take time to search through, Emma insisted. I need to be sure I can trust him. Shh, she insisted, casting a look at the door. She dropped her voice before she said, This is important. Arthur is the best chance you've got of finding the scrolls quickly before you get caught. If you insist upon him coming, then we need to acknowledge the obvious, I said dryly. I have to confront Arthur about Vera's strange behavior. You can't piss him off now, Emma said in exasperation. Watch me. I stormed out of the room. I heard Emma shuffle behind me, doing her best to follow. I immediately headed to the library, where I knew Arthur would be. He was there reading by candlelight, and speak of the devil, Vera was there with him. She looked up when I entered. Her expression paled, as if she could read on my face what this was about. Already caught in the act. How could she deny it? She looked so guilty. I must speak with the two of you, I said. I foregoed sitting, choosing to take a wide stance in front of their table. What about? Arthur looked tired. He removed his glasses and rubbed his eyes. Vera remained quiet and shifted in her seat. We know there's a traitor in our midst, I began. Someone who has been ferrying information back to Gabby for months now. Did you find out who it was? Arthur sat forward, looking interested. The innocence upon his face was clear, so he had no idea. How cunning Vera had to be to keep this hidden from her mate. I've known for months, but I've failed to comment, I said through clenched teeth. I can hold back no longer. The betrayer is none other than your mate. Vera's mouth dropped open in shock. I expected Arthur to pale, to realize the facts. But instead, his face turned red as he jumped up from his seat. Are you serious? How dare you? I have evidence, I seethed. Vera became Emma's handmaiden almost immediately after we were crowned. She had access to Kiara's room, where she planted the doll that nearly killed her. She could get into Emma's office, where she destroyed her hearth fire and left my wife weak. At the exact time Gabby needed her to be, I spat. 
She saved the others by leading them to the Hall of Wonders. But how would she know what to do and where to go unless she already knew the attack was coming? These are merely suspicions. They're not proof, Arthur raged. Then why did she seem so confident when she sailed to the Spring Princess's island? I accused. She acted like she knew the Spring Princess personally. She was far too confident on our journey to achieve the Seely Stone. And how does that have anything to do with Gabby? Arthur asked, throwing a hand out. I haven't figured it out yet, I said lowly. Arthur let out a cruel laugh. Because you're a dullard. One who apparently loves spewing out false accusations before getting his facts straight. Arthur was blinded by loyalty to his mate, as I expected him to be. It was a fool's hope to expect him to see the light. I instead turned on Vera, placing my hands on the table and leaning in to sneer. What did Gabby promise you in exchange for betraying us? Safety for your children? To not take your mate's life once you won the war? I demand an answer. Vera said nothing, but her lip quivered as I towered over her. Arthur's hand was rough on my chest as he shoved me back. He came around the table and stood between Vera and I. My mate is pregnant. I won't have you upsetting her like this. He was quite a bit shorter than me, but his push had been rough. He was giving me a warning. There was a creaking sound behind us as the door opened. Emma had finally caught up. She leaned against the doorframe as she said, Arthur, I'm sorry. He's not being rational. You're supposed to be taking my side, I raged. How can you defend him when the answer is so blatantly staring you in the face? This is an absolute mockery. If Vera was working against you, I would be as well. By accusing my mate, you accuse me, Arthur hissed. And how do I know that you aren't? I snapped. You have children and a mate to protect. Forgive me if I think you might sell your sister out to defend them. If I wasn't on your side, I wouldn't be working my fingers to the bone, doing my best to learn how we can defeat Droga. Arthur roared, and Vera cringed. He shoved me again, and I pushed him back. Emma's face fell as she watched us prepare to trade blows. There were hasty footsteps behind us. Then, unexpectedly, Jasper was between us. He must have been listening out in the hallway. He forced himself between Arthur and I, creating a wall. Jasper, get out of the way, Arthur said as he struggled to move Jasper's arm aside. I need to belt this ball big. If Arthur wanted to fight, so be it. A couple of punches might get him to see reason, if nothing else would. Jasper pushed the two of us apart. If you two are going to do this, you need to go outside, he insisted. The books in here are too precious for you to ruin with your bickering. He needs to admit fault. I stuck a finger in Arthur's face. His mate needs to confess. You're acting like a crazy person, Emma shouted. Ethan, stop. I heard a couple more people come in. Stefan and Theo put a hand on my shoulders and dragged me back. My chest was heaving. Why couldn't anyone admit the obvious? Vera was a traitor, and continuing to keep her here was putting us all in danger. You two need a time out, Stefan said. He kept a firm grip on me, but I'd already lost my will to fight. Brawling wouldn't solve this, not unless Arthur was willing to face the truth. Just keep that gobshite away from me and my mate. He's going round the bend, Arthur growled. He put an arm around Vera as he led her out of the room, giving me a look that could curdle milk. The rage I felt when they left the room shook my entire body. What's gotten into you? Emma said in disgust. Have a little self-control. She didn't admit guilt, I spat. Of course, why would she? She's not guilty of anything, and if she is, you can't prove it, Emma insisted. Give me one shred of evidence it's not her, I snarled. How about the fact that we're still here? If she was the betrayer, why isn't Droga banging down the door? Emma questioned. She wouldn't have a reason to conceal us if she had joined up with Gabby, because giving us up would be safer for her children and for Arthur than remaining in hiding. I took a few breaths to calm myself before speaking further. Perhaps I overstepped. You think? Emma screeched. But it had to be done, I insisted. In time, the truth will come to light, and we'll have to do something about Vera's actions. At least then, Arthur can't deny that he knew. If Vera was working for Gabby, she would have told her where we are, Theo said. What sense does it make for her to keep concealing Emma's location? If she's truly on Gabby's side. The traitor can't be anyone in this house, otherwise we'd be dead by now. It doesn't make sense. Perhaps this is the first safe place she's found where Gabby can't intimidate her, I stated. 
My knuckles cracked as my fingers clenched tightly. And if that's the case, I understand. I wouldn't be so angry if she'd just own up to what she's done. This is going too far, Jasper argued. You can't be sure Vera is the traitor. To accuse her without ironclad proof? I know the truth, I insisted. I feel it in my gut. I just wish she'd admit it. Emma sighed in frustration. Whatever the truth is, you've pissed my brother off royally. He might refuse to help us tomorrow. He'll help, Jasper said. His sister is more important to him than some silly argument. What do you think? I asked, and I turned to Jasper. You've known Vera longer than we have. You must have some inclination behind all of this. Jasper paused. He ruminated on the question before he said in a low voice, I don't think so, Ethan. It baffled me how they refused to acknowledge the obvious. After all, who else could be behind the betrayal? One day, I'd get Vera to admit her role in our defeat. No one would be able to defend her actions once I discovered proof she really had betrayed us all. My only concern was what Arthur would do then. I was due to head out to Derrick College with Lucian, Alexi, Kiara, and Arthur. We waited past midnight, when we hoped most of the college would be asleep, before we gathered in the main foyer to craft the portal that would take us to the campus. Arthur was barely speaking to me, and refused to look in my general direction. Mention of Vera hadn't come up since our argument, and I figured he wouldn't see reason until I had hard proof I could shove in his face, so I didn't bother to mention her name. He was still bitter, though. Sure Ethan should come along, Arthur said, to the room at large as Lucian crafted the portal. He might accuse one of us of trying to keep the scrolls hidden while we're looking. I don't believe anyone among us would do such a thing, I said fairly. I heard Arthur let out a disagreeable noise. That's enough from the both of you, Lucian said. Come. I knew Lucian was there to help us search, as his wealth of knowledge was indisposable, but part of me wondered if he was coming along merely to keep the peace between Arthur and I. We walked through the portal, and I found myself in some sort of alleyway. Lucian had conjured us there for secrecy. I left the alley, and the others ventured behind me as I walked into the area of the main campus. The buildings were a mixture of marble structures with Corinthian columns and neo-Gothic Victorian structures. The monuments were old, most likely constructed in the late 1800s, and all the main buildings looked inwards on the large quadrangles lining the campus. It was a beautiful space, filled with tall trees and broad lawns students could enjoy. The street lamps lining the sidewalks provided the only light. It wasn't quite like Arcania University, but all colleges had the same comforting feeling of academia. We dressed casually. To most onlookers, we were nothing more than a group of college students walking around campus at night. Lucian was the only one who'd draw attention, but as he had been a professor, he could play the part of a teacher well. Anyone who noticed us wandering around would assume we all belonged there. The scroll will be somewhere within the library, locked up in the archives. Lucian said. There are thousands of documents to sift through, so we might not find it tonight. We must, I insisted. The more we return, the more suspicious it seems. We find the scroll tonight and be done with it. Patience, Lucian told me. We have only one mission now, and so we can devote everything to it. I had no patience. My country had been destroyed. I longed to salvage what was left of it. Lucian led the way to a long building at the edge of campus. The spiraling towers of the brown brick library loomed formidably overhead. It was a massive structure. There were potentially millions of books inside. The main doors were barred, so Lucian used his magic to unlock them. An alarm went off as we entered, but Kiara cast a spell to disable them, and the space went quiet. Our shoes made echoing sounds across the marble floor, and we summoned balls of illusion magic to our hands to illuminate the space. The light shone across the massive shelves circling the library, hovering all the way up to the high ceiling. I don't think I'd ever seen so many books in my life. Not even the library at Arcania University could compare. We start at the back, Lucian said. The college keeps all its most treasured files in a private archival room accessible only to professors. He strode forward. Arthur turned on the spot, jaw dropping open at the amount of information that was provided here. Come on, Arthur. We're not here for a field trip. Kiara grabbed his arm and dragged him along, though he kept glancing over his shoulder at the giant shelves. The archives were contained on the other side of a glass wall at the end of the building. Lucian got that door open as well. 
This room was nearly as large as the first one we'd entered, but this time the shelves were lined with stacks of handwritten books from the Middle Ages, as well as scrolls and parchment that dated even earlier. I handed out rubber gloves so none of us would leave any fingerprints behind. We began shuffling through pages. I rifled through old accounts of marriages to nobles and ledgers of merchants who'd sold things like silk from China several hundred years back. I scanned books and scrolls and set them aside quickly the moment I didn't find what I was looking for. I gave a sigh as I watched everyone sift through the archives. My heart fell as I looked around at the massive shelves of the private archives. Each row contained hundreds, if not thousands, of tomes. How would we locate what we were looking for in this? Isn't there a spell we can use to make this go faster? I complained. I'm trying, Kiara insisted, and I watched her attempt to cast a spell. Gold sparks flicked from her fingers, but nothing happened. She shook her head. What we're looking for has to be protected by a ward. Otherwise, it would have come to me by now. Someone probably cast a concealment spell on it before the humans obtain it, to ensure it remained hidden, Lucian stated. My jaw tightened. This was infuriating. Arthur was delicately handling each scroll like it was an infant. Impatience swelled within me. Arthur, pick up the pace. There's no time for you to dawdle. We need to be gentle. Some of these books are over a thousand years old. We shouldn't ruin any of them, Arthur said sharply. We'll be gentle and quick, Kiara insisted. Alexei was putting away each book she'd finished skimming so she could research without wasting any time on reorganizing. The sound of papers fluttering and turning filled the room. I felt like we were moving through these rows at a snail's pace. Wasn't there a better way to do this? These books have to be organized by subject, I insisted. Can't we narrow it down? The instructions for the ceremony are elusive. A human wouldn't understand what it meant, Arthur insisted, a twinge of irritation in his voice. Perhaps it'd be with the articles on witchcraft, but... Then let's start there, I insisted, already looking for the section, wherever in this godforsaken library it was. Arthur grabbed my arm. We can't afford to not be thorough. Thorough, I said. We're wasting time. If we skip around, we'll lose our place, and we might have to go back through some things twice, Arthur hissed. I went to say something harsh in reply, but Lucian held up a hand. Shh, Lucian said, and all of us froze. We weren't the only ones in this library. My shifter ears picked up the sound of heels clicking across the library outside the archives, and the scent of humans drifted across my nose. There had to be two, a man and a woman. We scampered to hide behind the shelves as two figures passed on the other side of the glass wall. Professor, I'm sorry, but I don't think this is appropriate, the woman had spoken. She was walking away from the man who was pursuing her at a quick pace. It's merely a meeting between colleagues, the man replied. Don't turn it into something it's not. I agreed to meet you here at this hour because I thought the archives needed organizing, and with how busy the library is during normal hours, I assumed this was the only time to do it. Now I see I'm mistaken, the woman replied. The man cleared his throat. You might want to consider joining me for coffee tomorrow morning. I would be interested in giving you a better performance report. The woman gave a short sigh. Sir, you are the curator of this library, nothing more or less. Your opinion on my work here has no standing on whether or not I earn my degree. Then perhaps I will discuss things with Professor Brannon. She already finds your research inadequate, and I'm sorry to say, your internship here at the library hasn't left me impressed. I've done everything you've asked and more, the woman protested. I'm always on time, I stay later than I should, and I do more than anyone else here. But unlike the other girls, you haven't agreed to put in the extra work, the man replied. And we both know how important this program is to you. So, again, coffee? There was a pause, and the woman said, I'll think about it. I suggest you don't take your time. I'm a very impatient man. Goodbye, Professor. The woman hurried off. The man gave an annoyed sound before, horrifyingly, he entered into the archival room and turned on the lights. The shelves couldn't hide us. I expected the man to call for an alarm the moment he saw us crouched behind the tomes, but instead, he froze. He was a short, stout man, balding and well into his sixties. There was a bout of recognition in his eyes as he observed us all, but I was certain that I'd never seen him before. Finally, he breathed, this is my lucky day. Lucian rose. 
Without any semblance of explanation, he said, We are looking for something. A document. Rare. We'd be willing to make a trade. The man licked his lips greedily. What are you searching for? A description of a very old ceremony and seven stones with a strange name, Lucian replied. The man nodded. I know of the document. Studied it well in my youth, though I never understood it. I assumed it was related to your kind. Should have known you'd shown up eventually to retrieve it. The man gestured for us to walk through the door. What you're looking for can't be found here. This way. We left the archival room. I floated to the back of the group as the curator led us through a set of shelves and down a stone staircase. I didn't trust him, nor did I understand what was going on. He knows what we are, I whispered to Kiara. Yes, Kiara replied. Humans in Celtic regions have respect for the Fey. We're a big part of their culture and have been for centuries. Doesn't that break supernatural laws of secrecy? Not really. They don't know about our world, only that we exist, and after all, how are they supposed to prove our existence to the rest of their kind? No one would believe them. But how does he recognize us for what we are? He must have been taught somehow. His family could have history with the Fae of some sort. Remember, we made a lot of deals with humans back in the day. The curator took us to the basement of the library. The walls and floors here were nothing but plain stone. When he got to the edge of the hallway, all of us halted. There was an iron door ahead, made completely out of the harsh substance. The rich metal rang in my ears and gave off a nauseating quality that made me uneasy. I couldn't get any closer than five feet to the door. The curator faced us. Wait here. You won't be able to go in, he replied. Iron and all that. The curator took a key out of his pocket. He unlocked the iron door and went inside the room. I couldn't tell much from this angle, except that the room he'd entered was small and stuffed with papers and seemed even older than the ones we'd been going through in the archives. When he came back out... He was holding a tiny rolled piece of parchment in his hands. The curator looked up. He locked eyes with me first. If you want this scroll, I need something in return. Ask it. I wasn't an advanced sorcerer, but I was certain I could provide whatever trivial desire this human asked for. I want a date with the girl that refused me. You must have heard us quarreling, he insisted. She will be mine. I only need help getting her to succumb to my advances. I scowled. You shall receive what you ask for, the scroll for your desired wish. Done, the curator said instantly. He shook my hand, and I cringed at how slimy it was. I felt my magic work, sealing our deal as he placed the scroll into my extended fingers. I unrolled it immediately. It was a gorgeous work from the Dark Ages, the letters on the page surrounded by the elaborate Celtic drawing of a tree, its roots wrapping in a circle around the words. At the top of the page was the depiction of a large cauldron, ivy wrapping around the base. I recognized it as a picture of the sacred gathering. Kiara looked over my shoulder. I struggled to comprehend the harsh cursive scrawling of the beautiful scroll, but I felt her nod behind me. This is certainly it, Kiara said as she read over the scroll quickly. We got what we came for. I handed the scroll to Lucian, who carefully pocketed it. Be gone, I told the curator sharply. You'll receive what is just due. I hated the way his beady eyes sparkled as he scrambled away. Alexei frowned and said, Wish we hadn't thrown that poor girl under the bus to get the scroll. He wanted a date with the intern, and he'll get one. A date at the courthouse, I said bluntly. He'll be receiving a notification for charges of harassment in a few days, and I'm certain a letter of discharge from the university. Brilliant, Ethan, Alexei smiled. Quite the manipulative use of meaning. He should have known to use his words carefully with the Fey. Alexei gave a coy smile. I mean, we are famous for fucking people over. I would have rewarded him if he wasn't such a perverted ass. I turned to Lucian. We have what we need. We should go before any more humans come round asking for more favors. Indeed. Lucian cast a portal, and we left the library behind us. I shook off a shiver as we returned to the main foyer of the manor. I didn't like being in a place full of those who weren't my own kind, and humans particularly bothered me. Kiara sighed as the portal closed behind her. Too bad other supernaturals aren't as easy to trick as humans. Or that we can't really trick other fae, Alexei added. The humans served his purpose. We got what we came for, Lucian said. I need to take the night to study this scroll. I'll notify you once I'm certain of what it says. I'll help you, Kiara offered and she set off with Lucian. 
Alexei was left standing awkwardly between Arthur and I. Arthur didn't hesitate to leave the room the moment he was able to. I'm off to bed. Good night, Alexei. I ignored the snub. We didn't have to like each other right now, just work together. I took a seat in the armchair in front of the fire. Now we wait, I suppose. Now we wait, Alexei agreed. Hopefully, there will be good news in the morning. I grunted. Getting the scroll had been the easy part. I was sure performing the ritual the scroll entailed would be difficult, as everything else on our quest had been. But I couldn't say for certain. Only time would tell. I felt someone shake my shoulder. My eyes opened. The fire had dwindled down to smoldering embers. Emma's green orbs peered back at me, and I startled. You're... Yes, I made it downstairs today. I'm very proud of myself. Emma drew herself up. Looks like you two chose to crash down here. Alexei was passed out in the seat across from me. He didn't even stir at the sound of our voices. You should let him sleep until Kiara returns, I suggested. Last night was very... interesting. I heard you got the scroll. How did it go? She asked. We left the main foyer and walked to the kitchen. I filled Emma in on what had happened over breakfast, which Phelan had just made. We were finishing up our meal in the dining hall when Finlay slid in the seat across from us. How are you faring? He asked. Before we could reply, Finlay said, Now, there's been something I've been meaning to tell the both of you, and I think I've waited long enough to say so, so... I've read the scroll. Lucian burst into the room, bags under his eyes and looking tired. He sat beside Finlay and placed the scroll on the table. Kiara has gone to rest, but we're both nearly certain of the ceremony it describes. Finlay scowled at being interrupted. He put his head in his hands as Lucian unrolled the scroll between us. So, what does the scroll say? Emma insisted. Once the crystals of harmony are found, they can be united at any time on any day, Lucian began. The world weaver must bring the crystals to the sacred gathering and place them in a circle around it in the exact order in which they were found. There's got to be more to it than that, Emma said narrowing her eyes as she peered at the scroll. "'There is an incantation,' Lucian said. "'When the stones are in alignment, you must speak the following.' Lucian's voice became even deeper as he spoke the incantation. I hung on to his every word, preparing to commit the incantation to memory. "'Loyalty, bravery, faith, and compassion, in perfect harmony. Crystals united here as one to restore our history. Edinmire and Earth— Mary true, no longer may we roam. Light and dark now join together, guiding our way home. Lucian cleared his throat. You must be aware that uniting the stones will render them useless. Opening the portal with the crystals will destroy them. We'll be unable to use them once you complete the ceremony. But so will Droga, and that's what matters, Emma said firmly. This was far too simple. I didn't believe it. The thought of Emma's prophecy and the words the hag had spoken came to me. Will this ceremony kill Emma? I asked. Lucian hesitated. There is a sacrifice, a blood offering, that is mentioned before the incantation is spoken, though it's not clear what the world weaver has to offer to make the portal permanent. The wording itself isn't clear. Emma rolled up the scroll and handed it back to Lucian with a stoic expression. Thank you. At least now I know what I have to do. I'll keep this somewhere safe and try to figure out what the scroll means as far as the blood offering, Lucian said. Don't worry, my child. I'm sure it's nothing too serious. I would never let anything happen to you. Emma was silent as Lucian tucked the scroll back into his pocket. She didn't make a sound when Lucian retreated to put away the scroll, only sat back against her chair and appeared hollow. Fucking finally, Finley grumbled as Lucian left the room. Anyway, I thought now might be a good time to tell you that Lady Magdalena and I found the Unseely Stone. Emma and I both started. What? Emma gasped. How did you... You found it? There was a deadly growl to my voice. Why didn't you tell us sooner? I might be getting ahead of myself. We don't have it, per se, but know of it, Finlay responded. After all, realizing where something is doesn't mean that it's in your possession. Sad thing is... You two had it all along. Quit speaking in riddles. Where is it? I demanded. Finlay gave a roguish grin. 
Do you remember the dark necklace from the king's contest? The heavy realization nearly made me fall out of my chair. Finlay hadn't touched me, but still I felt winded. Awareness crossed over Emma's face like a beacon, and she put a hand to her forehead as she leaned over the table. Of course. We should have realized. You're saying the unseely stone is the gemstone within the dark necklace we stole from Lady Corva? I asked. The same one I used to cheat, Emma emphasized, like she couldn't believe it. Finlay nodded. The very same. The wonder it wounded you so, I said, looking at Emma. You were utilizing the power of a crystal of harmony, not just any unseely object. Where is it now? Emma's words were urgent as she reached out to grasp Finlay's arm. Please tell us you know where it is. Finlay made a sheepish face. Uh, well, no. After the unseely stone was taken from you once the contest was over, the Circle took it to their archives and tried to destroy it. But, as we know, a crystal of harmony can't be destroyed, especially not by normal means of magic. So what happened to it? I asked. It was eventually abandoned by the Circle. Gabby and Elijah wanted to get their hands on it, but they couldn't do so without drawing suspicion to themselves. Only one with unseely blood could wield the power in the necklace, and besides Lady Corva, none of the other council members could do anything with it. Luckily, they never figured out why they couldn't use it. They just assumed Emma had drained the power in the necklace during the contest, and therefore the item was useless. Why didn't the Circle immediately suspect Emma of having unseely blood then, once they'd learned we'd cheated? They knew the power in the necklace was full of dark magic, I replied. Because they're right morons, Finlay stated. Most people don't understand how dark magic works, because unseelie lore isn't taught at Arcania University, or anywhere else. The knowledge was forbidden for so long, most fae don't know anything about it. They think any old seely fae can harness dark magic for themselves whenever they wish, and as we know now, that's not how it works. You have to have the ancestry to even attempt dark magic. The necklace was Lady Corva's. It was in her family for ages, Emma said. She must have known I had unseelie blood before I did, if all this is true. I can't believe she didn't try to smuggle it back to her mansion somehow. She was too afraid to steal it, for fear of it being linked back to her, Finlay said. She was trying to keep her son's unseelie heritage and her own quiet, because she knew if word got out what he was, it would be controversial. After all, why would she steal a necklace the council thought she couldn't use? But Lady Magdalena had to have known about it. Why didn't she take it herself? Emma asked. She did her research, but unfortunately, Magdalena didn't realize that the gem inside the necklace was the unseelie stone until it was too late. Finlay said with a sigh. Too late? I asked. Lord Radcliffe, Finlay said grimly. Ah, that explained it. The man had a love of coin. I had already guessed what had happened. He saw an opportunity to line his pockets. Yes. He used his place on the council to repossess the necklace and sold it to someone in Scotland. It got passed around to a lot of different hands. No one truly knew what they had, Finlay said. Lady Magdalena and I spent many months going back and forth from Delinska to Edinburgh, tracking down who the necklace was sold to, though the trail eventually went cold. From what we know before she died, it's still somewhere in Scotland, probably Edinburgh. So that's why Finlay and Magdalena had missed so many circle meetings during our time as king and queen. Why didn't the two of you clue us in? I asked, irritated. We had the right to know. You two were busy locating the Seely Stone and governing the nation. We didn't think it was a good idea to distract you until we had a solid lead on the Unseely Stone. And so far, everything we found was just a smokescreen. He shrugged. We need to pick the investigation back up in Edinburgh, Emma said. Do you know who had the necklace last? I can look into it, Finlay said. But I hate to tell you, our last lead wasn't promising, and we're fighting against time to find it before Droga does. Emma slammed a fist on the table. I don't even understand why Droga wants the crystals. He's a god. He has infinite power. What use are they to him? Lady Magdalena might have told me before she died, Finlay said regrettably. But she made me take a vow not to tell you until you were ready for it. Finn, just give it to me straight, Emma said tiredly. I need to know what we're up against. Finlay gave a heavy sigh. Well, ready for it or not, I think you have the right to know. No point in continuing to wait. We waited anxiously on his words before he said, Droga wants the stones, 
because he can use them to create portals to other worlds. Worlds? I asked. Yes. Different planes of dimensions, different universes. Finlay said, even as a god, he can only travel between Earth, Edmire, and the underworld. He doesn't have the power to go anywhere else, at least not without the crystals. So he's not just interested in taking over this plane of reality, he wants to conquer others, Emma said, her voice growing with impending fear. That is his main goal, Finlay agreed. As Fey, we know there are other supernatural planes of existence, other magical realms out there that exist separately from our own. We haven't discovered them yet, but it's certain that Droga wants to rule over all of them. I couldn't imagine the kind of chaos and grief that would cause, to not only destroy our world, but to ravage others. His greed truly knew no bounds. There was more at stake than just Malovia or the Fae. Entire universes could be in jeopardy if we failed to stop Droga in time. We can't let that happen, Emma insisted. We'll use the crystals to stop him. It won't work. They're not tools for mortal Fae. Even talented supernaturals, Finlay insisted. During our hunt for the Unseelie Stone, Lady Magdalena was certain of one thing, and she made sure to ram it into my head. The power within those stones is uncontrollable. You get those crystals anywhere near Droga, he'll take them. Every time you use the stones, some of their power is drained. They don't have infinite power. The gods only put so much magic into each stone, and although the power they hold is immense, if they're pushed to their limit... They will eventually run out of magic, and you won't be able to use them to open a portal. So we never can learn how to use the Crystals of Harmony, Emma said in defeat. They're not meant to be wielded for any other purpose but to reopen the portal. Exactly. Only a god or demigod can use their power without draining them, which is why Droga can't get his hands on them. You'll be able to use the stones to open the portal to Edmire, because you are the World Weaver, and that is your ability alone, Finlay said. But as for using them to fight, forget about it. The girls used the crystals to fight at the Battle of Arcania University, but we didn't know at the time that using them was siphoning away their power, I said grimly. We were lucky we didn't completely spend their magic. But the Unseely Stone still works, and I used it in the contest. I'm a stronger sorceress now, Emma objected. I bet I could... You could utilize the power in each individual stone for a short time, like you did in the contest... And like your friends did when Arcania University was attacked, Finlay said. But if you used them against Droga, the power required to defeat him would be immense, and drawing from the stones to do so would render them useless. Therefore, you wouldn't be able to use them to reopen the portal, which makes the entire thing pointless. In fact, if used improperly, it might even kill us. Like what nearly happened to Delmare, I said. She tried to defend Stefan using the Dragon Stone during the Battle of Arcania University, and it backfired on her. She still has the scar on her face. What use are the crystals if we can't use them to defeat Throga? Emma snarled. If I go down, I'm taking him with me. I hurried to calm her. It's all right, Onowilke. We'll figure something out, I said. She crossed her arms and looked away from me. I felt sympathy for her, but worse was the terror that we could be helpless. We couldn't allow Droga to obtain any of these crystals, including the Unseelie Stone. If he did, he'd hop from universe to universe, taking over different worlds, until there was nothing left free and everything was under his control. We were fighting against more than the end of all Fey. If Droga remained in power, the end of all life on this planet and others could be a reality. And we were the only ones standing in his way. Chapter 4 Emma The revelation of how to unite the Crystals of Harmony was darkened by what Finley had told me. Droga wanted to control more than the Fey, more than this planet. His sights were set on being the ruler of dimensions and planes of reality we didn't even know about. It was too much to fathom. My mind shut off whenever the possibility was brought up. If the weight on my shoulders had been the world before, it was entire realms now. I didn't know how I managed to keep going under that kind of pressure, but somehow I survived. I'd improved considerably over the past few months. I was able to walk most places now and could take the stairs a few times a day. I could take down little meals without throwing up, and I didn't sleep all hours of the day like I did before. I could even do small spells. I'd worked on casting here and there when I felt like I had the energy. 
and I was able to do easy illusions. My ribs and bruised organs had healed, although I still moved gingerly at times, as I could feel the remnants of their after-effects. I hoped within the next few months I'd be able to cast great magic like I could before, though I was beginning to worry I'd never get back to normal. It was taking me such a long time to recover. What if I never did? Lucian and Arthur had been hard at work searching for the location of the Unseelie Stone with Finley's help. Though Finley was certain the stone was still in Scotland, he wasn't sure where it had been taken or by who, and that led to nothing but frustration for everyone. The days passed slowly here at the estate. Everyone helped with the farm work, save for me, who couldn't do more than pet the animals. Kiara and Alexei busied themselves in the library, researching Droga and doing their best to learn how to defeat him. Delmer and Stefan were busy preparing as much as they could for the arrival of their baby, who was due next month, while Amantha had found a local rink close by. She snuck off at night to practice after all the other skaters had gone home. I longed to join her, but I knew that'd be stupid in my condition. Ethan helped me. Whenever he wasn't at my side, he was lurking in the nearby woods. He said he was going hunting, trying to keep his mind off things, but to be honest, I didn't know what he was doing out there. He spent nearly all his time in the forest, and we were running out of room to put the game he caught each night. I was starting to wonder if he was killing for sport instead of survival. I felt the rage inside of him quivering against our bond. The man became more like an animal every time he shifted to head into the wilderness, irrational and hard to reach. Odette and Theo practiced ballet, as if they were still holding on to their dream of opening up a dance studio, and vanished for long periods of time. Odette and I had made up after our little argument, though things still felt complicated between us. We weren't as close as we'd been before. It was clear she still held resentment against me for running away and I was upset she couldn't find it in her heart to forgive me for what happened, though I certainly deserved her anger. I didn't know what to do about it. Babkia and Bapa kept the estate running. They'd offered to keep teaching me unseelie magic, but I'd turned them down. I wasn't ready right now. My mother did gods only knew what whenever she couldn't harass my father, and sneered at my grandparents each time they walked past. In kind, they ignored her. They really needed to figure their shit out. The house was huge, so they could avoid each other, but I was tired of the tension whenever they crossed paths. I was aware they hated each other, but they needed to put their differences aside, if only for me and Arthur's sake. Vara spent a lot of time in her room, like I did. Her recovery after her rescue from Dolinska had been slow. Her children were due very soon. Miroslava had prepared for the labor as best she could, and yet there was a sickening feeling in my gut that told me this birth was about to go very wrong. I put it off to my horrible nerves. Everything was a threat in my mind these days. Jasper and Ozzy mostly kept to themselves and did their own thing. They rarely came out of their room. Jasper didn't even venture out for ice practice with Amantha, and it was really weird. It was like both of them were too scared to leave the grounds. Everything was so gray and dull. It felt like we were waiting around for something to happen. I would have said it was boring if our impending doom wasn't pressing down upon us. Ireland rarely got snow, so I considered it a treat when there was a light snowfall over the estate at the end of February. It made me miss Malovia, where it snowed nearly every day. I sat in the foyer by a window, resting in an armchair with a journal of poetry opened up in front of me, a quill resting upon the page. I'd come down here to write, but it seemed I had to force the words to come out these days. I hadn't managed to compose a single line of a sonnet, and I'd been here for at least two hours. I stared out the window, watching the gentle snowflakes coat the endless green. The sound of my brother's footsteps approached. He placed a massive leather-bound book on the table in front of me, one that I considered a murder weapon more than a tome. Weather's odd for this time of year, Arthur said, casting a glance out the window. Maybe everything in the world was changing now that Droga was back. 
He sat down on the other side of the table and handed me a hot chocolate. I took it kindly. I couldn't drink coffee anymore, though I really missed it. The caffeine messed with my system when it hadn't before. It sent me spiraling into panic attacks and made me nervous and jittery. It was such a small thing, but it crushed me. I couldn't even have my favorite drink. Nothing about the world made sense anymore. How are you feeling, Em? Arthur's words were cautious, but I didn't wish him to coddle me, though I felt more fragile than a china doll at the moment. I shrugged as a response, and he frowned. I could focus on two things at a time right now, breathing and whatever was in front of me. Putting my attention on more than one task sent me spiraling into hyperventilations. At the moment, this conversation was taking all of my energy. You can talk to me, you know that, right? Arthur prompted. I know, I responded, but he wasn't the one I wanted to talk to. I hated to say it, but there was only one person I thought could help me through this, and she was dead. I wished Lady Magdalena was here. She'd help me get over this. She wouldn't let me mope around. She'd whip me into shape, tell me to keep my chin up and soldier onward, because come hell or high water, we'd have victory. But she wasn't here. I was at my weakest point when the world needed me most. There had never been a more important time for me to be at the top of my game, and here I was, unable to even have a sip of coffee. I was aware of Arthur keenly studying me, and I couldn't stand it, so I changed the subject. Did you find anything that could be useful to us? I asked. I'd tried to help Arthur research, but whenever I came across anything that mentioned the Crystals of Harmony, Droga, or something related to our fate, the words became blurry on the page and I nearly passed out. I felt so weak. I went off on a bit of a tangent, actually. Arthur confessed, sounding guilty. You wanted me to research CVID in our family line, but I never got the time. With the babies coming and us having so much trouble with the Unsealy Stone, well, I thought now would be appropriate. Did you find out anything? I asked. I was interested to discover our heritage in regards to our genetics. Well, we know your disease is the result of a genetic mutation, Arthur said, and that family inheritance only arises in about 10 to 25 percent of cases. Most doctors are baffled about what your disease really is or how you develop it. So am I one of those random cases, or is there an ancestor in our family line that passed it down to me somehow? I asked. It's quite proficient, actually. Arthur said, sounding somewhat shocked. It stems from our father's side. We have at least two distant cousins in our ancestry with the disease, along with our great-grandmother. That would be Babkia's mother, who passed the carrier down to Babkia, who passed the gene down to Lucien, who then gave it to you. Though CVIT wasn't discovered as a condition until the 1950s, so the people who had it back then didn't understand what they were going through. Due to a lack of treatment, none of them lived that long. So Lucian was a carrier. He didn't have it himself, but he passed it down to me, I said. I'm afraid so, Arthur said. CVID is extremely rare. That it's so strong in our bloodline is quite an extraordinary case. My mouth grew dry as I asked, What about you? Are you a carrier, like our dad was? Miroslava tested me. I'm not a carrier of the gene that causes CVID, Arthur said. I won't pass it down to my children. As fraternal twins, we developed from two different eggs in the womb, so I don't carry the same genetics you do. I let out a breath. Well, that's a huge relief. Of course. Then Arthur paused. Your chances are a bit different. We know you're a carrier, so the chances of you producing a child with CVID are at least 25%, with the chances of producing another carrier another 25%. There's a 50-50 shot you'll produce a child that isn't affected in any way and won't pass on the disease. I gave a grim nod. I understand. It's what I was expecting, anyway. I don't want you to give up hope of being a mother, Arthur said gently. There are other ways, and you're still so young. I know. I dropped my head and took a sip of my drink. Find anything else interesting? Not particularly, but it has been interesting. 
researching family history with her dad, Arthur said as he pushed up his glasses. We keep losing focus on what we're supposed to be doing. Both of us are interested in so many things. Like? I put an elbow on the table and leaned forward. While looking into the crystals, I've also been researching the gods and goddesses. Arthur explained. I find I'm really drawn to Neva. The goddess of time? I asked, raising an eyebrow. Yes. Did you know I swore myself to her at Vara and I's choosing? He asked. I didn't. It's unusual for a shifter to swear fealty to a sorceress. Usually, they stuck to worshipping a god of their same gender. I did. I found this massive book on her in the estate's library. How she can stop time in place, hop from one point in time to another, even redirect the path of fate by returning from a place in the future to correct the past. Doesn't that mess with the timeline and screw things up? I asked. See, time doesn't happen in the way you think it does. It's all happening at once, instead of in a straight line. So really, moving from one place in a time to another for Neva is very similar to how we leave to go to the store and come back, or like leaving one room to enter another, Arthur explained. It's just a different place, not a different moment. So things end up working out the way they're supposed to, whether you modify them in the past or not. I find that very hard to comprehend, I said. My brain was hurting just thinking about it. It's not meant for mortals to understand. I think it's similar to the way prophets in our world work, and how we're directed to follow the journey prophecies foretell. Your choices and decisions affect the future, and you have the power to change it, but certain events are written in stone and cannot be diverted from no matter how hard you try to avoid them. I still don't get it. Do we have the power to change the future or not? It's a little bit of both, really. I gave an impatient huff and Arthur blushed. Well, we can talk about the theory of time all day, but my point is, Neva is incredible. I can't get enough of learning about her incarnations here on Earth. She's gone all throughout time, choosing mates from different periods and bringing them back to Edenmire for her enjoyment. That aspect of her is fascinating. His green eyes sparkled. You sound enchanted by the idea. I wouldn't mind being part of Neva's harem, Arthur said with a wry smile. I think it would be wonderful to serve her, and an honor to share the affection of such a powerful being. If only I'd caught the eye of such a goddess. She could teach me so much about the theory of time. You're not like most shifters, then. They got jealous easily. I think Ethan would share me if I was interested in someone else, but he'd probably pout about the whole thing. Hardly. One werewolf was more than enough for me to handle, thank you. Well, there is a bit of a downside to being chosen by a goddess. Once they leave this plane of reality as mortals and go back to their main forms, the shifters that fall for them become so lovesick they waste away until they die of grief. Arthur frowned. It's one of the side effects of loving someone so powerfully endless. Sounds more like a curse than a blessing, I mumbled. Perhaps the pain would be worth the short time you'd get to spend being loved by a deity. I wouldn't know. Arthur sighed and scooped up the book he'd been carrying. Anyway, I should really get back to Lucian. He's been wanting to go through this with me. He waved the monstrous title in the air. You should take a break, I suggested. You've been reading all day and night. Arthur hesitated. To be honest, it's good for me. Keeps me distracted. From? I raised an eyebrow. He frowned. Vara's been sleeping a lot lately. Miroslava has her own bed rest. I'd never felt more guilty. Arthur should be excited and happy, getting ready for one of the biggest moments of his life. The arrival of his children. Instead, he was helping me with these damn crystals. Gods, it felt like I'd taken everything from everyone I cared about. You should be at her side, I insisted. I'll only wake her. I can't sit still, not when I'm so nervous about the baby's coming. He took a shivering sigh. We've prepared as much as we can, but I can't help but feel we're missing something. I ignored the wriggling in my gut telling me that Arthur's intuition was right, and said, Take the day off. Seriously. You should spend some more time with your mate before you're too busy with the babies to get any alone time. 
he hesitated, before dropping the book to his side. You know what? You're right. One day of rest will do me good. Thanks, Em. As he walked off, I finished my cup of hot chocolate and took it back to the kitchen to place in the sink. As it was Friday, I had to do my infusion. I gathered my things and trekked slowly across the mansion, where Miroslava had set up a small medical room in one of the parlors. It was more or less a sitting room converted into an area to hold supplies. I took some pain reliever and an allergy pill before I got a jar of plasma out of the fridge, then retrieved some syringes and tubing with needles from the supply cabinet. Once I filled the syringes up with plasma, I prepared the tubing. I scowled as I poked the needles into my stomach, noticing a new line of pudge. I'd barely eaten anything in the past three months, and I'd still gained weight as a side effect of my treatment. I was slower, heavier, and in more pain than I'd ever been. When was this shit going to end? I slipped the syringe into the infusion pump, turned it on, then sat down on the couch to watch TV. I was channel scrolling mindlessly through Irish reality shows when Odette came hopping in. She was holding some kind of small box in her hand. It looked like a deck of cards. Hey, Emma. I was hoping I'd find you here, she said, not quite eagerly, but sweetly enough. Would you like me to give you an oracle reading? I've never tried before, and Theo's too chicken to be my first experiment. She made a silly face. We hadn't done anything together since our fight. I didn't care if Odette wanted to rob a bank so long as she wished to include me. I turned toward her as I shut the TV off and said, Sure, you can give me a reading. Oh, goody! She sat on the couch across from me and took the cards out of the box they came in. They were a lovely deck, cards that were sketched with beautiful drawings of unicorns, pegasi, and alicorns. They were rainbow colors and had designs of magical equines with butterflies entangled in their manes, forms made of fire, water, and other elemental qualities. Are these cards supernatural? I asked. The designs were so close to things I'd actually seen in the Fey world. I'm not sure. I felt them calling to me. She let out an oops as she tried to shuffle the cards. They fell out of her fingers and into a pile on the floor. She scooped them up and scrambled to put them back in order. I've been using most of our time here to practice my trika powers, with Theo's help. We've been looking into the history of druids and learning as much as we can. I need water to scry, but I've found I can employ my powers in different ways, too. Like reading tea leaves? I asked. Yes. I picked up this deck of oracle cards the other day when Theo and I went into town. I thought I should try them out. We took turns heading into the nearby village for supplies, based on who was going the most stir-crazy. We tried not to leave often because it was a risk we'd be seen, but we still needed stuff. I hadn't left the mansion since we'd gotten here. I'd turn down the chance to go every time. Odette slayed the cards in front of me. Go ahead! Pick three! Past, present, and future! This should be good. I was expecting nothing but bad news as I picked three cards from the deck and handed them to Odette. She laid them out in front of her on the couch cushion between us. I'm supposed to interpret them without the book, she said, tongue sticking out as she observed them all. But, oh. She hurriedly shuffled through the pages of the book that had come with the oracle deck. I observed the cards I'd pulled. The first was a picture of a dark-haired woman leading a white unicorn through a stone gate. The second was an image of a black unicorn and a white unicorn running together against twilight. The third was the depiction of two unicorns floating along a magical surface, their horns glowing and forms mirroring each other. As she read the contents, she let out an ahem sound and said, It's just as I thought. In the past, you were willing to listen to your heart. You followed your intuition and did what you thought was best at the time. Yeah, I sure fucking did. Following my intuition was what had led to all of this. I didn't trust myself anymore to make the right choice. Now, in the present, you are struggling to face your shadow side, Odette went on. You're willing to embrace the light side of you, but not the dark. You're not going to progress further unless you learn to accept yourself as you are and be comfortable with the choices you made. 
these cards were pissing me off. It's like they were rubbing it in my face that I hadn't mastered shadow manipulation yet, and at this point, it didn't feel like I ever would. I didn't want to accept my dark side. Why couldn't everything be good instead of being so horrible all the time? The last card... Odette tapped her chin. If you're going to succeed, you need to depend on your friends, because you won't be able to do this alone. This card indicates that you need to sit back and rest, and rely on the help of other people in order to achieve your goal. Relaxation, restoration, and partnership with other people is how you'll find the support you need to succeed. I'd hardly been so frustrated about my destiny. But how am I supposed to do that? I complained. Everything is depending on me. I'm the world weaver. I'm supposed to save the fate. No one else can. I can't just sit back and relax waiting for someone else to come save me. That's what the cards tell me, Odette said. Well, those cards are wrong, I shot at her. We should do it again, because I need better advice than- Oh, fucking hell. The line on my infusion pump had broken off right where it attached to the syringe. The split tubing soaked my clothes and the chair I was sitting on. Odette jumped up, giving a squeak. I panicked for a few seconds. This had never happened to me before, so I didn't know what to do. I snapped back to attention when I realized thousands of dollars of medication was leaking out all over my clothes and onto the floor. I immediately turned the pump off, while Odette rushed to get a towel to sop up the ruined plasma. I removed the syringe from the pump and found the tip of the syringe had somehow broken during the infusion process, shattering the tubing. I wouldn't be able to use the rest of the medication in that syringe, which had almost been full. Not only that, but since the tubing was ruined, I needed to put new needles in too, so now I had to poke myself eight times instead of four. Freaking fantastic. Odette nervously watched me as I connected a new line of tubing to my secondary syringe. I took the old needles out and swore as I put new ones in. I was running out of space on my body where I could put these things. I avoided bruises from old infusions and slipped the second syringe back into the pump, only to find that when I turned it on, the pump didn't do anything. Anger festered within my gut. Great, my pump's not working, I said. I shook it a little, but it refused to operate. We should get Mural Slava, Odette said anxiously. No, I don't want to bother her. I can handle this myself, I insisted. I didn't put new needles in for nothing. I'll just manually infuse it. Are you sure? Odette nervously played with her hands. Yeah, it'll be fine. With effort, I used my hands to push the end of the syringe down, so it flooded medication into my system. I watched as the plasma within the syringe was emptied into my body, from 100 millimeters to 90 to 80 in moments. This was great. It was way faster than using my pump. I could get this whole syringe done in 10 minutes compared to an hour with the pump. Why didn't I do this all the time? It only took a couple of minutes for me to realize why this wasn't a great idea. My heart rate jumped so it was beating against my chest, and a line of sweat broke across my forehead. My body felt hot, and I took deep breaths to try and cool myself down. Was I having a heart attack? Because it felt like it. My thoughts became long and drawn out, my mind groggy like I was drunk. I felt the world bend and dip underneath my seat like I was about to pass out. I stopped pushing the medicine in and waited for the side effects to abide, but they only got worse. Oh, shit. It felt like I was going to die. Was I going to die? I was probably overreacting. But I must have looked bad, because Odette paled as her eyes wandered up my form. I'm getting help! Odette scurried out. I laid back on the couch and tried not to roll off of it. The room was spinning and I couldn't keep my head up right now if I tried. Miroslava's disapproving gaze was all I needed to know I fucked up. She removed my needles with flat lips, checking my vital signs. Emma, there's a reason your medication is supposed to be infused slowly. 
It can cause dangerous side effects if it's injected too quickly into your system, Miroslava scolded. I sure as hell figured that out, I slurred. My tongue was thick and dry in my mouth. Odette poked her head back in as Ethan hurried inside. My husband might as well have been a fucking alien. I barely recognized him. Man, this shit was really fucking with my brain. He knelt by my side and took my hand. Will she be all right? He asked. She'll be fine, but I think she learned her lesson, Miroslava said. A lot of sleep, rehydration, and an easy weekend will help her feel better. She set her recovery back a couple of days. I'm sorry, I slurred. I'm just so frustrated and nothing is going right. I understand, Ethan said, and he squeezed my hand. I know this is discouraging. It was all very dramatic and I was over it already. Miroslava fussed around me for another half hour before she put her hands on her hips. I think you'll be fine so long as you rest up, but we'll have to monitor you closely. You're in for a hard week ahead. You barely got any medicine out of this treatment, and they won't be able to get you more plasma until next weekend. Great, I mumbled. This was just what I needed, a low immune system to slow me up even more. Miroslava hastily tied back her hair with a handkerchief she had in her pocket. I must be off. I wasn't finished with Vara. Miroslava hurried away, and I found myself worrying. She'd been spending a lot of time in Vara's room lately. As Miroslava left, Ethan also rose. I'll get you some electrolytes. Stay put. Sure, I'm just going to crawl off. I mumbled. You might. Ethan gave me a wink, but his smile was worried. Odette sat at the edge of the couch by my feet as Ethan shut the door. See, I told Odette, as if I had proof to show her that my life sucked. How can I trust myself when bad things keep happening? Odette put a hand on my leg. The cards want you to rely on your friends. I know you're a strong person and don't want to ask for help, but the only way you're going to get better and beat Droga is if you rely on all of us. You don't have to do this alone. Her words were friendly and warm, but they caused tears to brim my eyes because I felt alone. I was surrounded by everyone I loved at this estate, but I'd never been more lonely. I didn't think I deserved the help. More than that, I felt like a burden upon everyone I came in contact with. I'd had help before as a queen. I had an army and servants and countless numbers of people who were devoted to me, and all of them were dead because I'd failed them. Odette was wrong. It was better to go at it alone. At least then, no one else would get hurt. The only casualty would be me, and that's exactly how I wanted it, to suffer alone. March passed by in a blur. I'd hardly registered that we'd been at the estate for three months until the morning of Vosna'an. It was beautiful, that particular morning of Neva's holiday. The spring equinox had come in full force. Ireland rarely got any sun, but that day there wasn't a cloud in the sky. Fresh green grass was blooming over the hills, accompanied by the sight of little white flowers. There was a fresh smell in the wind nothing could replicate. A rainbow hovered in the sky as it had just rained that morning. It felt like something special was about to happen, though I couldn't imagine what. I was on the porch of the estate, wrapped in my robe and watching the newborn lambs frolic in the fields, when Bobka slid up beside me. We're due to visit Truaglon. Get dressed so we can be off. She hadn't asked if I wanted to go to town. It was more like a demand. Is it safe? Of course it's safe, Bobka said. We'll take the carriage. It's not more than a few miles down the road. But you're well enough to make it, Bobka said, and she patted my arm. Now hurry. You haven't lived until you've had breakfast at the County Clare. If someone asked me before if I wanted to see how the hidden communities of the Unseenly lived, I would have jumped at the opportunity. Fuck, I was scared to leave the house now. Just going into town for a breath of fresh air felt like the most terrifying thing. 
I wanted to remain in my cocoon of safety, where things were predictable and I had everything I needed in case something went wrong. Oh, my medicine is here. What if I need it and don't have it? What if I pass out in the middle of the street? What if there's nothing for me to eat and everything sets off my allergies? What if I get really weak because I can't eat? Then I get sick and I end up making a big scene. Gods, what if I throw up? Or what if I can't walk far enough? Or what if there isn't any place for me to sit down and rest? I shouldn't be too far from Miroslava, just in case I have an emergency. Going into town is too far. I need to stay home and take it easy, because then nothing bad will happen and I'll have everything I need if it does. But I really wanted to get out of the house, though. I told myself nothing bad was going to happen and steadied my courage. I went back upstairs and got dressed in a green tartan skirt with a long-sleeved white shirt and wool shawl. It was still a little chilly out and more layers of clothing helped me feel, I don't know, more protected. I slid on my leather boots as Ethan greeted me at the doorway. You look nice. He ducked in to give me a kiss. Something different than pajamas and yoga pants. I knew I hadn't been taking care of myself lately. I did my best to run a brush through my unruly red locks before I gave up and threw it into a bun on top of my head. I didn't think I'd gotten ready for something in God's knew how long. It was progress. The carriage was open top and pulled by a bay plow horse. I was intrigued to see that Vara was sitting inside the carriage with Arthur. She was due at any moment. I'm surprised you're coming along, I said as I took a seat on the other side of her. Well, it is difficult for me to get around, Vara confessed. But Miroslava said a change of scenery would do me some good, and I am completely bored of sitting in that room she has me trapped in. Her cheeks were rosy, and her voice in good spirits. She seemed well today. I grabbed her hand, which felt very warm, and gave a squeeze as I said, I'm glad you're here. Maybe this is a turnaround for the both of us. I'm hopeful. I think things will be very different after today, she smiled. Ethan knew how to be polite and diplomatic, so I was grateful that he hid his true feelings as he moved around Vara to take the seat on the other side of me. I just wanted to have a good day out with my friends and my family. He would respect that. Arthur cast an illusion to disguise our faces. I checked myself in a hand mirror I had. I'd become a curly-haired girl with a round face. Everyone else in the carriage looked the same to me, but when I passed the mirror to Ethan, his reflection mirrored back a man with higher cheekbones and longer hair. We could identify each other, but anyone who didn't know us would see a completely different person. I let out a sigh of relief. No one would recognize us, at least. Babkia and Bapa bickered as they embarked the carriage. Bapa took the reins, and we began the trip down the winding country road. The sound of the horse's hoofs clopping against the dirt was soothing, but I didn't like that the carriage wasn't covered. I pressed closer into Ethan, and he put his arm around me for comfort. The carriage rolled into town, and the gravel beneath the horse's hoofs turned to cobblestone. We passed thatch roof cottages painted white, and stone houses covered in ivy. As we headed into the merchant district, we observed sorceresses pushing carts, who were selling things like cheeses and vegetables straight from the farm. The businesses here were tiny and packed together in 200-year-old buildings that were three stories tall. We crossed a street that was full of nothing but pubs, and I smelled the faint remnants of fish and chips that had been cooked the night before. The celebration for Vosna N was in full swing. Rose garlands hung across the streets, and there were flower wreaths on every door. Children tossed petals everywhere from wicker baskets, while sorceresses handed out flowers to everyone who passed by. The whole world seemed to be reborn after a very dark winter. It brought a little light into my heart. I didn't know what I expected, but I figured the Unseelie would look… different? I don't know why, but I figured their features would be more prominent perhaps differently toned in hair or skin color. I'd been taught that there were so many differences between the Seelie and Unseely Fae that I was expecting them to be a separate group entirely. It was silly to think. The Fae here looked like any other Fae back in Dolinska. The conflict between the Seelie and Unseely Fae seemed even more ridiculous. There are so few of them, I commented. Trua Glon was much smaller than I expected. Yes, Bobka said. 
The conflict with the Sealy certainly depleted our numbers. Are there any full-blooded Unsealy here? I asked. No, some have more Unsealy in them than others, but all of us have mixed blood. It is the way it went after the war happened. My emotions became mixed. It was nice to see this community for the first time, but it shouldn't have been the first time. I should have grown up here with Arthur. Bapka and Bapa had done an amazing job of hiding me from Droga. They could have hidden me and my mother from the Black Law, too. If Mom had just gotten over her bullshit with my grandparents, the life I could have had would have been so different. I pushed that thought out of my mind because there was no use in regretting the past now, especially choices that I'd had no control over. Do the Unsealy here attend... I mean... I swallowed. Did they attend Arcania University? Yes, but under Sealy disguise, of course, Arthur replied, just as I did. Papa stopped the carriage in front of a crooked restaurant with an old wooden sign half hanging off the building. He tied the horse and we went inside. The County Clare was packed with people. It was one of those restaurants that was full of natural light but was sparsely decorated. The wooden tables were adorned with potted flowers, but not much else. The loud clinking of glasses and conversation filled the room as waitresses wearing aprons served heaping plates of potato pancakes. We took a table by the window, and I was served a traditional Irish breakfast of eggs, bacon, sausage, beans, mushrooms, half tomatoes, and fried potatoes. I was so excited that I could actually eat everything on my plate. The restaurant served food that was safe for my gluten allergy. It was so annoying and embarrassing, making everyone accommodate my dietary issues all the time. I knew it was a hassle and hated making things difficult for others, not to mention the fact I sometimes went hungry because there wasn't a lot for me to choose from when we went to most restaurants. That the County Clare could accommodate my illness and make things easier for everyone, alongside ensuring I had a full stomach, absolutely made my day. Every bite tasted more amazing than the last. Before, I would have cleaned my plate, but I wasn't able to eat more than half. I finished what I could and gave the rest to Ethan. He'd finished his food and the rest of mine and still looked like he wanted more. I haven't had meals at the palace that were this incredible, Ethan said as he put down his fork. My compliments to the chef. I nodded. It was good, what little I'd been able to take down. Over another refill of tea, Arthur and I had a very adamant argument about whether to call sliced potatoes chips or fries. They were fries. He was freaking nuts. Well, Vara rubbed her belly. You all right, my dear? Bobkia asked. The twins are rambunctious today, Vara said eagerly. I've never felt them move so much. Maybe today's the day, Arthur said. His entire countenance brightened as he squeezed Vara's shoulder and kissed her cheek. Their affection warmed my heart. I was excited to see the twins, too. Babies running around the estate sure would bring a bit of cheer back into our lives. No matter how bad the world got, life always moved on. Ethan was pretty quiet. I took it that he was being rude over Vara, and I couldn't have that, so I said, Something you want to voice aloud? Just things on my mind, he said. Nothing to be concerned about. Well, that was bullshit. You know when you lie, your back gets rigid? I can always tell. I straightened my shoulders and deepened my voice to make an impression of my mage. Whoa, nothing to be concerned about, Emma. I just have a stick up my ass that's straighter than usual. I don't wish to upset you, Ethan said gently. It's best not to talk about these things while having a nice meal. Okay, so it was about Droga's general crap of the day. Nobody told me anything about what was going on outside of the estate anymore. I knew they cared about me and didn't want me to worry, but still. I could read what Ethan was thinking about without having to reach across our bond. It'd been a lot of work getting me out of the house. He didn't want me to freak out when he'd come so far in making me stable enough to be in public without panicking. But that wasn't what we'd promised in our marriage. We'd agreed to share our burdens and something was weighing heavily on Ethan today. I could tell. I want to know, I insisted. Just give me the bare details and nothing else. She's your wife. Word of advice? Best be honest. Baba grumbled. Arthur shared a wary glance with Vara, but Ethan spoke before they did. From what we can tell, Droga has begun his assault on the rest of the cities in Malovia. He's conquered Vastun. 
it won't be long until he moves on to others. Isn't Vastun a human city? I questioned. It is, Ethan replied. He's using the usual techniques, curses, and enchantments to bewitch the humans and put them under his control, much like Elijah did. It's taking longer than we thought. He's being slow to take over each city one by one instead of leveling them down to the ground all at once. That seems rather practical of him. I sat back and crossed my arms. He's experimenting, Arthur said, trying to see what the best strategy is for getting the rest of the world under his control without humankind interfering. He has magic, but the humans have technology along with numbers. He needs to devise a plan to conquer them with the least amount of effort possible, and using his soldiers to trick the humans is easier than slaughtering them all. His forces remain strong in each city, and once the human population is sufficiently enchanted, he takes over without much struggle from the Fae. And Gabby? I raised an eyebrow. She's sitting very comfortably in Arcania University with that little brat of hers. Babkia commented. No need for her to get involved when her new mate can do all the dirty work. Is she a goddess now? The words made a sour taste fill my mouth. I was glad I was done with breakfast. They must be joined in a ceremony, much like marriage, Papa replied. She must become his wife officially if she is to be a goddess. And why haven't they done it yet? They will, Ethan said darkly. I'm sure when he's done conquering the rest of Melovia, he'll return to make Gabby his bride. Let's not talk about such dark things, Lara insisted. It's a beautiful day. Let's make the most of it. My anxiety wavered and dipped inside of me. Ethan immediately froze when he noticed the shift in my emotions and placed his hand on my thigh underneath the table. My frustration immediately squared off against my fear. Why did I have to be this way, so scared all the time? I told Ethan I wanted to know, so I needed to show him I could handle it. I had to take several deep breaths to calm myself down, though I felt myself unraveling quickly. My heartbeat quickened, and my throat felt like it was being squeezed by a viper. It's not happening here, I told myself. Everything's fine right now. You're okay. You're safe. It'd become a little mantra that I repeated over and over whenever I got scared, which was all the fucking time. I did feel safe here in Truaglan. Bad things were happening back home, but you know what? This was home now, and everything was fine. But what if Droga came here? What if he ruined this place, too? Don't spiral, Onawilka, Ethan said across our bond, and he squeezed my knee lightly. There is nothing here for him in Ireland, nothing that is interesting or powerful enough for him to conquer. Small towns mean nothing to him. This place will remain a safe haven. I didn't allow myself to object that it would only remain safe if Droga ceased to find me. He hadn't located me yet, so he wouldn't. He and Gabby could suck my dick. Either way, I reached out and held Ethan's hand tightly, focusing on the pulse in his hand until my heart rate slowed and my breathing became normal again. It took at least 15 minutes. After breakfast, we wandered the streets, going from shop to shop to look at all the different things that were for sale. Papa and Babkia picked up a few things they needed for the estate, while I enjoyed smelling all the different scented candles and observing the pretty emerald jewelry that was on display. Around me was the sound of laughter and the scent of blooming roses. Trilla Glan was more simplistic than I expected it to be. Life here was quiet and gentle. I wanted it to be like that always. Look, Emma, Vara pointed, and my eyes wandered up to a sign that said the Will-O-Wisp. In the window there were a variety of items, tarot cards, wands, and a variety of crystals. This must have been the place Odette got her oracle deck. It's a magic shop for Unseely, I said in wonder. You would never see something like that in Dolinska. Let's go in. Vara waddled ahead of me, and Arthur opened the door for her. Inside, the room was swathed in colors of dark purple and black. There was an entire wall full of wands, as well as stacks of oracle cards behind a glass case and a table lined with crystals. There were more within the shop, 
Pewter statues of the gods lined the walls, above cauldrons and bundles of cedar incense. There were dried flowers, powders for spells, and even potion ingredients. But even more curious than these were all the old items scattered about. There were ancient books, old lamps and photographs, decades-old furniture, and farming supplies that hadn't been used since the 1700s. It looks like an antique shop, I said, peering at an unusual clock with crooked hands. Uncle Fay can draw energy from anything, as long as it's magical, Arthur said. In the past, Uncle Fay were known to gain energy from darkness. They'd go to battlefields after the fight was done, or famine inflicted areas to gain power from the negativity there. So I could actually increase my power by drawing energy from negative things? I asked. Oh yes, it's quite possible, Arthur said. There was always more about the unseely world to learn and understand. I didn't think if I lived a hundred years I'd comprehend it. Arthur and Vara took longer in the store than we did. When they came out, Vara was carrying a small brown bag at her side. Here, Emma, this is for you. Vara looped a thin black rope necklace around my neck. I looked down. Attached to the necklace was a circular black stone, locked inside a type of bronze cage. It's called black tourmaline. It's very good for protection against negative energy, even your own, Vara said. The crystal should absorb some of your anxiety and help with the pain. I was touched. Thank you, Vara. Everyone's spoiling me today. Well, we didn't get much of a Christmas, Arthur said, so consider this a holiday. Babka and Papa had met up with a couple of old friends in the park, so we were stuck in town until they were done chatting, and with old people, that could take forever. We got some ice cream from a cart nearby. Vara and I sat on the edge of a water fountain and ate our ice cream while Arthur and Ethan kept themselves preoccupied by tossing a frisbee back and forth that they'd conjured. I finished off my ice cream and said, At least they're getting along. Vara sighed. I do wish Ethan would believe me. I'm not a traitor. You know I don't think that, right? I said. I know the evidence looks bad. I understand where Ethan is coming from. You don't have to apologize, Vara replied. He is doing what he can to protect his mate. I'm sure Arthur would do the same if our positions were switched. I shrugged. I don't know. Ethan has an issue with jumping to conclusions. He's lost a lot. We all have, Vara said. Give him some grace. I'm sure everything will come to light eventually. Do you really think someone has betrayed us to Gabby? I asked her. Out here, with the birds and the sunlight, treachery seemed like a foolish thing to discuss, even though I knew it was certainly something that happened. I do, but whoever it is, they probably had no choice, Vara said sadly. None of us would betray you willingly, Emma. You know that. I dropped my head. I don't know what to believe. We were quiet for a moment before Vara's fingers brushed against my skin. That's a very special bracelet you've got there, Vara said, nodding at the key around my wrist. Oh, this? I lifted up my arm to show her. It was the bracelet Odette had made me. The key Professor Calliope had given me was attached. Scattered around it were three charms that my friends had gifted me the night before my wedding. It's one of my favorite things. It is very special. You'll want to keep it safe, Vara said. I don't think I've ever seen anything quite like it, and I'm not sure I will again. It's definitely unique. The bracelet wasn't worth much, but it was meaningful to me, a gift from my friends. I wouldn't part with it for a fortune. Vara squeezed my fingers. Emma... You're one of my closest friends. There's not a person like you in all the world. I gave a small smile. Yeah, I know. The prophecy and all that. It's not because you're the world weaver. It's because of who you are, Vara insisted. Not many fey would give themselves up for their friends, but I've seen you be willing to, time and again. I know this is a tough time right now, and you're not sure how you're going to make it through. But you will, and everything will be better than it ever was. Just surrender, and let the seasons pass as they will. I promise you, time heals all wounds. 
Her words made me choke up. I didn't want to break down in the middle of this park, so I wiped my eyes and said, Wow, Vara, that really means something. I'm glad, Vara said. I've done my best to be a good friend to you since I've known you. We all make mistakes, and I know you're still beating yourself up for the mistakes you've made in the past. But sometimes, those mistakes can lead to the correct outcome. Nobody, not even you, can truly know what the gods have planned. And I know they've got big dreams for you, Emma. We all do. I sniffed as a tear rolled down my face. I'd like to just be able to get through the day. Take one step at a time. Before you know it, you'll be on top of the world again. You'll see. Vara gave me a wink, and hope lifted in my heart. If she could be this optimistic after all she'd seen, and still be excited to be bringing two children into the world, I could get through this. I just had to keep holding on. We spent the entire day shopping until night settled over the village. Once it got dark, tiny lights hovered over the area and all around us. I thought they were fireflies, but on closer inspection, I saw that they resembled balls of lights with dragonfly wings. Ethan caught me peering and went to explain. Fortune fairies are a type of fakin. They're more or less sprites. They've been known to grant you good luck if you catch them. I reached out and grasped one of the glowing lights in my palm. It dimmed before shining vibrantly again. <laughs> they're not that hard to catch. Not unless they don't want to be caught. But they're fair-tempered things. They love being chased by children. If you plant the right kind of flowers, sometimes they'll hang around your house permanently and bring you luck. They sound like Malilutwe. They are similar, but fortune fairies don't bond with a particular fae. They're more fickle and will move from place to place even if they like where they're living. They get bored staying in one location too long. Don't other supernaturals sell them? I asked. I'd seen a couple of carts in Dolinska pawning fortune fairies off at a low price. It's a scam. Fortune fairies can't truly be caught, Ethan stated. Even if you trap them in a jar that's magically bound with a ward, they can vanish from it at any time. Vendors who sell fortune fairies have made an agreement with them. They'll pose in the jar to sell, and once the buyer brings them home, they'll vanish and return back to the seller. The seller gets to keep the money, and he gives the fortune fairy some shiny coins in return. Hoy, you're keeping us up! Babka's voice echoed across the village. She and Papa had retrieved the carriage. We best be on our way if we're to start supper! Vara giggled. I helped her up and we walked toward the carriage together as the boys trailed behind. Arthur had to boost her into the carriage. I needed help, too, as I was too tired to take the step up. So Ethan lifted me into it. Papa shook the whip and clucked his tongue, and the horse pawed his hoof before we set out of town. I'd had a nice day. I found myself falling asleep against Ethan's shoulder as the moonlight streamed gently across my face. The wind whispered through the leaves of the trees, and everything felt right again in the world. It'd been so long since that happened, I could hardly remember what it felt like. Just as I was settling into a gentle sleep, there was a loud slamming sound, and the carriage rocked sideways. Vara let out a scream. My eyes violently shot open, and my stomach dropped out just as the carriage tipped over onto its side. We all went sprawling out of it, rolling into the dusty road. What had happened? I hadn't seen. The horse that had been pulling the carriage let out a high-pitched whinny, which died out mid-cry. My heart stopped cold. I felt blood underneath my fingertips. It was streaming out of the horse. Ethan let out a growl as he changed into a wolven, and I dared to lift my eyes to see what faced us. They were deer, stags made of shadow their velvet horns dripping blood and eyes burning like coals from hell. They were the size of horses, but had gnashing teeth and hoofs sharp like razors. They resembled Droga so closely it made my gut churn. Karkins, Babka hissed as she staggered to her feet. Demonic minions of Droga. So that's it then. 
He'd found me. We were surrounded by them. There was a group, too many for me to count. I attempted to use my powers to take control of the creatures' minds. They were monsters, after all, so I should have been able to control them. I couldn't. My magic backfired on me as I invaded the minds of the Karkins. I was immediately pushed out. Droga already had a hold on them, which meant any attempt I could make to take over their minds was useless. Run, Emma! Bapa moved in front of me to protect me from the Karkins, summoning unseelie magic to his hands. He used his power to latch on to the Karkin nearest him, ripping it apart with his power. I couldn't. I was frozen. I hunched over and put my hands over my ears, rocking back and forth. This couldn't be happening. Not again. Ethan snarled, lashing out with his teeth and claws. The Karkins kept their distance, but shook their antlered heads angrily. I knew if they managed to touch me, they'd take me back to Droga. And what could I possibly do to stop them? I attempted to summon a battle orb, but it fizzled out. Nothing. I could do nothing. Even before I'd become a student at Arcania University, I was stronger than this. Ethan felt my magic struggling and pressed closer to me, daring the Karkins to take a step closer. Please work. I pleaded with my magic, but it didn't. Despite trying desperately to cast a spell, my magic just wouldn't come. I thought for sure they'd set in on us before the forms of my grandparents planted themselves between the monsters and I. Bapkya had joined Papa, and they were keeping a number of Karkins away from us with their magic. Their unseelie power was unbound, picking the demonic deer apart bit by bit every time their magic touched them, leaving black blood spilled all over the area and across tree trunks. I would have been impressed if I wasn't so terrified. Arthur had transformed and was battling the Karkins with all his might. One of the demons latched their sharp teeth into his shoulder. He gave a painful howl just as the second Karkin jawed his pelt. Kicking and screaming, Arthur was dragged around the other side of the carriage by two Karkins. I couldn't see what was happening, but I heard the whining whimpers of a wolf as the Karkins tore into him. Ethan, help my brother, I begged. I dug my hands into his pelt and pulled at his fur. They were killing him. I just knew it. My duty is to protect you. Ethan insisted, but his tone wavered. He danced on his paws, as if he wasn't sure he was making the right move. Arthur, Vara breathed. She winced as she shakily stood and ambled around the carriage to help her mate, one arm wrapped protectively around the children inside her. Vara, don't, I whimpered, but she still went anyway. She summoned a spell into her hand and shot it out before her as she disappeared behind the other side of the carriage. There were a few flashes of light and the noises of spells exploding. Then there was a horrible screaming sound accompanied by the tearing of flesh. My heart hollowed out as Vara's cries filled the air. The Karkins threatening us had their heads lopped off by Bapa's spell. With the threat ebbing, I found the courage to stagger against the carriage, using it to hold me upright as I dragged my feet around to the other side. My eyes refused to process the scene. I couldn't comprehend it. My entire mind, body, everything went numb. Around me, I was aware of Bobka's magic latching on to the last two Karkins. Their forms collapsed against the ground as her unseelie magic ended their lives. The moonlight came back, banishing the clouds in the night, but it seemed a cruel setting for what was coming next. Ethan let out a low groan, a choking noise, like the sound of someone drowning, overtook my senses as my eyes fixated on the mangled body on the ground. Vara was swimming in her own blood. She gasped for air as gore trickled out of her mouth. Chunks of flesh had been ripped out of her, and there were puncture wounds where their hoofs had shredded her. All around us were the body parts of the demons. My grandparents had destroyed the Karkins, but Vara was badly wounded gravely wounded. Her blood poured from her chest, streaming out onto the ground like a fountain. They'd injured Arthur too, but not as badly as his mate. 
He crawled to her and pulled her into his lap, lip trembling. You made it, he gasped out. You will survive. Somehow, my intuition acknowledged what Arthur refused to accept. Vara had been completely mutilated by those demons. Babkian Bapa had barely stopped them before they'd torn her limbs off her body, but even then, they were too late to save her. It was only a matter of time now. Arthur refused to give up hope. He lifted Vara onto Ethan's back and said, Help her! She was too weak to cry out in pain. I forced myself onto Ethan's back behind her, and I whispered, Hurry. The next few moments were such a blur. It was as if I wasn't living this moment in time, but rather revisiting it from another point in my memory. I couldn't recall how we'd gotten from that place in the woods to the estate, but we did, somehow. All I could remember from that mile-long run was that I'd steadied Vara on Ethan's back and urged him to go faster. Perhaps it wasn't too late. Maybe I was being pessimistic. Miroslava was an amazing doctor. She could fix anything. I called out for her help the moment we approached the porch. People knew there was something wrong right away. I saw Lucian first, who paled at the sight of Vara. He reached out to carry her into the house, and as her lithe weight left Ethan's back, I noticed his white pelt was soaked red by Vara's blood. It felt like I'd been waiting in a very warm pool as I fell off his back, and he changed back into a man to catch me before I hit the ground. I couldn't help it. I had to see. I wanted to know if anything could be done. I followed the trail of blood upstairs to Arthur and Vara's bedroom. Vara was lying on the bed, staring up at the ceiling as if she was barely aware of her surroundings. She took shallow breaths in a daze as Lucian knelt by her side, stroking her hair and murmuring things in Malovian to calm her. I heard the tinkering of surgical instruments. My throat seized up as I witnessed the scalpels and clamps splaying across the metal tray that Miroslava had placed at the end of the bed. She wasn't preparing to stop the bleeding. She was getting ready to operate. There were so many people filling this room. I was aware of the sharp and quick tones of my grandparents in the background as they barked orders. I didn't know how Babkia and Bapa had gotten there so fast, nor Arthur, but he was there. He staggered to Vara's bedside and fell to his knees, grasping her hand as tears trailed from his eyes. The rest of you go into the woods. Find the bodies, burn them, and scatter the ashes far away, Babkia barked. Take a portal to another country to get rid of them. Droga cannot find the evidence here. Stefan and Theo hurried out the door, but I barely registered. I was too wrapped up in the sight of Vara as Arthur clutched her weak fingers and sobbed. My mother was crying. I wished she'd stop wailing right now. Couldn't she see there was nothing to be done? All I cared for was my brother's comfort, his sorrow. Why wasn't she being strong for him? Suddenly, my heart gave a stutter, and I felt something in the room physically change. Chasm. Farah wheezed from the bed. Kalina. That's all she said. Her eyes dimmed and her mouth fell open as her head dipped back. Ara? Arthur nearly suffocated on her name. He grabbed her shoulder and shook it lightly. Come back. Come back. Miroslava didn't stop. She moved quickly as she peeled back the folds of ruined clothing around Vara's body and said, I'm sorry. We must operate immediately. An aesthetic. Arthur choked out. She's already gone, Arthur, Miroslava said, as gently as she could with as much urgency as she could allow. The infants are losing oxygen as we speak. I need to get them out. Ethan, Emma, help me. I moved as if electrocuted. My limbs jolted as I crossed to the bed. I maneuvered like I had strings pulled by a puppeteer, my body orchestrated by fate and not by my own mind. I wasn't sure what she wanted me to do, but the next thing I knew, Lucien was laying a clean towel across my outstretched arms. Miroslava didn't seem to need any help, and she moved quickly. Vara had lost so much blood that she didn't even bleed when Miroslava cut into her. Something warm and wriggling was laid into my arms, and the sound of a baby's cry filled the room. 
it was a little girl, the firm weight of a newborn child, screaming for all the world to hear, pressed against my chest. Instinctively, I wrapped the baby in the cloth Lucian had given me and tucked her close to me. I could feel my heartbeat connect against her skin as her tiny fists angrily waved in the air. I looked down at the baby to take in her features. Vara's pale blonde hair stuck up in a mess along the top of her head, and I caught a glimpse of Arthur's nose. Beyond that, her features were lost to me. I think Miroslava had cut the cord, but I couldn't be sure. I wasn't aware of much else but the sight of this tiny baby kicking in my arms and her stone-cold mother on the bed. Emotions should have been coursing through me, but I felt next to nothing. I think I was in shock. Ethan's face was completely baffled as Miroslava placed a little boy in his arms. His eyes took on a visage of wonderment as he looked over the child, who was crying just as loudly as his sibling. The boy looked nearly identical to the daughter I held, fraternal twins just like me and Arthur. I had the feeling something wonderful would happen today, and it did, but something terrible had happened too. Arthur's head fell against Vara's mottled chest as he wept. I clutched Kalina closer to me, feeling my brother's aching grief for his mate. He'd become a father in the worst possible way. Just this morning, he had hope for a bright future ahead with his brand new family. What was left of that future was dust. These children had no mother, and Vara was gone. Chapter 5 Ethan I was very tired of attending the funerals of friends. How Arthur had wept. I'd never forget it. The sound of his wails as Vera's body burned on the pyre became a permanent soundtrack in my mind as the days dragged on. I think the loss destroyed him. Even after Vera's ashes were scattered to the wind and the remains of the pyre were buried, he moved around like a ghost. I had the thought that since Vera had died, Arthur had gone with her and his body remained as a lonely, empty vessel here on this earthly plane. I feared his fate, because if Emma's prophecy came true, I would be in his place. I promised my wife I wouldn't lose myself in her loss, but seeing it firsthand happen to someone else made my worst fears amplify. I'd fall apart in her absence, and if there was a chance of recovery, I didn't know if I'd be strong enough to accept her passing and move on. Stefan and Theo had taken the bodies of the Karkins to Spain and burned them there, spreading the ashes over the countryside. When they'd gone back in a week to check, Droga's demons were swarming the area, searching for Emma's location. Phelan had very quick thinking to get rid of them far outside of Ireland. If we hadn't, Droga would have been here by now. The only hope we had in all of it was the children, and they were a blessing. The infants required constant care and were a good distraction. Artie, are you sure you don't want to hold her? Emma lifted Kalina in her arms. We were in the nursery, a room painted yellow and decorated with white lambs and newborn chicks. Vera had picked everything out. There were countless reminders of her here. Arthur took a step back, giving an agonized glance at the child in her arms. N no, in a bit, I suppose. He hastily left the room. Emma boosted Kalina up and gave a sad sigh. Since Vera had died, Arthur had thrown himself into his research to get away from it all. He rarely saw his children preferring to hold himself up in the library for hours at a time. I couldn't say Arthur was a poor father, because that would be wrong. I just don't think he knew how to cope without Vera. We need to step in, Emma had said privately to me, moments after the twins were born. I immediately accepted. Without a mother, and a father too grief-stricken to go on, these children needed someone to look after them, and who better than family? Emma and I were their aunt and uncle, as well as their godparents, it was our duty to provide for them if Arthur emotionally couldn't. I'd never changed a diaper or made formula, but Ivana showed me how. Emma's mother was distracted by the arrival of her grandchildren, which gave Lucian more free time to search for the Unseelie Stone, although I think he spent so much time in the library in order to support Arthur. Someone had to bring him out of it, and I hoped his father would be the one to help him out of this terrible spot. Lucian had roused me from my grief over the death of my father, after all though the loss of a mate was entirely different. I sat in a rocking chair, swaying back and forth. Chasm cooed in my arms and latched on the stuffed lamb I'd given him. 
He nibbled on the ear, while Kalina cried violently for food. Emma grabbed a warm bottle Ivana had dropped off and slipped it into Kalina's mouth. She sucked at the milk with vigor, nose wrinkling as she observed Emma's face. Chasm was an easy baby, gentle and sleepy. His sister was a riot. She was constantly kicking her legs and arms, crying out about something. She seemed permanently disgruntled with the world and everyone who lived in it. You want to switch? Emma asked. Of course. We switched off. Emma took Chasm, who was about to drift off, and I nestled Kalina into my arm. She finished off the bottle and then pushed out her arms, tossing it onto the floor and giving a loud yell. I burped her, but even then she began to fuss louder. By how red her face was getting, I knew she was about to start screaming again. Emma told me babies liked skin-to-skin -skin contact. I unbuttoned my shirt with one hand and put Kalina against my chest so she could hear my heartbeat. Her eyelids fluttered. I could tell she was trying to stay awake, but ultimately lost the battle as the rocking chair put her out of it. How do you do that? Emma asked, a bit of jealousy in her tone. She likes you. She likes you too. You're just not patient enough. I parted back a bit of Kalina's blonde hair with my finger. I liked being around them. There was a certain light and newness about children that couldn't be extinguished by the nastiness of the world. Emma took a seat in the opposite rocking chair and flung her head back against the headrest. Ugh, oh, these kids are going to kill me. They are fun, though. Kalina had grasped for my finger in her sleep, and I let her hold on to it. She had a firm grip, even as a baby. She'd hold a sword well when she came of age. They are. Emma gently wiped Chasm's nose. Just wish I could keep up. Emma still wasn't feeling well, but Ivana subbed in when she had to rest. We had friends, too. There were plenty of people who were all too eager to lend a hand if one of us needed a break. If I was honest, privately, I wanted these children all to myself, and I didn't want to share. It made it easier to pretend that life was different. Emma stared at the stuffed lamb on Chasm's chest. Do you think my brother will get better? These kids can't grow up without him. I wanted to tell her he would, but I couldn't promise it. It's been so short a time. I don't think we can know at the moment. It's just... I've heard of fathers who can't stand their children after they lose their wives. Most move on, but what if Arthur never does? I don't think he harbors any resentment toward them. It wasn't their fault she died. She was gone before they were even born. Vera would have had a normal labor if... I know. Kalina let out a soft snuff. A familiar wave of regret rolled through me, and I said, I wish I could apologize. I know it wouldn't change anything. You can't, Emma said bluntly. It's over. Her words were stinging but true. I knew Vera wasn't the betrayer now. It made no sense for Droga to kill her if she was working for Gabby. Guilt wasn't the right word when I'd considered my cruel words to her. Shame was more like it. I had no right to accuse her like I did, and she died thinking I considered her a traitor. Emma patted Chasm's shoulder lightly and said, You know, I wonder every day if Vera would still be here if she hadn't made that contract with the Spring Princess. My jaw tightened. When we'd been on the Spring Princess's island to retrieve the Sealy Stone, her vila had put Arthur under a spell. He would have danced himself to death if Vera hadn't bargained with the Spring Princess to let her and her mate go free. Years off her life in exchange for their freedom. I thought Vera had more time. I was devastatingly wrong. Didn't Lucian have a similar agreement with the Spring Princess when she kidnapped him as a child and put a changeling in his place? I asked. Yes, Emma agreed. An identical one, right down to the last word. My lips flattened. I don't understand. Lucian and Vera made the same deal with the Spring Princess, years off their life in exchange for leaving the island. But Lucian is far older, and he's still around. Why is he alive and Vera is not? I don't know, Emma said miserably. Fey magic is so complex. Illusions are intentions, but that can mean almost anything. Just because Vera and Lucian took the same contract doesn't mean the terms are the same. The wording the Spring Princess gave them could mean anything. We don't really know what they promised. Perhaps Vera was fated to die young, and her deal took what was left of her life, I murmured. It's what I concluded, Emma said. Nothing else makes sense. 
It was hard to comprehend the actions and words of the spring princess, a being who was nearly as powerful as a deity. Lucian and Vera had made an identical agreement, but somewhere along the line, the contract each of them had made with her was wildly different, and so were the results. Is Arthur aware of the contract she made? I asked. She made that bargain with the Spring Queen to save his life. Arthur had been bewitched by a villa at the time. I don't think he remembered much about leaving the island, or many of the details surrounding what had come before. He doesn't know about the deal. Vera never told him. And what point is there in torturing him with the facts? Emma asked. He'd blame himself. Say Vera sacrificed herself for him. Whether she did or not, tormenting my brother with the truth will only hurt him now. It won't bring Vera back. I nodded solemnly. I didn't like keeping secrets, but sometimes lying to someone was necessary to prevent harming them further. Arthur was heartbroken enough. The door creaked open lightly. It was Ozzy. There was flour streaked across his clothes, and powdered sugar flecked across his cheek. He'd been baking, as always. Ozzy made a giddy sound when he saw Kalina and Chasm sleeping in our arms. Oh, they're so cute, he whispered, bending over to take a look at Chasm. Now I want one. You'd have to talk to Jasper about that, Emma said, giving a quiet laugh. At the mention of his mate, Ozzy frowned. He drew himself up and said, I feel for Jazz. He's not eating. I even made his favorite dessert the other day, and he barely touched it. I can't make him smile anymore. If anyone was a mess besides Arthur, it was Jasper. I knew he'd been close with Vera, and he was taking her death very hard. It's not you. He's just grieving. I know. Ozzy pouched out his lip. Anyway, I came by to tell Ethan that Finlay wants to speak with him in the foyer. Urgently, if you please. Why didn't he walk up here and tell me himself? I asked Cross. He's not good with babies, Ozzy said, shaking his head. His clomping around bothers them. Well, that was a good point. Finlay must have elephant shifter blood in his ancestry because he never did anything quietly. Would you like to hold Kalina while I go talk to him? Would I ever? Ozzy held out his arms and I slipped Kalina into them. Kalina snuggled into his shirt and Ozzy brightened. She thinks you're sweet, Emma offered with a smile. I smell like cupcakes. I've been in the kitchen all day, he said with a giggle. Emma and Ozzy chatted quietly while I did my best to walk out without waking the twins. Finlay was leaning against the wall when I entered the foyer. He jerked his head to tell me to come near, and the movement irked me. Finlay and I weren't quite friends, but we were allies. Didn't mean we got along spectacularly well. What is it? I asked in a brusque tone. I think I've found it, Finlay said eagerly. The unseelie stone. Great. Why isn't it here? I asked. Because we have to go get it, you doughty bambot, Finlay scowled. The stone was sold to a warlock in Edinburgh who peddles magical objects. As far as I've found, he hasn't got rid of it yet. I say we head there tonight and give him an offer. And if he doesn't accept, we batter him round the head till he sees things our way. An easy job. Very well. When do we leave? After midnight, obviously. For a former vigilante, you're not very bright. The cover of darkness helps with all that, you know. I mumbled something rude under my breath before I turned my back on Finlay and retreated out of the room. He wanted to rough up the traitor who had the stone, but in my mind, it was more realistic that Finlay and I would be trading blows by the end of the night. Emma noticed my foul mood over dinner. How are things with you and your boyfriend? Her jibe hardly affected me. Finlay and I are going to Edinburgh tonight. The unseely stone might be there. That's good news. You should be happy, she insisted. I'd be happier if I didn't have to go alone with him, I complained. You two have to keep it together. Should I be sending someone to babysit? She asked. No, I grumbled. A big group looks suspicious and will attract attention. It's best if it's just the two of us. Why can't you guys just get along? Emma asked. It's for the good of the world. I'm very certain he wants to be the boss on this excursion, and I'm not used to someone telling me what to do, especially him. Finlay and I aren't chummy. Because both of you have to have the biggest dick in the room, Emma shot at me. Look, I know you used to give him orders, but it wouldn't kill you to listen to Finn every now and again. He's upset about Vera too. Cut him some slack and just do what he says. 
If it gets us the unseelie stone, you can afford to swallow your pride for one night. I gripped my fork tightly. I suppose. It'd make your wife happy, so it's in your best interest, Emma said, as she took another bite of shepherd's pie. We know how to perform the ceremony to open the portal. If we get the unseelie stone, we can put all this to rest. Don't you want to be done with this? I really did. I wished to get back to a normal life, whatever that would be, once the portal to Edenmire was open for good. If that meant traipsing around Scotland and taking orders from a cocky Gaelic bastard, so be it. I was ready for this to be over. Edinburgh was a town that looked like it came straight from a storybook. The buildings were colored charcoal and brown, gothic in design and very majestic. The streets smelled like rain, and history seemed to resound from every corner. It was a beautiful city. Emma would love to visit, but we weren't here for sightseeing. I resolved to take her here for a romantic getaway once Droga was dead and done with. Finlay and I walked along the sidewalk, our heads ducked against the light drizzle. Tell me again how you located the stone, I asked. I still don't understand. Finlay gave a sigh as if it was tiresome to reiterate. I told you. Lord Radcliffe sold the unseely stone from the Circle's treasury, then sold it to a man named Hackett Hughes in Scotland for a quarter of a milli. Hughes had it for some time, nearly a year, as he was a collector of unseely artifacts. But for some odd reason, as badly as he'd wanted it, Hackett decided to sell. Once the dark necklace was out of his possession, he died shortly afterward in a freak accident. Interesting, I raised my eyebrows. Very. The unseely necklace passed through three different hands before it finally landed in the possession of Atticus Ziegler. Each of the owners died within weeks of selling it, all very gory deaths. And if you remember correctly, Lord Radcliffe died as well, crushed after the catacombs collapsed in the city. That can't be a coincidence, I said. There must be some sort of magic at play. That's something we haven't found out yet, but I'm sure we'll decipher the mystery. Once the stone is in our hands, Finlay said, We know Ziegler had the necklace for a month before he sold the stone to an auction house. He died too, you know. Another accident. They put the necklace up for auction, and it was sold to an unscrupulous bidder. There were no receipts of who it sold to. The business itself was an illegal buying ring for contraband magical objects. They peddled things like indigenous relics that were stolen from the Hawkeye tribe, or rare items from Atlantis, so they didn't keep any paperwork in case the United Supernatural Union caught word of what they were doing. The United Supernatural Union was an international magical council with a representative from every race. Their authority overruled everyone, even a king's decree. Getting caught by them would result in the worst possible punishment. What'd you do then? Magdalena and I tried raiding the place, looking for a record of who the stone might have gone to, but there was nothing to find. And the auction house moved locations... We lost the trail yet again. That's when the case went cold. So if there were no records, how'd you find out who bought it? A stroke of luck, that, Finlay said. My parents live in Edinburgh, in the Seely community on the far side of town. I still come back to visit them from time to time. Do they know where we are? I asked, my voice a low growl. Keep your trousers on. They know I fled Malovia, but I haven't told them where I've gone, and they know why I can't say. Finlay poked his head around the corner. I was stopping in for a moment last weekend to tell them Vera had died. They gave condolences. Da put down the paper to give me a hug, and sure as shite, right on the back page was an advertisement posted by a man named Septius Squalum. I don't follow. The ad described an elusive necklace for sale. I couldn't believe my eyes. Right on the back of the local news was a black and white picture of the unseelie stone. You're kidding. I'm not. I believe the gods must be on our side, because I saw that photograph at just the right time, Finlay said. The advertisement said the necklace was for sale at a pawn shop in the shady part of town. I reckon it's still there. How well have you studied this individual? If he sold black market goods, he could be dangerous. I don't know much about Septius, other than he's a warlock, a necromancer to be exact. But if we confront him... I don't think you have to worry about backlash from the Miriamic Coven. They exiled him years ago for crimes that are too gruesome to go on about when we're short on time. Witches were hardly a Faye's favorite topic, 
but I really didn't like the ones who dabbled in death magic. Necromancers were nothing to toy with. Do you think he knows what he has? I asked. No, Finlay said. Hardly be trying to sell it if he did. And how can you be sure he'll sell it to us? He'd sell his own mother for the right price, Finlay said distastefully. See, from what I could tell, Septius fled to Dark Island the moment he got his hands on the necklace. He's lived on Dark Island for a long time, has a shop in Shade Hills that's still running called Cursed Collectibles. But here's the odd thing. A couple weeks passed with the stone in his possession before he came back to Edinburgh, with the necklace in tow, I should say. Why would he do that? Dark Island's neutral territory for all supernaturals. No one group owned it, and since the supernatural world's prisons were based on the island, it mostly become a place for the outcasts, criminals, and degenerates of the magical world to gather. If this individual was peddling contraband objects in a place where it wasn't illegal to do so, why would he return here? Beats me, Finlay gave a shrug. We can ask him questions once we get what we're after. Come on. Finlay opened the door to a shop on a very shady-looking side street. We went in. It surprised me that the store was open this late at night. But then again, this man was obviously dealing in things no upstanding member of society wanted to be involved in. My suspicions mounted as I observed the shelves. This wasn't your average pawn shop. Bones of werewolves and horns of alicorns were placed beside jarred griffin eyes and dragon claws. A dried mermaid tail was on display, alongside vampire fangs and... I realized with horror, a leather purse made out of elementi skin. A shiver rolled over my spine as I saw there were fey wings for sale. They were pegged to a board behind a glass case in the same way you'd mount dead insects. I felt sorry for the poor sorceress who'd had her wings removed to make a decoration for sick bastards like this guy. Oh yeah, if the Union ever came in here, Septius would be arrested on the spot. So why hadn't he remained on Dark Island where he could get away with this sort of thing? Behind the counter was a balding man. He had sagging, wrinkled skin and a toothless mouth that curled my insides. His clothes were clearly dirty. I don't think he'd washed in days. I could smell him from here, and his scent was identical to the corpses the necromancer no doubt played with. A parrot sat on the man's shoulder, squawking obscenities and flapping its wings. That had to be Septius. I'd never seen a person so unjarring. Good evening, gentlemen, Septius said in a croaking voice. You look like a couple of boys who know how to have fun. What's your interest? Powdered wyvern eggs? Flesh-eating slugs? I can assure you, I have it all. I wanted to deck him immediately, just get right to the brawling, but Finlay was more diplomatic than I was willing to be. He leaned on the counter and said, Saw your ad in the paper. The man's gum smile instantly dissolved. Sorry, I parted with that necklace some days ago. Internally, I wanted to scream, but Finlay remained cool. Where? I don't believe that's any of your business, Septius replied. I'm afraid you must leave. The shop is closed for the evening. We need to find that necklace. We'll pay any price, Finlay insisted. That isn't the issue, Septius hastened to explain. He'd noticed I was getting angry and licked his lips anxiously. You see, I can't recall where it might have went. I was done playing games. I reached out and grabbed Septius around the neck, squeezing tight. The parrot flew off his shoulder with a squawk, and Septius wheezed as my fingers tightened around his throat. Who did you sell the stone to? I bellowed. Where and when? I did not sell it, Septius choked out. Was it stolen? I asked. No, but it was here one minute, gone the next. You must believe me. How could that be the truth? I didn't believe this snake for one minute, and I was willing to do what I had to if it meant getting the truth out of him. Finlay, though, had come prepared. Take this. Finlay fished in his pocket and placed a small bottle on the counter. I smelled the ingredients from here. It was a simple truth-telling potion, like they'd used on me during my trial. And we'll know you aren't lying. I tossed Septius away from me. He clutched at his throat before scrambling for the potion. He uncorked the bottle, and the liquid trickled down his throat. I noticed a slight change in his eye color, and his panicked voice became more monotone as the potion took effect. 
I put an advertisement for the necklace in the paper two weeks prior, Septius rattled off. I was polishing it to put on display the next morning when something strange happened. It was just before lunch. I was on my feet one moment, the sun shining through my window with the necklace in my hands. The next, I was on the floor, covered in snow with the night all around me. My clothes were soaked and my fingers were frostbitten as if I'd been in the coldest snow of my life. He lifted his hands. I saw strange markings crossed over his fingers, scars remaining from treated frostbite. I'd seen it a time or two, living in a freezing climate like Malovia. I looked everywhere, but the necklace was gone, Septius said. I checked with a client. Two days had passed, and I couldn't remember they'd gone by. Septius shivered, but the tale had failed to convince me. Your story has quite a lot of holes, I said through my teeth. I'm just as clueless as you are, Septius barked. My mind was here one minute, and then gone the next. You can't imagine how odd that felt. I swear, I've told you everything I know. Did you look for the necklace after that? Were there any clues to where it might have gone? Finlay asked. No. I don't want anything to do with that necklace ever again, Septius hissed. If you find it, don't bring it back here. We've no intent on ever dealing with the likes of you again, I sneered. I suggest you return to Dark Island and stay there permanently. Europe doesn't suit your interests, now or in the future. Septius gulped. I knew he took my warning seriously. I promise I'll get out of town, if you leave now. Let's go, Ethan. Finlay grabbed my arm. I'm not getting anything else out of this guy. I forced myself not to wrench Finlay's arm off and let him guide me out of the store. I heard the lock to the store click behind us as we returned to the street. I laughed under my breath, like that would stop me. I'd rip the door off with one hand if I wanted to. I had the capability. This is bad, Finlay mumbled. He let go of my arm and shoved his hands into his pockets as we turned into a nearby park. Worse than I thought, actually. Are you sure we got everything out of him? What if he was able to overpower the truth-telling potion and still lie? Witches can break our spells, I pointed out. Lady Magdalena brewed it herself. It was the last of her stock that I still had to use, Finlay fumed. I don't care how good of a warlock he thinks he is. He's not strong enough to overpower a potion created by the strongest sorceress of her time. And what was all that rubbish, I demanded. He says he had the stone but can't recall where he took it or why. He was bewitched, Finlay said. That's why he doesn't remember. By who, though? Who did he give the stone to? My voice was too loud, but at the moment, I couldn't be bothered if I woke up all of Scotland. I don't think it's a who, rather than a what, Finlay said. I paused to consider the possibilities. Do you think the Unseely Stone is sentient? It's possible. I bet all the crystals are, Finlay said. You have to prove yourself to them in order to have them in your possession. They give themselves to people. It's not the other way around. You all had to go through trials to earn the others. The stones choose you. You don't choose them. Is that why the other owners of the Dark Necklace died in accidents? Very possible. The stone might have cursed them. Finlay sat on a nearby bench to think. And why didn't the stone kill Septius as well? I pressed. His necromancy magic must have something to do with it. I'm unsure. Finlay rubbed his chin. We should go back. I turned on my heel, already set on the idea. We can interrogate Septius until he tells us everything he knows. We won't get anything out of him. If he doesn't remember, the unseely stone erased his memory. There's has nothing in his brain for us to purge, even with magic. I sat beside him, slamming my fist on the arm of the bench. Damn it! This is another dead end, like you hit before. Nay, it's worse. Finlay said darkly, If we're right, and the unseely stone has a mind of its own, we'll be hard-pressed to locate it. We just have to prove ourselves to it, like we did all the others, I argued. That's going to be difficult, when we know the unseely stone is willing to use its magic to influence fate. None of the other stones did that. It could lead us around in circles trying to find it. 
So how do we outsmart an extremely powerful magical object? I asked. I don't know. I could be at a loss. Finlay clasped his hands and stared at the wet ground. We know from what Septius told us that the Unseelie Stone is purposefully manipulative. But we have dark magic, I insisted. Unseelie blood runs through my veins as well as Emma's. We can show the stone we deserve to have it. Finlay fisted a hand in his curly locks. All I know is, unlike the others, this particular crystal is willing to yield its power against the people who want to use it. If the Unseely Stone doesn't want to be found, it won't be. Chapter 6 Emma Having children in a dark and terrible world like this one seemed like such a mistake. But I couldn't deny the light of hope that ignited in me each time I looked into Kalina's eyes. I'd just put Chasm down for a nap and was giving Kalina a bottle. She sucked at it gently, lids lulling closed. I clutched her to my chest, as if holding her closer would prevent her from dealing with such a destructive existence. I knew it wouldn't help. Eventually, Kalina would face and be put through terrible things, just like all of us. There was no telling what kind of ruin she'd have to face once she was out there on her own. But at least now, as a baby, I could protect her. Tigris buzzed around the room, flying in little circles above Chasm's crib and acting like a mobile. He loved the babies and never left their presence. We'd moved a bunch of plants in here from the greenhouse, so he had all the nectar he could eat and could sing to the babies whenever he felt like. I guess Mali Ludwe were particularly attached to children. It was so sweet. Kalina waved her little hands. Her fingers grasped onto the key dangling off my charm bracelet. She latched onto it, and within her palm, the key began to glow. I gasped. The key had never done that before. I wrenched Kalina's fingers away from the key, and she let out a wail before going silent. The key stopped glowing at her touch. When she reached out to grasp it again, the key emitted that same faint glow. The magic inside of me went off in alarm, emitting a sort of faint hum. Tigris noticed, and he began to sing along with the song of the necklace. I frowned. Strange. The key was definitely reacting to Kalina's presence. Since Professor Calliope had given me that key, I hadn't been able to do a single thing with it, nor sense if it contained any power. It'd been reduced to a simple trinket on my wrist. With Kalina here, however, the key felt powerful and dangerous. Farah had said the key was special. Had she known something about it? I waited for Kalina's eyes to close before I placed her back in her crib. She drifted off. I placed the key against Chasm's skin as an experiment, but it didn't react. Tigris nestled on Kalina's nose and fluttered his wings slowly like a butterfly. Come on, Tigris, I whispered. He gave a tiny mew before following me. I hobbled to my room and took off the charm bracelet, placing it inside a drawer within my jewelry box before I locked it tight. That's where it would stay until I could figure out what was going on with it. Both twins were asleep. I figured I might as well get some lunch while they were down. I took the stairs to the kitchens at a snail's pace. To be honest, Ethan and I took care of the babies more than anyone else. My mother and Lucien helped often, along with Bapkia and Papa, but if it came down to an investment of time, it was my mate and I who were doing the feedings, the changings, and rocking them to sleep at night. Arthur just couldn't help. There was nothing left in him, and how could I blame him for that? He was lost with Alvara. I knew he loved his children, but he couldn't connect with them. And how could he? It would be so hard, since they'd been born in such a traumatic way. There was little I could do to ease his pain. I could barely comfort myself. I cut myself some fruit and warmed up a bowl of chicken broth. I ate both slowly, giving Tigris drops of honey from my finger. It was all I could manage to take down these days. It felt like a feast. I managed to crawl my way back up the stairs. I was planning on returning to the twins, but the harried turning of pages as I passed the library made me cringe. I poked my head in. Arthur's glasses were askew, his hair stuck up one way as he frantically pored over books. His shirt was rumpled, 
I didn't think he'd slept or showered in days. I opened the door and took a gentle seat beside him. Tigris landed on my shoulder to observe. Artie, you need to get some sleep. His one eye twitched. I think I found it, Emma. Found what? He was scaring me. Arthur plopped a book in front of me, one that was illustrated with all kinds of beautiful drawings. Bubka used to read me the story when I was a wee babe, he began. He shuffled through the pages until he came to the middle of the book. Listen to this now. I'm sure you know the story of Ivanam Fowlin and his bony lass, Oriana Fair. I wouldn't know Malovian fairy tales, I said apologetically. Mom hadn't told me any. Ah, right, no matter, Arthur said. Well, in the story, Oriana died young, a very terrible death, and Ivanam was cursed to live without her. I knew where this was going. Artie... But! Avonam couldn't do it, so he made a deal with the gods, Arthur rambled. A life for a life, his in exchange for hers. He went through a ceremony that enabled him to cross over into Edenmire to plead with the gods for her return. And she did return to life through their mating bond. I looked over the pages skeptically. On my shoulder, Tigris purred in appreciation. Artie, this is just a children's story. Legends are nothing more than carefully concealed fact, he spat out. It says right here, six nights after the first moon upon her death, Avonam took Oriana's body and placed it on an offering table beneath the waxing sky. He formed a circle of rose petals and placed out lavender, cedar, mugwort, and an elder branch. He lit all aflame, calling out to the gods to accept his sacrifice and open the way, proclaiming his love for his mate and his desire to give up their bond to restore her to life. The portal was made, and as Evanam stepped on through, an exchange was given, one life for another. Oriana returned to life, and Evanam died in her place. This verges on necromancy, I argued. That's witch magic. It's not something a fae should mess with. You don't understand. Arthur insisted. I've looked into it, and witch magic isn't so much different from ours. Tigris's tail swished as he took in every word, but I blocked out most of Arthur's ranting. He was so far away right now. I have a soul connection with Vara. That wand isn't broken just because she's... not here. I can bring her back, and the gods can take me in her place. Arthur insisted. Our children need her more than me. They need their mother. His eyes were mad behind his glasses. I took a sad breath. Even if the story is true, the time to perform the ceremony has already passed. I said gently, Vara's body has been burned to ash, and one moon cycle has already come and gone since she passed. Only the gods could restore her now. Arthur was silent, and my gut plummeted. You've already tried it, haven't you? I asked. I just didn't perform the ceremony right, he raged. There must have been something I did wrong. I didn't wait for the right moon cycle. I didn't have the body. It wasn't the right time. You've got to stop torturing yourself like this. Vara is gone. My voice cracked on the words, but they were true. Nothing, not magic, gods, or any of us, could make Vara return after she'd already been dead so long. Arthur's lip wobbled. He couldn't control himself any longer. He threw himself against my shoulders and sobbed. I held him, wishing I could tell him that children's stories could bring his beloved back to life. I can't do this, Arthur wept. I don't know how to live without her, Emma. None of us do. I straightened his shoulders and fixed his glasses. But Kalina and Chasm need you. You have to be strong for them. Arthur wiped his nose. I suppose you are right. It's not serving them, carrying on like this. No, but you know what you need? Sleep and a bath, I insisted. It's not going to fix everything, but it's a start. I forced Arthur back into his bedroom, where he promised me he'd clean up and get some rest. I sure hoped so. I didn't want him sneaking off to the library again to torment himself with more false hope. Tigris remained with Arthur, curling up on his pillow to take a nap. A door snapped shut behind me in the hallway. I flinched, but it was only my friends. Delmer, Kiara, and Odette approached me, looking concerned. 
Something's wrong, Delmare said immediately. I can see it on your face. Everything's falling to pieces, I said bitterly. And I just don't have the stomach to face it anymore. What do you mean? Delmare asked. I used to be brave, I spat. I used to rule everything. Now look at me. I'm scared of every shadow that graces my doorstep, terrified to take one step outside and into the light. But that's a choice. You can be confident again, Odette said. You don't understand, I said in frustration. They didn't get it. I used to be such a hard ass about everything because skating had hammered it into me. You fall, you get back up again, no matter how much it hurts. Then, you try again. Yet Droga's return had sucked that right out of me. I'd lost so much that I was worried to lose anything else. Everything felt like it was going away. And that fear of being abandoned and alone at the end of the world was more terrifying than anything I'd experienced. I'd sacrifice who I was to not feel that kind of agony again. Perhaps that was the problem. I'd lost myself, and I didn't know how to get me back. I didn't even know who I was anymore. Delmer conjured a handful of sand. She slipped it into my palm and said, If you clutch tightly onto something and grasp it within your hand, you'll end up losing it. She enclosed my fingers around the pile of sand, and grains dribbled out from within my fingers. But if you merely hold it... She unfurled my fingers and made it so my hand cupped the sand gently. Not a grain slipped out. My voice wobbled. But how can I not hold on so tightly if I'm so scared to lose it? By knowing that it won't leave, Delmere replied. What you chase will run away, Emma. What you allow to exist freely will be drawn to you. A tear slipped out of my eye and ran down my cheek. It hurts to care this much. I just wish I didn't. All I am is a timid mess. Odette shook her head. That's no good. We need to bring Bitch Emma back. Okay. How? I asked weakly. The sand vanished out of my hand as I conjured it away. I could remember what I was like a long time ago, and that Emma felt like a totally different person compared to the spineless woman I'd become today. I'd say anything to anyone, do anything to anybody. I didn't run from a fight or hold back what was on my mind for fear of setting somebody off. I would have rather delivered a punch than turn tail and run. Nowadays, I looked in the mirror and was disgusted with my reflection. All I ever wanted to do was curl up on the couch underneath a blanket and hide. I'd spent days like that here at the estate, not doing anything, just lying in a ball and letting my tears seep into the pillows. Kalina and Kazim were bringing me out of that because you couldn't mope around all day when you had babies to take care of. But the terrible emotions still stayed. It was like I couldn't get rid of them. That wasn't me. I wasn't this depressed girl who couldn't pull herself together most days. I wanted to be Emma again. But maybe that Emma had died when Dolinska fell. That was the scariest thing of all to consider. What you need is a warm cup of tea. Kiara offered. Come on, I brewed a new pot in the parlor room. Tea sounded comforting. I took a seat in the parlor room near the window and sipped at the cup of hibiscus tea that was placed into my hands. The other girls settled into seats around the empty fireplace as I looked out the window, watching the sheep graze below. The estate is so beautiful in the spring, Kiara said with a lovely sigh. We should really make an effort to go outside more often. It nearly reminds me of Arcania University, Delmare said. There are so many halls and rooms here. It's like being back at school again. Kind of. I loved my grandparents' estate, but it couldn't replace my true home. Arcania University was gorgeous. The blossoms should be blooming on the trees in the gardens right about now. Arcania University wasn't all beautiful, Odette protested. It had a few ugly buildings. Do you guys remember that one tower on campus that looked like a giant dick? Do I ever? I'd never had classes up there, but everyone on campus had used the infamous tower as a waypoint since it was such a memorable building. 
I bet you don't remember that tower as much as Odette, Kiara teased, sipping her tea with a smirk on her lips. Ah, uh, the brick dick, Odette said with a dreamy look on her face. Aptly named, Theo and I must have slept on every surface that tower had. You and everyone else on campus, I stated. Ethan and I had never gone up there, but that was because we'd found better places to do the deed. It was a good place to fool around, Delmer admitted. More often than not, the classrooms were usually empty. Yes, I had a rumor your front half was seen hanging out of one of the windows one evening, Odette, Kiara said. Imagine where her back end was. Delmer cracked. I couldn't help it. I snickered. That's nothing, Odette wiggled in her chair. This one time, Theo put it up my butt and... God, Odette! Kiara nearly fell out of her seat laughing. What? It was an experience! Odette protested, putting a hand on her hip. Not one we want to hear about, Kiara argued. I laughed. This felt normal. Like we were college girls back at the university again. God, how I missed those days. Quit acting so virginal, Kiara! I caught you and Alexi in the laundry room the other day, Odette cried. So, I like the way the dryer vibrates, Kiara stated. We all have to dry clothes, you know, Delmer burst. Odette howled. Come on, Mare. You can't tell me you've never put it up there, Odette insisted. We might have, Delmer replied. Pregnancy sex is hard, you know. Sometimes you have to get creative. A lot of positions are a pain in the ass. Literally! Odette cracked, and I snorted. It's not like I mind it, but I don't want it in the ass all the time, Delmer complained. But since my last trimester started, Stefan's paranoid about doing it the other way. Why? I questioned. It's not like you can get knocked up twice. Not currently, anyway. Delmer's lips flattened. He's worried he's going to poke his kid in the head. Oh my gods! Kiara slapped the armrest, tears pouring out of her eyes. I told him he was being a moron and that he's not that big. Delmer replied. He's just being ridiculous. Looks like someone needs to go back to anatomy class, I added. Or get his ego checked, Delmer replied. Odette opened her mouth, but she was silenced when the door opened behind me. It was Babka. Trust my grandmother to walk in when we were having a conversation about butt sex. Gods, had she overheard anything? Meh, it wasn't like she was some pure saint. I bet she and my grandpa had been wild back in the day with her fiery attitude. Maybe she'd like to join in on the conversation and give a few pointers. Your father wishes to see you, Babkia said. It's been some time since you've practiced unseely magic. He feels you should get back on it. But what about Chasm and Kalina? I asked. They're going to wake up soon. Great grandchildren are always a blessing, Babkia said. I will watch over them until your lesson is done. The last thing I wanted to do was practice magic right now. But Lord Lucian was right. I hadn't conjured an unseely spell in weeks and if I was going to improve, it wouldn't happen with me sitting on my ass. Or talking about asses. Okay. I gave a gentle wave to my girlfriends and made a mental note to continue the conversation we were having later. I headed to my bedroom to grab the key before I returned downstairs. Lord Lucien was in his study. It was quite the massive room with enough space to practice magic in. I took the seat across from him, and he said, Glad to see you moving about so well. We can use that energy for today's lesson. Before we start, I began, do you know anything about this? I placed the key before Lord Lucian, and he observed it carefully. It reacts to Kalina's presence, I said. She touched it, and it lit right up. This thing, I can't sense any magical power, Lucian said as he touched the key. Neither could I until Kalina held it. Hmm... Lord Lucian's mouth downturned. Very curious. You must have some suspicions, I insisted. Some, but nothing substantial. Where did you acquire it? Professor Calliope gave it to me. I see. Lucian's lips tightened. 
She has a proclivity for collecting magical items, but this isn't any like I've ever seen. How can it seem unmagical to us, then display its powers when it's near Kalina? I questioned. It means the power within the key is beyond our own magic, Lucian stated. My mouth dropped open. But I'm the world weaver. I'm supposed to be the most powerful sorceress there is. I wasn't really living up to that name at the moment. If this key is any indication, Kalina may have surpassed you, Lucian replied. But how can that be? I insisted. She'd have to have exceptionally magical parents to inherit that kind of power. Arthur's talented, but not stronger than I am, and Varro was. I hitched a breath. Lucian let out a musing sound and said, Vara could be the missing link to this mystery. She didn't appear that strong when she was here with us, I argued. Perhaps it was a ruse, and she was hiding something, Lucian mused. Either way, we cannot ask her now, and I don't believe Arthur has any idea. I bit my lip. If I'm the world weaver, and yet Kalina is stronger than I am, that must mean she's a demigod, yes. If that's true, and we don't know that it is, we're just guessing, people will come for her. They'll want her for her magic. Indeed, and that includes gods as well, Lucian said. Droga will be interested in capturing and raising a demigod child for his own which means news must not get out about what she is. You can't tell anyone about this, Emma, not even Ethan. I nodded. Kalina's safety came first. The fewer who knew about how strong she could be, the better. I will tell Arthur, but in time. I fear he wouldn't be able to handle the news if we were to break it to him now, Lucian said sadly. That Vara kept secrets from him would tear him apart. He's doing horrible, Dad. My heart broke for my twin. It appears the loss is driving him mad. Lucian's eyebrows knitted together. You have to talk to him and bring him to his senses. Today he was raving about some children's book that had a ritual to raise Vara back from the dead, I blurted. This has to stop. I know the tale. Lucian rubbed his eyes. I will speak to him, but it will not deaden his grief. Losing a mate is the most painful loss a shifter can endure. Lucian sat forward. But that is not why we are here. Keep that key safe, Emma. We'll discuss it in time, perhaps when Kalina is a little older. For now, you have to practice on advancing your unsealy skills and we are running out of time before you must perform the ritual to unite the crystals at the secret gathering. If we even get them all, I mumbled. Ethan will find the unsealy stone. Have some faith in your meat, Lucian replied. For now, your entire focus needs to be on your recovery and pushing your powers to their greatest potential. Am I even strong enough to try? I was worried about setting myself back and spending the next few days in bed. Unsealy magic will not drain you as silly magic does, as you must pull it from a source here on Earth, in not in Edenmire, Lucian replied. That source can be anything, even something inside yourself that you wish to draw out. There were a lot of things inside of me that I wanted to get rid of. But I don't believe I can anymore, I said. If I don't believe, the magic won't come, right? Emma... If this is all I've taught you about magic, I apologize, Lucian stated. At its core, illusion magic, that is to say, silly magic, must be done with belief, but unsilly magic doesn't. It works on its own whether you believe in it or not. I don't understand. I'm not explaining it correctly. I am a poor teacher. Don't say that. You were the best. I insisted, reaching out to grab his hand. I've never had a better teacher than you. Well, you always were my favorite student, but that's a bit biased to say, considering you're my daughter. He squeezed my hand back. You never lost faith in me, I continued. Just teach me how to regain faith in myself so I can do this. 
I know what happened with Draga was a great wound to you, but we lost the battle, not the war, Lucian said firmly. We must press onward. You can't lose hope before the end has even arrived, Emma. You must push through until it is certain all is lost. I hadn't been doing that lately. I'd given up and been preparing to lose since Dolinska had fallen. That wasn't right. There were still Fey out there who hadn't given in. I couldn't either. Okay. So, what's the difference between Seelie belief and Unseelie magic? Unseelie magic is a much more difficult craft to master because it works primarily with the powers of fate, Lucian instructed. You see, this kind of magic relies on the will of the gods to work and the will of time. We all have choices over our destiny and our lives, but at the same time, our destiny is designed for us and we cannot diverge from the path that we've been chosen to take. How can both be true at the same time? I questioned. Arthur had said something similar and I still didn't get it. Imagine life like a winding road heading toward one destination, Lucian said. The path splits into many side streets and you can take any road you like to get there, but in the end, you will always end up in the same place. You cannot avoid fate, for it will always come to pass, even though the way it may take place can change. So, in that sense, I sat back amused on it. Ethan used his woven tooth to cast the unseely magic that killed Elijah. If it wasn't the will of the gods that Elijah die that day, the spell wouldn't have worked. Ethan's will was aligned with the will of the gods and the will of fate. Exactly, Lucian nodded. You've got the idea. But Droga is a god, and his will is different from the will of the other gods. He wants to rule over everything, I pointed out. Doesn't this contradict the idea that unseely magic comes from fate? The gods are eternal beings outside of the control and laws of nature, Lucian replied. Only they can choose to rewrite fate as it has been decided. Droga is not the only god who gets an opinion. So, seely magic relies on belief, whereas unseely magic comes from trusting fate. Of course, you don't need to believe for unseely magic to turn out like it should, like you do with seely magic. Seely magic relies on your own will, on having faith in yourself. Unseely magic is its own power, because unseely magic works with what is meant to be, not with what you create within. Thus, it is the power of destiny and fate. You cannot avoid it. You can only follow the path the magic chooses to craft for itself. In order to perform it, you must put aside your own will and accept the fate that has been chosen for you. Does that mean I'll potentially succeed, no matter what happens? I asked hopefully. I believe you will succeed, Emma, though in what way I can be unsure, Lucian replied. And there can be no guarantees on the outcome of what that victory will cost us. I understood what he was getting at. I could win, but that victory could turn out a hundred different ways. My friends could all end up dead at the end of it. I could banish Droga, but by then, the Fae could be wiped out. And, as I was reminded, I was destined to die. If the gods had decided that was the path for me to walk, I wouldn't be able to avoid it. Not if what Lucian said was true. Can you tell me more about the distinctions between Seelie and Unseelie magic? In the past, the Fae were divided into different seasonal courts, the Seelie court being spring and summer, and the unseelie court being fall and winter, Lucian explained. This is an important distinction, because spring and summer are times of action. They are the seasons where preparation and activity is held. In the fall and winter, the expectation is to rest and wait. Seelie magic requires a lot of personal energy, while unseelie magic requires trust and patience. <laughs> Those aren't my strong suits. And yet you're still accomplished at unseely magic, Lucian stated. They have different uses for different times. Our lives change like the seasons. What we need in one time isn't always what we need in another. I nodded. Okay, so what are we working on today? You know you can pull unseely magic from objects, Lucian replied. 
You also know you can pull unseelie magic from yourself if it becomes too dire, although this results in dire consequences. Yes, the Dark Necklace nearly killed me when I harnessed its energy during the King's Contest. There is another way, Lucian said. You can take certain dark qualities inside of yourself and use it to channel your unseelie magic. Like? I sat back and crossed my arms. Certainly, there must be something inside of you that you're looking to get rid of. Gods was there. All the pain, all the suffering. If I could get rid of it by transforming it into power, I was all for it. There's a ritual where you can channel your emotions into salt, I said. Babka taught me. I hadn't been doing it lately because... Why hadn't I been doing it lately? It was like I'd forgotten all my teachings in the midst of my depression as if I thought they wouldn't work to make me feel better, even though I knew they would. It wasn't laziness. It was depression. I was in such a dark hole I couldn't harness the energy to do things I knew would make me feel better. Somehow, I had to find that strength again. The salt spell is useful for getting rid of energy you don't wish to carry and are overwhelmed by, but this method is more powerful because it enables you to convert those dark feelings into magic, Lucian described. I will give you an example. After your mother left for America, I used my grief over her absence and converted it into power. Using this method, I was able to pull off incredible feats of unseen magic. But isn't that just ignoring your pain? I questioned. Emotions and feelings are important, Emma, and we shouldn't ignore them. But what we need to ask ourselves is if our emotions are helping us or getting in our way. And if it's the secondary option, then we need to do something about them. Because if we stay down for too long, we will convince ourselves that what we're trying to do is impossible. Once that happens, we give up. Lucian gave me a wry look. You aren't the kind of person who submits. I don't wish to see you lose yourself. Ugh, he knew me so well. I'm afraid it's already happened. I was tired of analyzing my feelings and trying to get to the root of all my problems. There came a time when talking about your inner demons just led you around in circles, and believe me, I was there. I was sick. I was always going to be. I had a hard destiny, and I was trying to accomplish some entirely impossible things. I knew I had the capability to do them, but I was denying myself the chance, because I was tired and scared. When do you think this shift happened? Lucian asked. I don't know. I shrugged. Somehow, along the way, I convinced myself that what I wanted just wasn't worth fighting for anymore. And I don't think it was a conscious decision, either. I think that life wore me down over time, and I forgot about what was important. Have you considered listing off everything you're thankful for? Gratitude doesn't work, I said in frustration. I hate listing off everything I'm grateful for. It feels like a chore. And why is that? I don't know. I threw up my hands. Because I'm an ungrateful bitch, I guess? Lucian shook his head. That doesn't work. Go deeper. I sighed. I had no idea, really, but as I considered the idea, it came to me. Because I don't think I deserve it in the first place, I mumbled. Explain. I mused on the idea. I mean, it's hard to feel grateful for everything I have, because I feel obligated to be thankful. But on the inside, all I feel is guilty, like I shouldn't have those things in the first place. Maybe other people do, but I don't. So sitting here and trying to be grateful for what I have just leads to guilt. Because I have something other people don't, and I didn't do anything to earn the things I have or the people I love. I'd do anything to avoid blaming myself. But I do every time I sit here and try to be appreciative of what I have. Because I'm just reminded of all the mistakes I've made. And that there are other people out there who are suffering when I'm the one who should be experiencing that pain. I condemned all those people in Dolinska. I made the mistake. They didn't. 
They should have a home and be safe. Not me. This doesn't sound like it's a recent development. It's not. I nearly had to turn away from Lucien as I admitted the truth. I would have put off marrying Ethan if I could, to tell you the truth. But I had to go through with it, because we were royals and it was expected of us. I've never heard you admit anything like this before, Lucien said in shock. Do you doubt how you feel about your mate? No, it has nothing to do with him. Then why consider moving the wedding? He questioned. Why would that ever cross your mind? Because I don't think that I deserve to be his wife, or that I deserve his love, I admitted. And if I didn't then, I definitely don't now, after everything I've done. And secretly, inside, I feel like one day he's going to wise up and realize just how much of a shitty person I am and end up hating me. Ethan would be pained to hear this. Why do you think I don't tell him? I put my feet up on the side of the chair and wrapped my arms around my legs. Ice skating was different. There were days my feet bled because I refused to get off the ice. By the time that gold medal was placed around my neck, I knew I earned it, you know? I could feel appreciative because I'd already sacrificed so much, and I knew people couldn't take it from me because of what I'd given up. Life isn't the competition, Emma. Especially not the competition to see who can sacrifice the most. I know, but it feels like it is. I didn't know if anyone else on Earth felt this way. It was a weird way to think. I felt so alone. If you feel like you belong in the gutter, nothing anyone does or sees is going to convince you otherwise, Lucien said. And your accomplishments won't fill the hole either. It'll just feed the void within. Didn't I know it? I'd owned a castle and had a crown on my head, and I'd still felt completely unworthy of it at the time. Maybe that's why I'd lost it. That feeling had only festered and gotten worse since we'd been kicked off the throne for the second time. Lucian sighed. This is a regret I battle with, not being there when you were a child. I might have been able to teach you things as a child that could have fostered your self-worth early on. Correcting things as an adult is much harder. I know you probably don't want to hear this, but Mom didn't exactly make that easy. I mumbled. She was always expecting more of me. She put pressure on me to be her entire perfect world. To be honest, she kind of made it worse. Lucian gave a soft chuckle and nodded. Ivana is who she is. Fuck yeah, she is. I huffed and let a leg hang off the chair. So how do I fix this mess? How do I find myself worthy again when I feel so unworthy? You must make the decision that you are worthy. Act as if you believe that you deserve what you desire, even if you feel you do not, Lucian replied. And eventually... Is you modify your thoughts, control your mind, and have discipline over your actions, your mindset will follow. There's no magic phrase or key I could give you that will convince you of your worth, Emma. It must be slowly built upon over time in your own mind. You are my daughter. Your mere existence is all the worth you will ever need in my eyes. Yet you must convince yourself of that. It could be a lifelong process. You need to accept that. I nodded slowly. I got it. Sometimes you just couldn't get rid of what was wrong with you. If I had a bunch of broken parts to work with, then God damn it, I was going to put them back together and use them somehow. Because staying in the same place and hoping I'd magically get better when the gods decided it was time wasn't working. There was a knock at the door. Ethan poked his head in. The perimeter around the estate is clear, Ethan said. No sign of any enemies, as far as Stefan and I could tell. Excellent, Lucian replied. Come, sit with us. I was just about to instruct Emma in some unseen magic, which I think you'll find useful as well. Ethan moved to the seat beside mine. Lucian didn't go to tell Ethan all the shit I'd just vomited out. I was grateful for that. As we know... Unseelie magic is harnessing energy from other sources, 
Lucian began. Emma, think of an emotion, preferably a dark emotion, that you have which you wish to yield power from. That was easy. I was sad. I was grieving for Vara, grieving for the loss of my mobility due to my advancing illness, and grieving for the loss of the city I loved. I wanted to release some of it. I've got it. What do I do with it? Sit with it. Hold it in your chest and see how it feels, Lucian said. Then, like you draw energy from a crystal, imagine redirecting that energy toward a purpose, a spell, any unseelie spell. The energy, depending on how powerful the emotion is, will funnel into the magic and cast it naturally without any effort from you. Sitting with the feeling was the hardest part. When I considered how miserable I was, actually acknowledged it instead of trying to ignore it, it made me want to cry. But then I thought of how I could change that. What kind of spell could sadness make? I'd used my sadness as a kind of shield lately, trying to keep everyone out. Maybe I could change it to be something beneficial instead of something harmful. I opened my hand and a spell bloomed outward from it. It had a blue tone to it and shimmered like diamonds. The spell expanded outward, wrapping around the three of us like cellophane until it faded beyond what the eye could see. That was magic I could do when I was still sick because it didn't take any energy from my body. Hope started to grow in the pit of my stomach, and the sadness I'd felt when getting up this morning felt significantly less. Very good, Emma, Lucian praised as I ended the spell. This is a very strong protection spell. It should last for days. Days? Wow. I raised my eyebrows. Seely shields only lasted a matter of moments, minutes, if you continue to sustain them. I wasn't putting any energy toward the spell at all, and yet I still felt the shield's defenses hold strongly around me. Lucian turned toward my mate. Ethan, what's an uncomfortable feeling you have that you could channel? Rage, he growled. Okay. Guess things weren't hunky-dory with my husband either. We waited a few moments before Ethan's eyes flashed violet and he cast his hand out. A fizzing sort of firecracker flung out of his hand. It bounced around the room, burning papers and causing books to fly off the shelves. Cinders began to burn into the carpet as they flew off the spinning explosive, and I wondered when it would erupt. I'd thought he'd put it out, but Ethan just let it simmer, allowing the firecracker to grow larger and more inflamed. I had to duck as it soared over my head, burning off the edges of my hair. Lucian floundered out of his seat. He staggered toward the window, which he unlatched and pushed open. Ethan, you need to control it before it backfires and hurts Emma, Lucian said sternly. Direct the spill out the window. Ethan seemed to wake up. He sent the firecracker ricocheting out the window. The spell soared upward and exploded outside like a mortar, setting off fireworks above the estate. What the hell was that? I heard Stefan shout somewhere outside. The chickens in the barnyard were going nuts. Impressive, if yet untamed, Lucien said. Remember that if you do not control unsealy magic, it will control you. Unsealy magic isn't evil, but it is dark, and dark magic can have dire consequences if it's wielded in an irresponsible way. I understand. I apologize, Ethan said stiffly. I was still staring at his eyes. What? Ethan asked. I don't know why your eyes do that. Flash Violet whenever you cast a spell, I said. I forget that happens sometimes, Ethan said with a shrug. It's of no consequence to me. I've noticed it before, but I figured I was seeing things, Lucian said, sounding like he'd seen a marvel. This is very unexpected. Do you have answers? I asked, sitting forward. Only speculation, Lucian said. It's rare unsealing knowledge. I doubt most know of it. Tell us, I said. Fringe stuff always came in useful to us, it seemed. There were certain unsealing long ago who could channel exceptional dark magic, Lucian explained. Powers beyond what any other normal unsealing could do. This was long before we left Edenmire. 
Whenever these talented Uncini performed magic of any kind, their eyes would flash violet. These exceptional dark fae became the monarchs the Uncini needed. Ethan, I believe you must be descended from this line, and perhaps are the first to wield this kind of dark royal magic in centuries. This directly connects to the research I was compiling on the Hidden King during Elijah's short rule. I abandoned it after his death, since I no longer considered it important to winning the war. But it has become relevant now. What about it? Ethan leaned back against Lucian's desk. We know the Black Claw proclaims the Hidden King to be their leader, but the cult was originally begun as an activist group to obtain unsilly rights. Lucian said. Within that lore is the tale of the Hidden King. You see, a Hidden King can only come from the line of the first original Unsili King, who ruled hundreds of years ago. This must be a bloodline that Ethan and Elijah both share. It makes sense. Elijah was the Hidden King. Our shared bloodline through our mothers must trace back to the Unsili Kings of old. Ethan replied. Lady Corva must have known about this. It's why Elijah knew he was the Hidden King. His mother must have told him the history, I said. But why is he called Hidden? Because, as you'll recall, the Sili and Unsili were often at war. The Unsili monarchs were often hidden away or on the run to avoid being killed or conquered by Sili forces. That is where the name comes from, Lucian said. An unsilly king never makes their identity known for the safety of his court and his people. He makes moves and gives commands from the shadows. Oftentimes, these kings were even unknown to their own people. The only ones who knew of the hidden king's identity were his own inner circle, from which he used to rule and make his decrees. Therefore, if they are to be true leaders of the unsilly, these hidden kings must remain out of sight and unproclaimed. That's how the royal magic paces down, from one unseen monarch to another. Fey wordplay means everything, because our intention becomes our illusion magic. Proclaiming yourself to be the hidden king would remove any inheritance of royal dark magic, even if you obtained it from your bloodline. Got it. I nodded. Perhaps that is why Elijah died in the end. He rejected the title, his right to rule over the Unseelie, and the dark magic entitled to him by proclaiming himself to be the Hidden King. He was supposed to remain concealed. Ethan theorized. I believe you are right, Lucian said. What about his daughter? I asked. Could Senya have inherited Elijah's powers and this royal dark magic she's descended from? Possibly, Lucian said. Like that child needs more power. Ethan grumbled. Quite correct. Sina will already become a powerful sorceress because of her mother. She won't need any help in that area, Lucian said, waving his hand. It would seem my cousin's dire need to be praised and revered resulted in his downfall, Ethan mused. Unfortunately. But we all have weak points we need to consider, Lucian said. Make sure the two of you know yours before others learn to exploit them. Ethan and I practiced unseelie magic under Lucian's guidance until we took a break for the evening. Babka asked me to bring my brother to the dining room as he hadn't eaten all day, or anything the previous day either. Arthur, come down to dinner. I knocked on the door to his bedroom before cautiously opening it. I let out a soft scream that was muffled by my hand as I saw what was inside. It was Vara. She looked as beautiful and as healthy as ever, perfectly strong, her features delicate and absolutely breathtaking. My chest tightened as I hovered on the verge of tears, happy to see that my friend was alive and well, but she looked a little too beautiful. Her perfections were off-putting. I realized this wasn't truly Vara, but how she appeared to someone else. Her form rippled, and I knew... She was an illusion. This wasn't real. I looked around the room for who was casting the spell. Arthur was sitting in a chair, tears pouring down his face as he reached out a hand to touch the gorgeous illusion, which did not become solid. His fingers brushed through Vara's form like she was a ghost. 
I stormed through the illusion and it vanished into smoke. Arthur, what the hell are you doing? I yelped. This isn't healthy. It's the only way I'll be able to see her again, Arthur blurted, leaping up from his seat and angrily kicking his chair back. Artie, this kind of magic is forbidden, I shouted. We're not supposed to make illusions of dead people. It's against fey law. I don't give a damn about the law, Arthur snarled. There's a reason. We can't bring back the dead, and you're torturing yourself like this by making yourself see illusions of her that aren't there. She can't talk back to you, Artie. She can't touch you, can't even look at you. But I can look at her, he demanded. It's all I long for, sis. And what happens when your illusions of Vara start to take over your mind? What happens when you've completely lost it because you can't stand to be without her? I pressed. I'm already there, Arthur snapped. You think this will make me crazy? I died with her, Emma. The only difference is my body's still walking around. In my soul and in my heart, I was done for the day we buried her. You might as well let me go too, for I have no desire to remain in this world any longer. Arthur stomped past me. I was standing in the same spot the illusion had been with a lump in my throat. Lucian was right. This grief was driving my brother mad. I wasn't so sure we hadn't lost him for good. Chapter 7 Ethan There was the sound of arguing coming from the kitchen when I came back from my usual perimeter sweep around the estate one April morning. I'd become somewhat obsessive over scouting the area daily since Vera had passed, Paranoid, perhaps, would be a better word. We couldn't afford to be discovered here, and if we were, I wanted us to know about it before Droga could launch any surprise attacks. Things had been quiet. Seemed they were no longer. The voices increased in intensity as I strode down the hallway. I caught a glimpse through an open door. Arthur was arguing with Finlay, seemingly in a fit. Emma stood between them, trying to calm them down, while her grandfather loomed off at a distance, leaning over his cane and suckling at his pipe. Well, he didn't seem too disturbed, so it couldn't be that bad. But nothing rattled the old shifter besides. The estate could come crumbling down around his ears, and Vocek Ignacy would consider it any other Tuesday. He wasn't a good gauge for determining a crisis. "'What's going on?' I asked as I entered the kitchen, preferring to get straight to the point. Emma had told me her brother was conjuring illusions of his lost mate— I hoped they weren't arguing about that again. I knew what Arthur was doing would only make his pain worse, but I didn't want my wife getting involved. Fixing Arthur's devastation could not be done. She needed to allow him to do whatever he needed to, to recover from his loss. However, it seemed they were fighting over another issue entirely. My mansion in Edenmire was raided, Arthur groaned. The books were burned, and the place was completely overturned. What? I asked. Arthur had his own hearthfire, a personal home within Edmire that he'd crafted with his illusion magic, but we'd considered it completely untouchable. No one but us knew it was there. I meditated there this morning to look for documents I'd stored there, Arthur explained, and the place has been completely sacked. Calm down. It's not the end of the world, Finlay insisted. I was with Arthur. This wasn't a good situation. Like hell, I found hoofprints. In that rank smell that always comes with carcans, Arthur seethed. I was up all night running across Edmire, tracing their steps and trying to catch them. Gods, if I had caught up, I'd have torn them apart for what they did to Vera. And, I pressed, the trail went cold, abruptly. Droga must have summoned them back, Arthur spat. How could they even go there? I asked. The portal to Edmire was becoming narrower every day. It was more difficult each time to transport ourselves there, even with Emma's magic. Droga's a god, and therefore has the power to transport whoever he wishes back and forth between Earth and Edenmire, whether the portal is open or not, Vocek said. What about Emma's cottage? Panic was mounting within me. We kept the crystals of harmony there. They didn't find it. All the stones are still there, Emma said breathlessly. We just checked. But they could find it. I insisted. The cottage is compromised. We can't continue to keep the crystals there any longer. My magic protects the crystals. There's a ward on the door guarding the crystals of harmony. No one can get in there but us. 
They should stay put, Emma insisted. Emma, your powers are great, but we've seen before that your hearthfire can be attacked and vandalized, and when that happens, you become vulnerable, I said. What if they ransack your cottage and your wards protecting the crystals fail because you're not strong enough to keep them up? I, Arthur said dully, I haven't been able to cast a decent spell since I got back. And tearing apart my mansion did my powers in for a day or two. But where are we going to put them? Emma put a hand in her hair. She was stressed. We have to bring them here, I insisted, at least for the time being. Ethan, that's so risky, Emma bit her lip. We don't have a choice. The estate is the safest place to keep them, for now, I said. Droga hasn't yet discovered us here. It's a reasonable assumption that the stones will be safe at the mansion, so long as we are. There's an armory downstairs, Bocek said. It's bolted, and has wards around it, preventing anyone outside the house from opening the vault. Even if Droga's minions did manage to overtake this estate, they'd have a hell of a time trying to get through the wards to three different fey and into that armory. Then let's go get them, Emma stated. I'll summon the girls, and I'll make us a portal. We'll transport the stones here immediately. Relief eased the tightness in my chest. It felt better to have the stones nearby, in a place we could keep an eye on them. We couldn't be in Edenmire at all times. We couldn't even go there to check every day. It was draining on our magic. This way, at least we'd know for certain where the stones were at all times. I didn't feel at ease until all five of the crystals that we had were safely locked behind the armory's thick door. I knew we'd made the right decision to bring them here. It was the only decision we could make, after all. Emma put an additional ward on the armory door, just to be extra careful. I wasn't the only one around here who was paranoid. Finlay approached me once the others were gone and the vault was shut. We must speak. I've tried talking sense into Arthur, but he won't listen. Perhaps you will. What are you going on about? I couldn't imagine what harebrained idea Finlay had gotten into his head now. Pruska is currently defenseless, he babbled. When Gabby took it, she filled it with black claw enforcers, but a significant number of them have been moved from the city and into the area protecting her palace. Pruska's forces are only a fourth of what they were. If we took everyone and put up a good fight, we could take it easily. We'd lost Pruska when Gabby had attacked it last year. The entire town had ended up in shambles, and the lives lost during the battle had been numerous. It had been a heavy blow to our war effort as king and queen, and had started our downfall until we'd lost the crown completely. Now it was practically open for the taking. Why would Gabby leave such a stronghold to defend itself? How do you even know? I asked. Oh, I've been taking portals back to Malovia to check, surveying the country here and there, trying to determine Droga's weak spots. I forced my arms to remain at my side, because if I didn't, I'd wrap my hands around his neck. You leaving the estate on a consistent basis is going to lure them straight here. You don't win wars without intelligence, Finlay threw back at me. Yes, and it would seem you don't have any. Finlay gave a short breath. I know my past actions have been a bit careless. They're dangerous, but this needs to be done. Emma's still weak. While she's recovering, we need to be utilizing situations as best we can. Gaining Pruska back is more important than uniting the Crystals of Harmony. There's nothing more important than uniting the Crystals of Harmony. You know that, I said flatly. Yes, but that isn't working. We've hit a dead end, Finlay insisted. We must try another way. This is our chance. We can liberate the city. And do what? Fill it with refugees, Finlay burst. There are fey outside Dolinska's borders, waiting for a chance to revolt and raise the flag against Droga. Pruska could become our stronghold. Even if we managed to conquer the city, Droga would flatten it once we took it, like he did with Dolinska, I insisted. Think with your head instead of with your prick. You don't understand. Pruska can be seen as a beacon. This is our chance to restore hope, Finlay said. Or get ourselves killed. I replied. The answer is no. Perhaps there will be a time to utilize Pruska, but it is not now. There won't be a better time, Finlay rattled. The city is exposed now. Then go liberate it yourself, I said sarcastically. None of us will be there to help you. Finlay swore under his breath and left me there. I shifted immediately and headed outside to get a good run in. 
I needed to cool off before associating with anyone else. If Droga didn't wring Finlay's neck one day, I would. I was pouring sweat when I got back from my run. My fur felt suffocating, so I shifted back and went upstairs to our bedroom to take a shower. Emma comes to join Ethan in the shower. Intimacy has been difficult for them, as Emma has been too sick and Ethan has been too worried for them to enjoy each other's company. But Emma wants to reconnect with Ethan, so they share a private moment within the shower. I was in a good mood for the first time in ages when Emma and I joined the others for supper that evening. Not everyone was there. Emma's grandparents, as well as her parents, were notably missing. Where is everyone? I asked. Gone into town, Stefan said. They'll be back later. Ozzy raced around the room with a side dish in his hands, giggling as he was chased by Jasper. He'd made shepherd's pie alongside beef wellington, and both smelled amazing. I had consumed a full plate when Amantha came hustling through the door, followed by Arthur and Kiara. All three of them appeared frantic. Ethan, Amantha said. Finn's gone. Gone? What do you mean, gone? My eyes narrowed. He went to Pruska. Amantha all but wailed. The cheerful demeanor in the room immediately became ice cold. The stupid bastard. He'd taken my offhand comment about liberating it himself seriously. What exactly happened? What do you think? He went in like some kind of hero, put on a good show for a moment or two, and then they captured him, Arthur said spitefully. Damn Finlay. I should have beaten the revolutionary out of him when I had the chance. Did he go alone? He took a few fey from Trua Glean he was able to inspire with talks of revolt, but they're all dead now. Arthur told me. Kiara opened a portal for us to go check. Yes, and it seems Finlay was the only one left alive. We watched him be dragged into Pruska's prison before we were nearly discovered and had to portal back here, Kiara said sourly. He's certainly being interrogated as we speak. If they get anything out of him, we're all fucked. We have to go get him, I said. Finn won't expose us. He'd rather die. Emma objected. I won't take that chance. Theo, Stefan, Alexi, you're with me. The rest of you need to get ready to move if we need to. Move where? There's nowhere else to go, Odette whined. Which is exactly why I'm going to rip Finlay limb from limb once we find him, I replied. I'll be lucky if we find any pieces, Stefan grumbled. Be careful, won't you? Emma begged as Theo opened up a portal. We'll be there and back before you know it, I stated. I gave her a kiss and no other goodbye as the four of us stepped on through. I was glad the others hadn't asked to come along. Nobody else needed to risk themselves for Finlay's neck, and the less people we were putting on the line, the better. Theo had teleported us to the battlefield outside Pruska. I knew it well, though the remnants of the fight had been cleaned up long ago, leaving nothing but an empty field. My stomach clenched. I had hoped to never come back here. The city's lights were on the horizon. All was quiet. There weren't any sounds of an uprising. They must have put Finlay and his renegades down quickly. Come on, Stefan whispered. We headed into the trees and remained there as we approached Pruska's walls. We cast spells over ourselves to disguise our scents and muffle the noises we made as we drew near. The walls surrounding the town were tall and foreboding. We had to fly over them to get into the city. Stefan was too big to go flying in unnoticed, so Theo had to give him a lift. When we landed on the other side of the wall, the rest of us remained in our shifter forms while Stefan peered around a corner. Shit, he muttered. They really massacred them. What do you see? I asked. Ten bodies. Finlay was mad if he thought he could take back the city with so few people. I agree. Most of the enforcers are gone, but there are at least two dozen or more remaining inside by my estimates. Alexei said. He was counting on us bringing Emma along with Kiara and a few of the other talented Fae. Like I'd ever consent to such a ridiculous idea. Alexei, you've surveyed Pruska. Where is the prison? Theo asked. Alexei had learned the city well while trying to seize it back from Gabby during his time in the army. I hoped he had an idea of where Finlay might be. Not far. Stick to the walls and follow me, he said. We tried to keep pace with Alexei. As we bounded into an open square, an alarm instantly went off, screaming throughout the square. Intruder alert! An oppressor cried. 
Ten black claw enforcers rushed into the square, wearing their skull masks and covered in long black robes. They had spells in their hands, and they intended to use them to kill. The sight of those hated masks caused some sort of monster to take over me. A haze of red came over my eyes as I saw nothing but blood. Things rushed into a blur of colors, pain, death, and destruction. I charged forward with a snarl. I barely resonated with the sight of Theo impaling one oppressor with his horn and Alexei tearing apart another with his talons as I ran by them both. I remembered Lucian's lesson from the other day. All I felt was fury and a need for revenge as I channeled the dark emotions inside of me and allowed them to come bursting out in a fit of rage. The two cultists standing closest to me exploded outward, massive holes bursting forth in the middle of their torsos as they sank to the ground and died. I paid no attention to their demises and focused my attention at sinking my claws into the next oppressor who dared to get close to me. Time passed. I wasn't sure how much, but I was gone for myself then. All I knew, all I felt, was the beast inside. Ethan, back off, bud. They're dead. Stefan's voice cleared the fog in my head as I came to. The red haze ended and the bloodlust faded into static in my ears. I realized I stood in a mess of bodies, blood pouring down my muzzle with my paws mushed in a collection of fluid and gore. My friends were staring at me as if I'd gone mad. I'd been mutilating the bodies long after I'd destroyed the oppressors and hadn't realized. I backed out of the pile and shook out my fur. The alarm that had gone off was silent, as whoever had cast the spell was now dead. We did these ones in, but there will be others, either in the city or on their way. Theo twitched his ears, then lifted his head to sniff the wind. There are still oppressors lurking here. They're going to discover the bodies sooner rather than later. We must hurry. Tool right. Since Finlay launched an attack, Gabby will send her troops back here now, Alexei stated. What if it's another trap she set to lure us in? Stefan worried. She doesn't believe we're that stupid, but apparently she was wrong. I growled. She'd get a great kick out of this once she heard the news. The only way to irk her would be to remain sure that Finlay escaped. We abandoned caution and broke into a run. Theo helped Stefan onto his back, then galloped ahead of us, while Alexei and I kept pace beside each other. It's here, Alexei cried out, as we drew near to a massive stone structure at the northeast corner of town. He skidded to a stop beside the door and burst it open. There were two oppressors standing guard, but Theo stabbed one, and Stefan took care of the other before either of the two had the time to cast a spell. I tried to use my telepathic abilities to reach out to Finlay, but he didn't respond. The other woven should have been able to hear me clearly. His mind remained elusive and silent to me, which meant someone else was occupying it. I put my nose to the ground, attempting to locate Finlay's scent. Once I got it, I rushed along the hallway and my companions followed. We came to an isolated doorway at the end of the hall where Finlay's scent became overpowering. Stefan smashed it in. We stormed through. Finlay was shackled to a chair and his form was utterly still. A griffin shifter stood before him, his hand placed over Finlay's forehead as his eyes moved back and forth like he was looking for something. The griffin was performing some kind of empathy magic on him. Finlay's form began to shake, his lips slightly moved like he was about to crack. I lunged forward. The griffin gasped as I knocked him to the ground, but I silenced him forever with a bite to the throat before he could utter a cry for help. I transformed and turned around to face our ally, if I could even call him that anymore. Finlay looked like shit. Both of his eyes were blackened, and his face was swollen with bruises. Blood ran from the corner of his mouth. I noticed two fingers on his left hand were missing, cut off at the base. Stefan reached down and yanked off the shackles binding Finlay's ankles and wrists. He almost fell out of the chair, and would have if Alexei hadn't caught him. Could have done it myself, Finlay slurred, kicking at the loose chains. Then why didn't you? Alexei replied coolly. Finlay's head lolled on his shoulders. He'd been drugged as well as tortured. So much for his pride. What in the name of the gods were you thinking? I snapped. Did you expose our position? They didn't get anything out of me, Finlay protested. I'm made of stronger stuff. They almost did, Alexei stated calmly. Griffin empathy magic is difficult to resist, much stronger than mere physical pain. That shifter would have had you begging for mercy by the time he got done clawing around in your head, and then they would have had us. Finlay mumbled something indistinct under his breath, which all but admitted his guilt. Stand up, I wrenched him to his feet. 
We have no time to linger here. Finlay shoved me off. Do not dare to give me orders. You are no longer my king. Am I not? I whirled on him. Thank your gods that I no longer sit on the throne, because if I did, your head would be severed from your shoulders for your selfish actions. If Emma or any of our friends had suffered for this, I would have never forgiven you. Gods curse you to the underworld for it. You'd have us sit and do nothing while Droga claims the whole world, Finlay growled. Sometimes the greater courage is to sit and wait for a better opportunity, I seethed through my teeth. Finlay scoffed and spat out a globule of blood. You'd have us wait until kingdom come. We can argue about this later, Theo insisted. We must go now. Theo snapped his fingers, trying to make a portal. His expression became alarmed as nothing happened. Where's the portal? Stefan demanded. Can't conjure one, Theo said. There must be a ward around the city preventing them. Then we have to get outside Pruska's walls. Come on. I turned toward the door. He'll need a ride. This fucker can barely walk, Stefan said as he held Finlay up. Throw him on my back. Alexei had already changed. Stefan slung Finlay onto his back, and we proceeded out of the torture room and back into the hallway without another word out of him. We got out of the prison undisturbed, but I could hear the faint echo of footsteps on the street ahead. The light off a torch caused me to throw my arm out, so the others held back. We remained concealed in an alleyway as two enforcers walked by. The darkness concealed us. Even so, we were barely twelve feet away. If the enforcers turned around, we'd certainly be caught. The gods blessed us this night, because the oppressors kept their eyes forward. Do you think we'll get anything out of the prisoner? One asked. We always do. Ampathy magic is ruthless, the other responded. How's it work? He just opens up your mind and rambles around in there until he finds what he wants. The other guard replied. Didn't know griffins can read minds. It's more like emotions, hearsay. He'll root around until he finds what makes you anxious and press on it. You'll worry yourself to death until you tell him what he wants to know. Nothing but fear and an endless panic attack until you're mush. Sounds like a nightmare. Or the unlucky fuck in there, maybe. I would have felt sorry for Finlay if I wasn't so angry at him. The oppressors marched on ahead, and one said, The alarm went off. I heard it. Someone's here. They have to be. It has to be another attack, like the one they had this afternoon. Could be true. Maybe they're coming in waves to wear us down, instead of all at once. Oh, shit. You think we'll run into them? Gods, I hope not. Let's stick to our side of the perimeter. Pray they don't come our way. We can't get in trouble so long as we don't leave our post. We will get in trouble if they get away. Let the others handle it. Our only assignment is to guard the prison. And that shithead's not getting out of there alive. There was a bout of silence before the nervous oppressor added, There's a rumor going around. You and your rumors. It must be true this time, the other insisted. There's mention of a reward, a grand one, if a fay leads the dark god to a lost city. He's promising anything. Magic, positions of power, money, if someone can take him to it. We all paused. A lost city? What interest would that be to Droga? The other asked scathingly. Sounds like something a chambermaid made up to get some attention. This is more than just a bit of gossip. It comes directly from Droga's inner circle, the oppressor argued. I'm sweet on a maid who serves the queen at the palace, and she overheard. Oh, gods, I knew it came from a chambermaid. It must be important. My sweetheart says Droga's refusing to raise Queen Gabriella to godhood until this city is found. Gabby must be displeasing Droga in her effort to get him the crystals. I tried to listen closer, but even with my advanced shifter hearing, the oppressors were getting farther away. Can you imagine if we found the city? We'd be rich, the oppressor said in a giddy tone. No more patrol duty. No more cleaning the barracks. Hell, Droga might even make us lords. Your fantasies are running away with you again. I'm telling you, this is our chance at greatness. We should bargain with our commander for some time off so we can go looking for it ourselves and get the reward. Droga is a god. He knows everything and has lived for centuries. Why wouldn't he know where to find a lost city? Why would he even care? The other replied, irritated. Well, maybe there's something he wants there. Get these rumors out of your head, rookie. You're an oppressor. 
Your job is to serve Droga with a smile on your face and no questions asked, understand? No one's going to make your dumb ass a lord. Got it? Got it, his friend replied with a sigh. The oppressor finally left the area. I didn't allow myself to breathe until the light from their torches had faded out of my sight. The wall is this way, Alexei whispered. No one commented on what we'd overheard. We reached the wall again in a matter of minutes and were able to cross to the other side undetected. Theo had already made a portal on the other side. We flew through it and I changed from wolf to man as my feet set back on Irish ground. The unseely stone, Theo said, once the portal closed behind us. I bet anything it's hidden in this lost city that Drogo wants to find. Finlay gave a moan of pain. We glanced at him. Alexei, who was still supporting him, said, I'm going to get him to Miroslova. He trotted off toward the double doors of the estate. Stefan, ever the skeptic, scowled at Theo's theory. That guy sounded like an idiot, Stefan countered. Maybe his buddy was right, and it was all a bunch of bullshit. It would give us a reason why Gabby hasn't been established as a goddess, I said. That's something. Okay, but what kind of lost city is he looking for? Is it here, or in Edmire? We can't even narrow it down to one realm, and apparently, neither can he. Doesn't this seem like an impossible task? Stefan argued. If Septius could get there, we can too, Theo insisted. We just have to figure out how he did it. And where it is, Stefan said bluntly. Anything could be hiding it. Illusion magic, portals. Not to mention, there could be things guarding it too. If it's such a well-kept secret that not even the gods know where it is, what chance do we have of getting there? I wasn't sure. Had the unseely stone forced Septius to take it to this lost city and then wiped his memory clean of the incident? It seemed like the only thing that made sense. Yet Stefan made a very good point. If a god couldn't find a city, then how could we? Chapter 8 Emma A lost city. It was an unfathomable thought that the Unseelie Stone could be in a hidden place not even Droga could find. I'd had several conversations with Lucian on where, or what, this lost city could be, but nothing ever came of it. We were closer to obtaining the last stone than ever before, but at the same time, the vital clue that could lead us to the Unseelie Stone's location was completely out of our grasp. I didn't think any amount of research would uncover where this lost city was or what Droga wanted to do with it. If the answer was in a book or scroll, Droga would have found it by now. I felt very restless, which was ironic because the energy I had to spend was limited. Before, when we were searching for the stones, I always had school or running the kingdom to keep me busy and give me a purpose when lapses of information or clues on the stones failed to show up. Now, I was more or less just waiting around for something to happen. I woke up one April morning and decided that I was done with sitting on my hands. I walked to the nursery knowing today I'd do something to help my quest, even though I didn't know what it was. Odette, Kiara, and Delmare were all gathered in the nursery when I got there. Delmare was giving Kazim a bottle, while Kiara and Odette finished changing Kalina. Tigris napped on a flower petal that had fallen from an orchid on the windowsill. You girls are up and at them, I said as I walked in. Trying to get some practice in before the big day, Delmare said as she laid Chasm back in his crib and placed a hand on her stomach. This little one is late. Well, the baby is Stefan's offspring and he is never on time, Kiara joked. I'm ready whenever the kid is, Delmare groaned. Being pregnant was great when I wasn't too big to move. Are you worried about giving birth? I asked. I'd rather go through labor at any point than go one more day being bloated. She flatlined. You should see what I've tried so far. Spicy food, walking, sex. That your mate likes that one, Kiara cracked. There was a knock on the door. Ozzy poked his head in before waddling inside. It smells like babies in here. And bubblegum. That'd be me, new perfume, Odette said. Ozzy brushed back a bit of Kalina's blonde hair with one finger before Kiara said, What are you up to today, Ozzy? I'm just looking for something to do. I baked way too much yesterday, Ozzy said with a sigh. 
Jas was busy and, well, the kitchen got out of hand. There are so many scones. How many scones? Odette asked eagerly. Do you guys want to have a late brunch? I thought a tea party would be wonderful in this kind of weather. Ozzy offered. Oh, tea time! Odette gushed. I love it, let's! We should dress up the babies. It'll all be good fun, Kiara insisted. Oh, we can all get ready. It'll be just like being at the palace again. Odette gushed before she stopped. Everyone looked at me, but I shrugged. Tea time is fun, and I've got a dress my mother bought me from town that she's been nagging me to wear. I might as well let her see me in it before she gets offended. I'll set up the table, Ozzy sang, and he hurried downstairs. I dressed Kalina in a very pretty Robin's blue dress, while the girls slipped Chasm into a tiny matching suit. They looked very adorable. Tigris woke up and insisted on coming along, wearing the orchid leaf like a cloak as he buzzed after us. We all changed into our fancy gowns, save for Delmer, who insisted she was uncomfortable enough and that her black sundress would suffice. My mother had gotten me this puffy blue gown in the same color as Kalina's that was oddly cozy. The skirt floated around my ankles and skimmed my white lace sandals as I carried Kalina downstairs. The weather was lovely. It was a warm spring day, and the sun was out. It rained last night, and the air smelled fresh. Flowers were starting to come up in the beds that lined the cobblestone path to the estate, and the birds were pleasantly singing. In the yard, Ozzy had set up a round table covered with a light cloth. On the table were a variety of fine china plates, teacups, saucers, and teapots, all decorated with the same floral design. He'd arranged a variety of cookies, scones, cakes, and pastries on tiered trays, and even accented the table with flowers. The whole thing looked even better than tea time at the palace. He was very talented. I hoped after all of this was over, he got his bakery. It'd be a wonderful place to have lunch. I put a hand over my mouth to suppress a laugh. Ozzy was taking tea time very seriously. He'd slicked back his hair and donned a jacket with coattails. He pulled out chairs for each of us before he scurried to his seat and tripped over it. He rose with a bashful smile, straightened his shirt, and donned a top hat before sitting down. The babies weren't quite big enough to be in high chairs yet, so we took turns passing them around as we ate. This looks very good, Odette said as she tucked into a rose tart. It's all allergen friendly, so you're good, Emma, Ozzy said proudly. I think you'll like my cream puffs best. I was already tucking into an eclair and dying of happiness. No one could quite bake like Ozzy. Tigris was having the time of his life. He lapped up a saucer of honey before he immersed himself in powdered sugar. Mali Ludwe couldn't get enough. It was good for them. No illusions this time? Delmer asked as she took a bite of devil's food cake. Oh no, they have them, Ozzy said. But they're slight. Mood illusions to lift your spirits with every bite. I figured we could all use a little more joy around here. I put a lump of sugar into my raspberry hibiscus tea and stirred it before I said, So, where's Jasper today? I'm not sure. Ozzy seemed to deflate with the mention of his mate. He sometimes goes on patrol with Ethan and the rest of the guys, but mostly he locks himself in our room and never comes out. Not even for sunlight. That's not good. I replied. Maybe he's turned into a vampire, Delmere joked. I'm really worried. Tears began to fill Ozzy's eyes. He doesn't want to spend time with me anymore. He basically ignores me. I'm worried he's getting tired of me. Ozzy dropped his head and a teardrop splashed onto his plate. I bet it's not even about you, I offered. Jasper loves you. So he loves me. Big deal. Ozzy sniffed. If he cares so much, he'd show me, but I can't even get a kiss out of him lately. He feels so distant. <sighs> Maybe we're going to break up. Ozzy dotted his eyes with the napkin. I frowned. What was up with Jasper lately? I knew for a fact he was crazy about Ozzy. Why was he behaving like this? Old maids have hard times, Kiara said, laying a hand on his shoulder. There are periods when things are good, and then times when things are awful. It's normal. You'll just have to ride through it. 
Yeah, not to mention, nobody is having a good time lately, with Droga taking over and all, Delmere said with a mouthful of cake. Jasper's probably taking it harder than the rest of us. Ozzy stuck out his bottom lip. Well, he hasn't been right since Vara had to go. I think he's worried about which one of us is next. None of us, I said sharply. We're all going to get through this together. We're not losing anyone else. Gosh, I sure hope so. Ozzy brightened as he took a big bite out of a jelly donut. Anyway, I didn't bring you girls down here to talk about myself. How are things going in your life, Emma? I scowled. Well, we're looking for a lost city that probably doesn't exist, so there's that. It's like the unseelie stone up and vanished into nowhere. The gods give us information when we are ready for it at the proper time. Yara reminded me. It's happened before with all the stones. Whenever we thought we hit a dead end, things always panned out at the end. Whatever we needed came in at just the right moment. Well, the gods need to hurry up because I'm tired of waiting around. I grumbled. Kalina spat up and I wiped her chin with a handkerchief. Amantha and Finley came around the corner. She was holding his arm as they were on a morning stroll. Her eyes lit up when she saw us, although Finley's look remained deadened. What are you guys doing? Amantha asked. Having brunch? Care to join? Ozzy asked. Sounds splendid. Amantha sat down and took a sugar cookie. Finley hobbled into the seat next to her, wincing as he sat down. All right, Finn? I raised an eyebrow. Doing well. He adjusted the bandages on his hand and didn't move to grab any food. His eyes were lidded and his face was gaunt. He acted like Mr. Tough Guy, but they'd really messed him up in Preska. I could tell. His bravado had seriously been reduced. You look like you're feeling better, Amantha commented as I started in on my second pastry. By the day, slowly, I said. Normally, sweets would make me throw up, but I was actually able to keep food down today. I was really excited about it. There was a snapping noise behind us, like someone stepped on a branch. Finley jumped, shaking the table. A couple of teacups spilled over. Amantha put a hand on his arm and gently whispered, It's all right. It's only Arthur. Finley slowly sank into his seat, but his complexion was paler than ever. Amantha shoved a cookie at him that he refused to eat. Arthur was walking by with a rather large book. He adjusted his glasses as he glanced the table over. His gaze hovered on his children for a moment before he said, You're all looking rather flawed this morning. We're having tea time, Odette cheered. Care to join us? Arthur hesitated, but he crumbled at the pleading look I gave him. He sat down next to me. Ozzy poured him a cup of tea and handed him the saucer. Arthur sipped at the tea and nibbled at a strawberry danish as Ozzy asked, So what are you reading? Nothing important. Just an analysis of ancient Melovian children's tales, he replied. He really wasn't willing to give this up. This bordered on obsession. I ate an egg puff pastry and didn't say anything. That sounds interesting, Kiara said. It's quite frustrating, actually, Arthur said with a sigh. So many of these stories were orally passed down, which means they were modified quite a bit throughout the centuries. By the time someone actually took the time to write them down, it seems they'd changed so much that no one could tell what the original story had been. Maybe my brother would give up trying to bring Vara back after all. We could only hope. Ugh, Kalina! She was getting feisty in my arms, kicking her feet and starting to yell. I didn't know where she thought she was going. She couldn't walk or crawl. She was such a handful sometimes. Here, let me, Arthur offered. He held his arms out and I nearly fell over in shock. I don't think he'd held his daughter, ever. Not since she'd been born. Then a strange feeling rebelled in me. I didn't want to give her up. That was wrong. Against my own instincts, I handed over the baby. Arthur cradled Kalina against his chest. He bounced the baby up and down, who made a soft noise. She settled down. He was making progress. This was great. Kalina was asleep by the time he handed her back to me. 
Arthur was being such a good dad right now. He even played a little with Chasm. He shook a rattle in front of his face. The baby cooed and tried to grasp it with his fingers. Arthur gave a little laugh. It was the first smile I'd seen grace my brother's face in weeks. I prayed he was getting better, even if his research was still disturbing. What about this lost city we're all baffled on? Did you find anything on that? Delmare questioned. Arthur's cheeks tinted pink. Ah, no. I've been busy with other matters. I scowled. I understood Arthur was grieving, but we needed his help. He couldn't bring Vara back, but he could help us locate the Unseely Stone. If anyone could put together this mystery, it was him. Perhaps we're not looking at the situation the right way, Kiara said. We're searching for answers outside of ourselves, but maybe we shouldn't be. If Troga can't find it, and he can't find us, maybe the answer lies within. What sense does that make? I asked. No, Kiara might have a point. Maybe to find what the lost city is, you need to find yourself, Arthur suggested. You are the world weaver, after all. The missing piece must be you. I pondered on that idea. If I'm the missing piece, and somehow the information we need is tucked somewhere inside me, then how do we get it? I suppose you would have to rediscover who you are, Kiara suggested. That sounded scary. My identity had been ripped from me since Dolinska had fallen. But as my friends had said earlier, I needed to get myself back. Maybe all of me hadn't been erased entirely by trauma and mistakes. We agreed long ago that we'd find our true names together, and we never did, Arthur said solemnly. I think that would be a good place to start. I nodded. Okay, so what do we need to do? There's a ceremony, but we need someone to guide us. Arthur said. Someone with experience and wisdom. We should ask our dad. I was getting excited. Do you think he's available? Last thing I saw, he wasn't doing anything but wooing our mother. Arthur said a bit sourly, thumbing at the house. I suppose we can always ask. I stood from the table, thrilled to get started on something again, and placed Kalina into Kiara's outstretched arm. Thanks for the brunch, Ozzy. It was delicious. The any time, Ozzy peeped. Someone has to get fat off my cooking other than me. We'll stay here and finish up, Odette offered. These pastries are going to take the rest of the morning to get through. And perhaps some of the afternoon, Amantha agreed. Arthur and I headed to Lucian's office. Tigris followed, although his orange fur had been turned white from all the powdered sugar. When we got there, Mom was sitting on Lucian's lap and completely fawning over him. Well, hello. Lucian said brightly, To what do I owe the pleasure? Mom frowned. I took a breath and hurried to say, We wanted to find our true names. We thought that maybe you could guide us in the ceremony. Lucian opened his mouth to speak, but Mom said, Today seems rather spontaneous. Something like this should be planned. We don't really have a lot of time, Mom. I responded shortly. Kiara thought that I could be the missing connection to finding the lost city. Maybe there's something hidden within myself that'll give us a clue on where to start looking. Mom gave a skeptical psh while Lucian rubbed his chin. Thoughtful. I could certainly... You promised that today was only for us, Mom protested. We were supposed to go out tonight. Are you going back on your word? Lucian hesitated. I did promise... This is important, Arthur pleaded. We don't mean to interrupt your time together, but... Mom sent Arthur a glare and curled her lip. It halted my brother's sentence in its tracks. What the hell? Was Mom jealous of us? We were her kids, for God's sakes. We deserved to have some time with Lucian, too. Never mind, I said. I'm sure Bobka and Bapa can lend a hand. I... Lucian faltered. It's fine. Really. Have a nice day. I insisted. We left before he could argue further. I could tell by the way Arthur's fingers clenched around his book that he was pissed. God, she's acting like a teenager, Arthur growled. She's become a different person since Lucian came around, I mumbled. I thought mates were supposed to make you better, Arthur commented. I gave a noncommittal shrug. 
I had realized over the past few months that the person my mother had turned into was actually the woman she'd been all along. That kind, caring mother figure that had been there all my life was a persona she'd created out of necessity. It was a way to forget the girl she'd once been. Of course, she still loved me, and she loved Arthur, but she was very much of the opinion that both of us were grown now and, therefore, her primary focus should be herself and what she wanted. Which was fine, I guess. Delmer and I had a conversation where she'd said that my mother reminded her of her own, man crazy. I had been forced to agree. My mother had bonded with two different shifters, and that hadn't been her fault. But secretly, part of me believed she'd played King Lycus while knowing Lucian was the only one for her, because she'd liked all the attention. I'd thought of it in a different way before I became queen, but after having the crown on my head for several months, I'd finally grasped the gravity of what my mother had done. She'd sworn herself to Lycus, helped him win the contest, and then vowed to lead a country, all while sneaking around with Lucian behind Lycus's back. Then, when the country had needed her to lead, she'd run off with her boy toy. She wasn't pregnant until after it all happened, so she couldn't use Arthur and I as an excuse. Lucian wasn't exactly innocent, either. He knew what was going on and hadn't put a stop to it. I couldn't imagine betraying Melovia in such a way. Before I knew Ethan was the Phantom, and I thought the Vigilante was my true mate, I'd promised to let him go, because I knew the good of the nation was more important than what I wanted. Don't judge me, Emma. You don't know what I had to go through. Mom had said snippily when I brought it up privately the other evening. Maybe I didn't, Mom, but I knew enough. And I didn't have to walk a mile in her shoes to admit to myself my mother cared for her own happiness more than the security of others. And that was painful. She hadn't raised me that way, but clearly her expectations for me were far higher than the ones she set for herself. Now that she had Lucian back, Mom was more concerned about going out and partying like some kind of teenager instead of helping all of us. It was embarrassing, but worse than that, it was hurtful. We didn't get any time with him either, Arthur pointed out forcefully. She wasn't the only one who had to go without him for twenty years. I know, I admitted heavily, but I don't want him to feel like he's torn between us. Let Mom have him, for now. He's already helped us out so much. Arthur let out a grunt. We went looking for our grandparents and found them in their usual spot on the porch overlooking the pasture. Papa was smoking on his pipe, and Bobka was brewing a potion while using her telepathy magic to knit at the same time. The needles wove yarn in the air of their own accord as Bobka stirred the potion and whispered an incantation to it. Puck was curled up by Bobka's feet, chewing on a dog toy. Top of the morning, what can we do for ye? Bobka asked as she ladled the potion into a bottle. Arthur explained. When he was done, Bapa raised an eyebrow. Your father should be the one to do it with you. It would be right, Bapa protested. We get it, but... I upturned my hands. Bobka gave a scowl that could turn milk sour. I swear, if that woman wasn't your mother, I'd put her on her arse before your father had anything to say about it. Babka, I groaned. The tension between my grandparents and my mother was getting ridiculous. Mom had sworn Babka had put a roach in her shoe the other day. I didn't put it past Babka not to. Babka wrapped her ladle against the side of the pot. Papa put out his pipe and said, We shall do it. It's best done at night under the watch of our gods. But you will need time to prepare, Babka added. Do exactly as we say. And when the time is right, we shall summon you. But, be warned, this is no average ceremony. What do you mean? My heartbeat began to race. Some fey who discover their true names never quite come out the same, Babka warned. Don't expect not to change after this experience, because you will. The only thing to wonder is how. I gulped. That sounded scary. Part of me didn't want to change, because change was scary and it felt unsafe. Yet, I'd come to that same old bridge I'd crossed a countless number of times. I couldn't be who I was anymore. I'd gone through so many cycles since I'd come to Melovia, shed so many different identities, 
and the person I was now wasn't who the world needed. I knew who Emma the Warrior was. I knew Emma the Sorceress, and even Emma the Queen. Now I needed to discover who I was as the World Weaver. I wanted to get to the core of who I was. I couldn't avoid it. This was the only way. Are you sure you want to go through with this? Ethan asked. He stood beside me as a wolf under the darkness of the full moon. Papa and Babkia had asked him to come, to protect me during the ceremony. This was heavy spiritual work, and would attract the attention of any entities or monsters in the area. If I was in a deep trance, it was his job to fend them off while I did the work of discovering my true name. Yes, what other ideas do we have for finding the Unseelie Stone? I asked. I will guard you, but be warned. This isn't something most Fae do, or even should do. The knowledge of true names can be dangerous. If it becomes too much, you can stop the ceremony and will let the matter drop. I wasn't sure what I'd face, but I was determined to see this through. At the same time, if this was as intense as shadow work, I wasn't sure I could complete the task. Just stay close to me, okay? Always. We proceeded into the woods. The other shifters were scouting the perimeter to make sure we were safe. The two of us met Arthur deep in the forest. He'd chosen Amantha as his protector to stand in his mate's place. I felt sorry for Arthur doing this without Vara. We should have performed the ceremony sooner. The four of us walked through the trees in silence until they parted to make a clearing. Babka and Baba were already there. They had drawn a circle of salt on the ground. A bowl of burning cedar branches sat in the middle of the circle, scattering smoke into the air. Both of my grandparents had painted their eyes black and wore deerskin robes. Papa had a small leather drum, and Babkia carried some sort of rattle that looked like it was made from the skull of a deer. They gestured for Arthur and I to sit inside the circle. Ethan and Amantha remained at the edge of the trees to keep watch for enemies. I could feel the heavy footsteps of my wolf as he prowled the edge of the clearing, looking for any threats. Take the ashes from the burning cedar and spread it over your eyes, so that they may be opened to what the gods have to show you, Babkia instructed. Arthur and I reached out to smudge the ashes across our faces, avoiding any embers. I thought that they'd be hot, but instead, they were unnaturally cool to the touch, as if they'd been left out in the dead of winter. This was some strange magic. I smeared the ashes across my eyelids. Arthur took off his glasses and put them in his shirt pocket in order to do the same to his own eyes. Once we were done, Bapa said, Join hands. I reached out to take Arthur's hands in mine. His fingers were trembling. He was really nervous. Because you have a twin bond, you must reach out to the gods through your connection together, Babkia instructed. However, once you speak the invocation and fall into the trance, know that you may not end up in the same place. There is no telling what kind of journey your spirit may take you. I felt a shiver race up my spine as Papa added, During this journey, your soul will leave your body. We shall do our best to keep you safe during this time. Your spirit will not return until you have gained the knowledge of what the gods wish you to know. How long will that take? Arthur asked. For some, mere moments. Others, many days. Babkia's tone darkened. Know that we cannot move you from the salt circle until your sword returns. Otherwise, your spirit will be forced to wander forever, and your body will become nothing more than a shell. Do your best to understand what the gods may tell you. That caused me to tremble. My body couldn't take being outside without food, water, or medicine for days on end. If I didn't learn my true name in time, my form would definitely give out. I had to do whatever the gods told me, if only to stay alive. As elders of the Fey race, we will first reach out to the gods for you. Then you may call upon them. Are you ready? Babka asked. Yes, Arthur and I responded in unison. Very well. Babka and Bapa started circling us. They went around us five times in a circle before they reversed and went the other direction. They began chanting something lowly in Melovian. Bapa played the drum and Babka shook the rattle. Seven gods faithful, come to thee, come to thee, Arthur and I spoke together. 
Show us the meaning of ourselves and open our eyes so that we may know who we truly are. Seven gods faithful, come to thee, come to thee. I closed my eyes and took several slow breaths, attempting to focus on the connection between my brother and I. It wasn't as strong as the bond Ethan and I shared. In fact, it was so much weaker now, damaged by Vara's death and the weight of Arthur's grief, I could barely reach him anymore. We had to strengthen that bond again. The gods wouldn't speak to one of us without speaking to both of us. I tugged tighter on the end of my connection, and Arthur tugged back, indicating he was there. I felt the threads of our twin bond grow stronger. I pictured a similar cord to the one I shared with Ethan, except this one was green in color. In my mind, the color became brighter as I tightened my hold on the connection and Arthur responded in kind. It nearly made me tear up. Arthur was so devastated, and yet, he wasn't willing to give up on me. He was still here and fighting for us. I was so proud of him for being so strong and for holding on, despite losing everything that meant something to him. As I began meditating, it started to rain. I did my best to block out the cold raindrops dotting my skin so I could focus. I worried if I became too cold that I'd get hyperthermia, but there was no turning back now. The ceremony had already begun. My head began to lull. A buzzing feeling overtook my body, making it feel like I was floating. Not of my own accord, my torso began to sway back and forth. I focused on the sound of the drum and the rattle. Arthur's fingers had grown chilly in my hand, and I was starting to shiver. The ground was wet, and Ethan's paws slapped against the muddy earth. I was starting to think this would never happen. All of a sudden, I was in the salt circle, and then I wasn't. When I opened my eyes, I found myself in a similar clearing to the one I'd departed, though it looked entirely different. The grass and trees here were tinted a light shade of blue, and everything was cast in a light, eerie glow. Stars spread out above me, and I could see the shape of massive planets as they loomed overhead. Fireflies twinkled a light shade of gold. In the center of the clearing was a pool, completely silver in color. The soft chirping of frogs and crickets told me this was a safe place, devoid of anything dangerous. I reached up to feel my head and skimmed the familiar wolfish ears that were nestled in my hair. It felt like I was sitting on a tail. Ouch. I had to be somewhere in Edenmire, but it was a part I hadn't explored before. I looked around for Arthur, but he wasn't there. He must have been sent to a different place. I got up from my seat and approached the pool. I looked down into it, but didn't see my own reflection. There were hoof steps behind me. I turned as a deer approached through the trees. At first, I thought it had to be Milana, my goddess. But as the doe approached, I knew that couldn't be right. This deer was smaller, and her antlers were only three-pronged on each side, sharp and refined instead of twisting like Milana's were. She was slightly larger than the average deer would be, Although her fur was a dark shade of midnight blue, her head pure white. Her eyes glowed like the silver pool did and seemed infinite. An array of spots dotted her back like starlight. It was Vesna, the blue doe of knowledge. She was the goddess of intelligence and wisdom. I'd never seen her before. I wasn't sure why she would come to me, as she wasn't the goddess I'd pledged myself to. Hello, my old friend. Vesna inclined her head to me. I'm glad to see you once again. A watery smile crossed my face as I whispered, Of course it was you. Vesna came toward me. As she did so, white smoke wafted around her form and she began to change. Her features molded until she was an old woman with white cropped hair and insanely blue eyes. She looked slightly different. Antlers bloomed from her head, and white dots like the ones on her back were scattered across her cheeks. She wore an elaborate blue robe that looked like it had been crafted from the fairy stars themselves, but I had no doubt it was her. Lady Magdalena. I ran to her, reaching out and wrapping my arms around her. Gods, I thought I'd never hold her again. 
Hello, Emmeline. The gentleness of her voice, even echoing now with the god power she held, was still so soft. I missed you so much. My tears leaked into the front of her velvety robe. Her presence was groundbreaking to me. I never needed to feel love from anyone else ever again, so long as I remained here with her. Oh, I never left. She stroked my hair back. I should have realized. Everything made sense now. Gods and goddesses sometimes came to Earth to incarnate as mortals to help Fae on their quests. Magdalena had incarnated as a sorceress to help guide me. I couldn't believe I'd been in the presence of a goddess for so many years and had no idea. Sit beside me here, Magdalena said, and she gestured to the side of the pool. We have much to talk about. I knelt beside the pool. Magdalena spread her cloak out around her as she took a graceful seat. I reached out to take her hand, and she squeezed it lightly. Did you know who you were before you died? I whispered. I couldn't help it. The tears were welling out of my eyes again. Whenever gods incarnate on Earth, we do not regain the memory of who we are until we are much older, Magdalena replied. I did not come to understand that I was the goddess of wisdom until I received my trance from the other gods about your quest. That was before I was even born. Why did you never tell me who you truly were? I asked. Gods are meant to guide, Emmeline. What kind of pressure would you have faced if you knew you were being mentored by a goddess? Magdalena asked. Pfft, no shit. She'd been tough on me when I thought she was a powerful sorceress. Are you here to give me answers? Do you know where the Unseelie Stone is or anything about this lost city we're looking for? I pressed. That's something I cannot help you with, Magdalena replied. The lost city of the Ansili Fey has been hidden from the gods for many years. It is why Droga cannot find it. We're looking for an Ansili city? I asked. At least we were getting somewhere. Quite correct. The city of Dark Fey that the first hidden king and his court shrouded themselves within centuries ago. When the Ansili Fey fell and their extinction was imminent, the most powerful sorceresses of their race banded together to put a curse upon the city, so that no silly fay or god would ever be able to find it. So numerous were they, and so great was their combined power, that not even the gods could know where the city was. Memory of it was wiped from our minds forever. I'm an unsealy fay. I have dark fay blood. The city wouldn't be hidden from me. I could find it, I said in excitement. You speak the truth, but we are aware that Droga has Ancilife working for him as well, most dangerously Gabriella. She and others like her have the ability to find this city, and she will not continue to fail forever. You must find the city before she does. Otherwise, the Ancilife stone will be lost. How can I find it? Is there some clue we need to find or a spell that'll show us where it is? You already have the ability to find the stone within you, Emmeline. The potential has always been there, waiting inside. You can do whatever you want. You merely need to unlock what has been hidden away. Melancholy overtook me as I realized that in this form, Magdalena was a true goddess. She couldn't interfere with my quest to find the stones, as the seven gods had taken an oath not to aid me in the journey to find them. The Fae had to prove themselves worthy to keep the portal open. That was the whole point. She couldn't just hand me the answers. I wish you'd survived, I said sadly. Even as a goddess incarnate, I'm sure you would have been able to help us find it, or at least help us defeat Droga for good. That is not how I, or fate, determined my path. Magdalena frowned, as if the idea of altering fate was irritating to her. Her personality hadn't changed one bit. But you had the power to stop Droga, and yet you sacrificed yourself. The power to defeat Droga is inside of you, not I, Magdalena said. I chose my death because I knew it was time for that incarnation of mine to end. But how? I'm the world weaver. I'm supposed to bring all of this to an end, but I'm not even strong enough to cast a spell anymore, I said sadly. Because you don't believe that you can. It's hard to believe when I feel this way, I insisted. 
Since you've been gone, I feel so hopeless. Nothing seems like it's worth fighting for. Have you ever stopped to ask yourself why your sadness matters? Magdalena asked. We all experience sorrow and pain. None of us truly know, at the end of the day, how things will turn out. There are those around us who are in misery and pain, and who cares for them? Who thinks of their suffering? You will find, Emmeline, that the more you reach out to give, the more you lend a hand, the less your sadness becomes. You can use your sadness to do good. But I feel so alone. I took a short breath. Everyone says that I'm the only one who can do this, and if it all comes down to me, I feel like I'm going to fail because I don't have the strength to go on. The Miriamic religion of the witches of the West believe that your soul is a complete being, that if you strip the making of yourself away and discard the relationships you forge, you can still be whole on your own, Magdalena said wisely. But the Fae have a different understanding, Emmeline. It is our community and our people that make us whole. The gods are in everything and everyone, and we are all united in a great web of life. I don't understand. You see, in the West, the witches are focused on the individual and the magic they can create inside themselves there as they work to bring out the best in the self. But fairies cannot do it. We are who we are because we believe in the unification of community and the meaning it brings. We create magic out of our imagination, and that magic is tied to the connections we all share as fey blood. It is why we are so bonded to our mates, and so tightly tied to our families. Because for a fey, it is the only way to survive. So a fey can't truly live on their own, because it wasn't meant to be that way. Indeed, for many years when the fey were first banished to earth, all we had was each other. If everything is taken away from you, what is left but the people around you? We need each other to rebuild. I believe in the modern world we focus so much on the success and self-reliance of the individual that we fail to realize what truly matters. Because if only one of us are important, Emmeline, then none of us are. I think I grasped the concept. Being disabled, I relied a lot on my community and the people around me to keep me healthy and safe. I did everything I could to better my health and make things easier for my illness, but honestly, there were a lot of things I didn't have control over. Losing my medicine had been a harsh example. My community was responsible for making things accessible for me and, at least in part, contributing to my care. Does this mean my destiny relies on more than just my own power, but the power of others, too? I asked. It takes all of us to achieve victory. Look at the destruction of the world around you. Communities are shattered when they do what is best for themselves, and not for everyone. Our bonds and our promises are important, Emmeline. If we cannot stay true to our vows to the people we love, we will betray anyone, including ourselves. For even though I am a goddess and you are a mortal, I am you and you are me. We are all one. I think I understand. Sacrificing yourself for the good of others isn't done because they deserve it or to make you look more important. No, Emmeline. In fact, it is a great act of love to serve and sacrifice for someone whom you know will fail you. How many times did Ethan let you down? Yet you still fought for him to be free of the Lachane's grasp. You did not wish to be queen. The desire to become a monarch wasn't in your heart for yourself, but for your people. You took the throne because you knew the people of Melovia deserved a ruler who cared for them more than she cared for herself. You were willing to give your life away and leave behind what you wanted in order to live for others and make your country better for other people. There is no greater act of service than that. Not even dying in the name of your nation can compare. Death comes for us all, Emmeline. Whether we live our lives for ourselves or for others in the meantime is the real choice we have to make. What if it's easier to go at it alone and less painful? It felt like it would be, safer, too, for the people I cared about. If you wish to accomplish your destiny and be successful, you must rely on your friends. 
You can't do this alone. No one can. And anyone who deludes themselves into thinking otherwise is fooling themselves. But how can I accept the help of others when I feel so bitter about how my life has gone? I questioned. I try to be grateful for what I have, but sometimes it feels like I'm forcing myself to be happy about something that feels out of my control. You misunderstand. Gratitude is love, Emline. It cannot be forced, only genuinely felt. It is not forcing yourself to feel happy with situations that make you miserable, but feeling appreciation for which you truly love. It will make your magic stronger to stop denying your feelings and to acknowledge that which you hold dearest in the world. When you feel happy, you are grateful. Thankfulness is synonymous with joy and love, not a weapon to be used, formed out of guilt. Remember that. Magdalena laid a hand on her chest. When she withdrew it, an orb of sapphire light balanced on her palm. This is your power, Magdalena said. We all create energetic contracts, Emmeline, like Ethan did with the Lachane. You became afraid when you lost Delinska, and so gave away your power. I took it and kept it safe for you. Now is the time for you to take it back. I stared at the sapphire light warily. I didn't want to admit it out loud, though I was certain she knew. I didn't want it. I'm afraid of my powers, I confessed. I know I'm strong, and I can hurt people. My choices have an effect on everyone. I know my magic can have consequences. I am a goddess. I have seen many wars throughout the ages, alongside plagues, calamities, and other strifes, and this is just another crisis that will pass and fall as all the others did. But the great tragedy of life is losing oneself, Magdalena replied. You can command and draw whatever you like into your life through this energy. The greatest lesson I will ever have to give you is this. You can decide your own fate, and as long as you persist, what you desire will always come to pass. Accept your gift again, and you'll find that things will be easier from now on. You cannot continue to fight without it. I took the ball of light from her gently. I held it in my hands, balancing the orb until it slowly dissolved at my fingertips. I knew it had gone inside of me and was waiting for me to access it whenever I needed it. What about you? I don't think I can do this without you. I didn't choose to die until I knew there was nothing more I could teach you. I gave you all the knowledge I could. It's up to you to put that into practice. Does that mean you're not coming back? I will not incarnate again for many more centuries. I have work to do in Edinburgh, and my time spent living as a mortal distracted me, from both my duties and my harem, Magdalena replied. I am bound to shift us here that I mated in past lives, including the man I married in my most recent life. They deserve my time and attention, as do the thousands of fey that have sworn to be my patrons. So, I'll never see you again? My voice was choked as I asked the question. Don't be ridiculous, Emmeline. I am all around you, in the knowledge you seek, in the questions you ask, and in the wisdom you carry inside. When it is your time to enter the great hunting grounds, I will be waiting for you, to welcome you there. You have nothing to worry about. Death cannot stop love, and you can tap into my love for you at any time and draw strength from it there. I took a shaky breath. I wished Magdalena could come back with me, but she was right. She had obligations to other people. And I had a duty too, to the Fae and all my friends. She told me I couldn't do this alone, and I was damn tired of trying. Being the world weaver and having great power wasn't enough. In fact, it meant nothing if the people I cared about weren't behind me. You are a champion of Milana and one of my most faithful students. Therefore, it is a great privilege of mine to bestow upon you your true name, Magdalena said. Magdalena pointed to the trees. A white wolf emerged from the shadows. There was a twist in my gut as I realized that it was the same she-wolf that I'd seen and faced during the trial of tears. She was me, my true self, who my soul really was inside. Do you recognize her? Magdalena said. 
Her name is Damaruka. She is the Queen Wolf. Magdalena kissed my forehead. The area around me began to shimmer and bend. I felt my body again, although my spirit was still floating outside of it. I realized that the trance was ending, and I didn't want it to. I wanted to stay here, with her. Wait, I whispered. I reached out to touch her, but my fingers went through thin air. She was already fading. The path before you is full of shadows, Domovelka. All you must do is walk it, Magdalena said. Be brave, and remember always to take what is yours, and Alpha doesn't cower. She demands and owns what she wishes with a declaration of blood. Proclaim what you want with a vengeance. Only then will it become yours. Magdalena gradually left my presence. Soon I was back in my body, sitting on the soggy ground and feeling cold. Claim. Earth wasn't as cool as Edenmire. I wanted to go back. Arthur was still holding my hands. He blinked slowly as he came out of the trance. I was smiling, but my brother's face appeared completely stricken. Oh shit, what had he seen? Noise at the edge of the trees caught my attention. Ethan was chasing off a couple of shadowy figures with Amantha's help. Babkia and Bapa knelt by our side, and Babkia asked, How do you feel? A bit spacey, I replied. I withdrew from Arthur's grasp to cradle my head. Same, Arthur replied in a hoarse tone. My eyes managed to focus as Ethan and Amantha came jogging back to us. What were those monsters? I asked wearily. A couple of wraiths, Ethan responded. They were drawn to the area almost immediately when you slipped into the trance. How long were we out? I asked. Nearly fifteen minutes, I'd say. Had it really been that short? The time I spent with Magdalena felt like hours. Drink this, Bobkia said. It will restore your strength. She handed me the potion she'd brewed earlier. I sipped it and found the floating feeling resided. I handed it to Arthur and he chugged the rest. I couldn't wait to tell everyone about my vision. It came surging out of me. Our suspicions were right about Lady Magdalena. She's a goddess, I said. She's Vesna, the blue doe of knowledge. She spoke to me in my vision. By the gods, Ethan gasped. Did she tell you anything about the Unseelie Stone? It's in the Lost City, which is actually an Unseelie Haven that was abandoned when the Dark Fae lost the war, I explained. She didn't know where the city was, though. The Unseelie Fae put a curse on it, so the gods wouldn't be able to find it. We've heard of this place, Bapa said. Though it is lost to legend, we may still be able to seek it out. Wow. Amantha raised her eyebrows. I can't believe it. The blue doe of knowledge herself. The sly old girl, Ethan said in a jolly tone. None of us should be surprised. I often felt honored to serve her. If only I had known I was in the presence of a goddess. Arthur was being awfully quiet. I hoped he wasn't offended that I'd taken the initiative and blurted out my vision. What did you learn, Arthur? Arthur hesitated. He put his glasses back on before he said, I spoke with Neva, the phantom doe of shadow and the goddess of time. I was surprised. She was the most elusive of the gods. Yes, the same. It took me some time to realize who she was. I'd never seen her before. I'm surprised she spoke with you. She never shows up, not even when she's summoned, I said. I did swear myself to her to my choosing, Arthur reminded me. I must have pleased her in some way. What did she tell you? I asked. I don't really wish to discuss it, Arthur said regrettably. But she told me that Vara can never come back. The wind whistled through the clearing, and I said, I'm really sorry, Arthur. I had hoped. He took a heartbroken breath. Never mind now. It's over. Did you learn your true name? I asked. Yes, Arthur replied. It wasn't what I expected. Neither was mine. But Arthur didn't seem like he wanted to talk about it, so I changed the subject. We should get to learning about this unseelie city right away. Agreed, 
Arthur said as he sprang to his feet. I'll head to the library. There's no time to lose, after all. He sure was eager to bury himself back in his books. He hurried ahead of me and kept his back turned. Amantha hastened to his side. She ducked her head and whispered something to Arthur, who replied lowly, giving a glance back at me. Okay, I was kind of hurt he was talking to Amantha about whatever he'd seen instead of me, his fucking twin, but whatever. I checked on our bond and found, with an inward recoil, that Arthur had all but severed it off. Fuck, that hurt. I didn't get what his problem was. Was he pissed that I'd been right about bringing Vara back? I was only trying to protect him. Ethan strode at my side as we walked through the trees. My grandparents trailed behind, giving us space. Your vision must have been extraordinary. Tell me all about it. It was a good way to distract myself from how my brother was acting, so I retold Ethan everything I could recall from my vision. The estate was drawing near by the time I ended the tale. Ethan shifted back as we entered the house. Doma Wilka, what a beautiful name, Ethan said in awe. Yes, but we must be careful about who we tell, I said. If our enemies get their hands on my true name, they'll be able to use it against me. Of course, we'll keep it between us for now, Ethan replied. We climbed the stairs and started on our way to our bedroom. As I passed the nursery, something felt off. I couldn't place what, but my hand itched to grab the doorknob and enter the room. A strong instinct, like that of a mother wolf, took over my senses and told me something wasn't right. I'm going to check on the twins, I said. The words left my mouth before I even knew what was happening. Why? Let them rest. We'd put the twins to bed shortly after dinner, and long before we'd left for the ceremony. It had to be past midnight. They were sleeping right now. It would be a bad idea to disturb them. Yet some sort of niggling feeling at the center of my gut told me I needed to check on them. It was impossible to ignore. It'll just take a second. Come on. Perplexed, Ethan followed me into the nursery. Once we entered, the temperature dropped a few degrees. The curtains were drifting in the breeze as the window was open. I was certain I hadn't left it that way. It was springtime, but the nights were still chilly and the twins could catch a cold. Had someone else come in here after I'd left? I checked on Chasm first. He was fast asleep. I touched his cheek and he felt warm and comfortable. Nothing wrong here. I was starting to think that I was crazy as I looked into Kalina's crib. She was sleeping too and completely undisturbed. Just to double check, I lifted her into my arms and bounced her carefully. She didn't wake up. That was my first clue. Kalina was the easiest baby on earth to disturb, and she woke up bawling every time. Yet her eyes remained closed, and she gave soft breaths as I rocked her back and forth. This was my niece, right? It had to be her. Yet something about her was different. She didn't seem like our baby, but something else. I was losing my mind. Ethan stiffened as he set eyes on the baby. His nostrils flared as if he smelled something. Emma, drop it, Ethan said. He hastily strode my way, as if to knock the child out of my arms. Are you insane? I hissed, and I yanked Kalina away from him. I can't drop a baby. That's not Kalina. Ethan said. His voice took on a growling undertone. I went to protest, but the words in my throat died as I watched Kalina's skin turn from pale to green, scales blooming all over her form, her hands sprouting sharp talons. The creature opened its eyes and revealed yellow eyes with slits for pupils and a mouth full of bloodthirsty fangs. My mouth dropped open in shock as the baby in my arms morphed into a monster. I realized with horror exactly what was going on. Kalina was gone, and in her place had been left a changeling. I gave a shriek as I realized Kalina had been kidnapped, but that scream died just as the changeling lunged for my throat. Chapter 9 Ethan The changeling was aiming for the kill, and Emma was the target. 
I reacted quicker than I knew I could, slapping the changeling from her arms. The creature went sailing across the room with a loud cry and slammed into the wall. Chasm woke up and began crying as the changeling got to its feet and gave a loud wail. I transformed into a wolf and stalked the creature, pinning it against the corner. The changeling hissed and spat, swiping its claws at me. I jumped forward and nabbed the creature in my jaws, biting down hard. The blow snapped the creature's spine. The changeling stopped wriggling and went still as it accepted death. I let the changeling drop from my jaws. Black blood oozed from the puncture wounds on its body. Emma picked up Chasm, cradling him against her chest. Emma bounced Chasm in her arms to get him to stop crying, but he wouldn't calm down. The boy only wailed louder as I began to examine the room for clues. Was that thing placed here to kill us? Emma asked. No. It wouldn't have attacked if we hadn't realized what it was, I said. It would have continued to pose and grow as Kalina to serve the ruse, for years even. But where's Kalina? Emma demanded. Someone must have taken her and left the changeling in her place. Oh, gods! Emma began to sob, and she held Chasm tighter. Adrenaline and panic raced through my veins as my legs threatened to buckle beneath me. I was on the verge of losing control, but I had to remain calm. We couldn't find Kalina if we couldn't keep our heads. What about Chasm? Is he a changeling too? Emma asked. No, that's him. I recognize his scent, I replied. But Kalina hasn't been here for at least an hour or so. They must have taken her when you were busy with your ceremony. This doesn't make any sense. Why take one twin and not the other? I had an idea. I used my shifter sight to determine what kind of creature may have been here. I saw some kind of forked footprints embedded in the carpet. There was a rich smell like blood, although there wasn't any to be found in the area. That could only mean one thing. I changed back and frowned, wondering just where they might have gone. Striga. My tone darkened as I realized just what we were dealing with. What are they? Emma asked. Striga are a type of demonic fey undead. They're similar to vampires, I explained. They're usually young women who've been killed in a violent way, who rise from their graves to take revenge on the living by feeding on them. I dealt with a couple back in my vigilante days. They were not easy monsters to kill. Do you think they're working for Droga? If that's true, I don't know why they didn't slaughter everyone in the house. Droga has to know we're here. He'd have been here by now, I insisted. These Striga must have found us first, and are taking the news back to Droga as we speak. But why take Kalina with them? She must have been the target, I mumbled. But why would they want a little girl? Striga prefer fully grown victims, and she wasn't attacked. She was kidnapped. There would have been a mess otherwise. Emma put a hand over her mouth. It was a revealing tell. What do you know? I asked. There might be something special about Kalina, Emma admitted. Lucian and I suspect she's a demigod. I didn't tell you because it was safer to keep it between ourselves. But if she is a demigod, Droga will want her. And this Thriga must know he'll reward them for bringing her to him. I didn't know how they'd come to this conclusion, but that didn't matter at the moment. We'll talk about this later. We need to find her. If they made a portal, they're in Malovia by now, Emma moaned. Striga can't make portals. They have to travel across countries the old-fashioned way, on foot or with transportation. So we have time to stop them before they get back to Malovia. Yes, but we have to leave now and get on their trail. Are you even going to be able to catch up? Shifters are just as quick as vampires. And we were just as strong, too. I was going to rip the heads off these monsters who'd taken our little girl. The doors burst in. Arthur came racing in. I heard someone scream. His... He glanced at the body of the changeling on the floor. His hand went to his throat when he realized Chasm was there, but not Kalina. A changeling. Striga, I said, and Arthur made a choking noise. They were here recently. If we move now, we can pick up the trail. Arthur's eyes filled with tears and he gave a few gasping sounds, but he managed to keep it together as he said, I can smell them too. Let's move. What about... Emma started. The rest of you need to guard the estate in case other Striga show up, I said. We'll move quicker in a small group. I promise, Emma. We'll bring her back. 
Emma sniffed, and a teardrop cascaded down her cheek. But she nodded and kept Chasm close to her as she hurried out of the room to tell the others. Arthur leaned out the open window. They jumped out the window, then ran around the estate. They avoided the animals so they wouldn't make a fuss and alert us. Exactly my thinking. Outside was where we had to start looking. We raced through the halls. I ran into Stefan so hard that I nearly fell over. He looked like he was in a hurry. Stefan, good. I need you with me, I said. Stefan's eyes contracted. Um, he's busy, Kiara said, as she and Alexi bustled in. But we'll help. You'll need these. Kiara was carrying a small leather bag. She opened it up and showed me several sharpened wooden stakes. Wooden stakes through the heart were one of the few things that would kill a vampire, besides dismembering them and burning all the pieces. Stefan pushed me aside as he hurried on by, and I didn't fuck around asking questions. Come on, then. I shifted back into a wolf as we burst outdoors. I put my nose to the ground and started sniffing. I caught on to the Striga scent right away, and underneath it, the soft scent of a baby. I jerked my head as an indicator the others should follow. Arthur and Alexi shifted. Kiara climbed onto Alexi's back, and we ran as a unit across the estate. I followed the scent into the woods until the smell of blood began getting even more prominent and my gut began to twist. Figures on the ground took shape ahead. I skidded to a stop as I saw Ozzy lying on the ground, cradled on Jasper's lap. Something had happened. Are you two all right? I asked as I shifted back. Jasper was banged up, and Ozzy was bleeding profusely from two marks on his neck. Jasper had taken off his shirt and bunched it up on the wound, soaking up the blood as it healed. We'll survive, but it was a tough fight, Jasper replied. Striga in these woods? Can you believe it? You were attacked? Alexei blinked. Yes, we were out for a midnight stroll, but the bastards jumped on us, Jasper spat. I ran them off, but not before one of them got their fangs in Ozzy. Is he okay? Kiara asked. She didn't take much blood from him, as I ripped her off before she could, Jasper growled. Alexei knelt by Ozzy's side. Ozzy, can you hear me? Do you want to tell me what happened? He can't remember anything. Strig of Venom disorientates the mind, I said. He won't recall the attack or gather his senses until tomorrow morning. Mazi moaned. Jasper glanced up at me and said, Can you help? He needs medical attention. We would, but the Striga took Kalina, I told him. We're on a chase to get her home. By the gods, Jasper's eyes widened. I couldn't believe my eyes when I saw Striga wandering these woods to hear they had a purpose in coming here. Whatever they went after by taking her, we must move quickly. Do you know where they went? I asked. They didn't have Kalina when we were attacked, Jasper said. They must have found us first, then took her after. They headed toward town, Jasper pointed behind him. Alexei ruffled his feathers. I nodded and said, Thank you. We'll move on ahead. I'll get Ozzy back to the estate, Jasper said, as he boosted Ozzy into his arms. The Striga can't be too far ahead. I pray you find Kalina. I gave him a short nod. We proceeded ahead until we burst out of the trees and onto a gravel pathway. I kept my nose pressed to the ground until I shifted back at the edge of town. They'd taken the main road, odd, and ran straight into Trua Glean. All of us changed back as we wandered through the darkened streets. This time of night, the town was deserted. The trail is still strong, Arthur insisted. It's this way. I wondered if they were hiding in a building nearby, but the trail led us to an abandoned alleyway, which ended in a brick wall. At the alleyway's end, all hints of the Striga's presence vanished, as if they disappeared into thin air. The scent just ends here, Arthur said in frustration. He yanked at his hair, tearing out a chunk. Kiara approached the wall. She laid her hand upon it, studying it carefully. There's some sort of door here. I can sense it has magic. Kiara said. But, but Striga can't cast portals. I don't know how it got here. Perhaps an unfeely created it and left it there for personal use, and the Striga found it, Alexei suggested. However it got here, we need to go through it. Kiara, can you open it? I asked. Kiara nodded. Stand back. We took a few steps back as Kiara began weaving her hands. Her yellow magic bloomed at the center of the brick wall until it turned into a spinning portal. Wherever it ended up had to be nighttime, too, 
because I couldn't see where it came out the other side. It was too dark. That opened up pretty fast, Alexei said. It wasn't a very strong portal. Whoever made it was weak, Kiara said. Arthur was already charging through it without bothering to make sure it was safe. We followed him. As the portal shut behind us, I turned in place, taking in the sights around us. We'd ended up in another town, and from the looks of the architecture, I'd say we were in France. I'd been here before on my travels as prince, I was sure. Where are we? Alexei asked. Le Havre, I replied. It's a main travel point for all of Europe. It's one of the stops for the underground train that goes from London to Paris. I've picked the scent back up, Arthur said quickly. He jogged ahead. We crossed a few roads before coming to some kind of train station. I could tell Arthur was on the verge of losing it as we burst into the building. The station was still open at this time of night. Late trains were coming in from multiple countries. Inside, we followed the scent to a boarding dock, where it abruptly disappeared again. They took a train! Damn it! Arthur punched a concrete pillar and a piece of it broke off. They boarded the Molovian Railway, I said. They must have. It's the only train that goes directly to Molovia from Le Havre, and the departure screen lists Dolinska as the arrival. They took the Molovian Railway this late at night? Alexei questioned. The train occasionally makes midnight stops, I said. It's unusual, but not unheard of, especially at this time of year, when spring is turning into summer and Fay are traveling. If that's the case, we can portal ourselves onto it, Kiara said quickly. But we don't know where it is on its route, Alexei said. It doesn't matter. We've all been there before. So long as I can picture one of the main cabins, I can portal us onto the train, Kiara said confidently. But we don't know for sure if the Striga are taking her to Droga. It's just a guess, Arthur argued. And if we portal ourselves onto the Molovian railway and she's not there, we'll expose ourselves. Droga will know where we are for sure, Alexei added. We'll have to take the gamble, I said. Another portal. Kiara was already on it. She gestured for us to follow her to a deserted hallway of the train station. After checking for security cameras and seeing none, I gave Kiara a nod. Another portal bloomed in front of us, and my stomach dipped as we were magically transported from one place to another. The train lurched underneath my feet as I stepped onto it, and I fell forward, smacking my head against one of the windows. I gave a groan and rubbed my head as the others came through behind me. I recognized the interior of the Molovian Railway almost immediately. We had landed in an empty cabin. I was relieved for a moment, until the smell of blood filled my nostrils once more. The stench was so overpowering it made me want to vomit. They were definitely on this train. My brother-in-law went for the handle of the cabin without hesitation. Arthur, I hissed, but he was already moving with no regard for secrecy. He was being irrational. I couldn't blame him. I wanted to rip these vampires to pieces for putting their hands on a defenseless baby, but if we were careless, it put her in more danger. I grabbed Arthur's shoulder and held him back. He whipped on me like a cornered dog, teeth clenched as he shoved me back. I hit the wall and fell onto the seat. Alexei moved to block the door, boxing us in the empty cabin. Let me through, Arthur yelled. Keep your voice down. We don't want them to know we're here, Alexei whispered. I got back up rather painfully, and said, We need to be cautious. Striga can read minds. Can all vampires do that? Alexei asked fearfully. No, but Striga are demonic and come from fey blood, which makes them more powerful. Hybrids are always more dangerous. They aren't your average vampire, which means we have to be careful. I shot the last word at Arthur. I don't care what they can do. I'm getting my daughter back. Arthur raged. I'm aware, but letting them know we're here is going to put her in more danger, I said. Here, Kiara performed a spell, and I felt a glamour settle over my skin. That'll mask our scent, at least until we find them. Arthur didn't wait for us to discuss things further. He pushed Alexei out of the way and strode into the hall. Knowing he wouldn't hold back, we went after him. There were vampires all over this train. I couldn't tell where Kalina was, because the smell of blood was so overpowering. We crept by each cabin, though most of the train seemed empty. I didn't think anyone else was here, save for the vampires. The sound of a baby crying hit my ears. It was coming from one of the illusion rooms on the train. Arthur changed into a wolf and surged ahead, bursting the door down. It was the hot springs room, the one where they'd cast magic to make the place look like a tropical paradise. 
It was a vastly large space, able to fit a few hundred people with multiple entrances. Four striga lounged by the pools underneath the palm trees. They resembled beautiful women in long black dresses, features too perfect to be anything but unnatural. One of the striga had Kalina in her arms. The baby was wailing, her face red from crying and in clear distress. The vampire made no move to comfort her, merely sneered. When the striga heard us enter, their heads jerked up in unison. Their movements were precise and unnerving. They snarled as they spotted us and jumped to their feet. I prepared myself for the worst. I'd only taken on one striga in my life, and she'd nearly killed me. Even with my friends beside me, I wasn't sure if we could win this. Three of them charged at us with super speed, their forms a blur as they crossed the area in seconds. The vampire holding Kalina bolted for another doorway on the opposite side of the room. Arthur charged after her while the rest of us dealt with the attacking Striga. As they raced toward us, the Striga changed. Their feet became forked while claws sprouted out of their hands. Long fangs descended from their mouths and their skin turned a rotting shade of gray. Their eyes turned from silver to black as they prepared to tear us apart with screeches that shattered the air. I heard Kiara cast spells and there were a couple of flashes of light behind me. There was a loud oof as a vampire tackled Alexei to the ground. Alexei immediately began wrestling with the secondary Striga, a wooden stake in his hand. One of the vampires launched herself onto me, and her claws sank into my skin right down to the bone. I gasped and attempted to tear her off, but her hold was just as strong as mine was. With a snarl, the Striga sank her fangs into my neck, and I gave a gasp of pain. When she bit me, a burning sensation rushed through my veins, and I went still with shock. There wasn't the euphoria I'd heard of that came from the venom of vampires as they were feeding on you. This was drastically painful and akin to having two daggers in my throat. The striga sucked greedily, feeding on me with a ravenous hunger that made my guts twist. She was taking a pint by the minute and would have me drained within a short time if I didn't do something. She didn't use her venom, so I kept my mind. Her goal was to kill, not to stun. Somehow, I managed to force my paralyzed limbs to move and used all my strength to pull her away. I ripped the striga off my neck and tossed her to the floor. Blood spewed from my throat. She'd nearly tore open an artery. She lurched upward with a hiss, crouching on all fours and preparing to strike again. Ethan! Kiara had tossed me a stake. I grabbed it, then plunged the stake downward just as the vampire leapt into the air. She let out a harsh wheeze as the stake rammed into her heart. She clawed at the area for a moment before going limp. I ripped the stick out and let her body crumple to the floor, then fell to my knees. I pressed a hand to my throat. Blood was still pooling out and making me weak, but the wound was healing quickly. I'd be up again in a few moments, if we had that long. I looked for Kalina. Arthur had cornered the vampire holding her. The Striga clutched the baby in one hand and swiped at Arthur with another, keeping him at bay with her claws. I staggered upward to help him, but something slammed into me with all the force of a car hitting the wall at full speed. Stunned, I gasped for breath. A striga was sitting on my chest. She lunged forward, tearing her claws into my front. My clothes were immediately cut to ribbons, and my lungs would be next if I didn't act. I grabbed the striga by her hair and pulled her off of me. I rolled her underneath me, but she put her forked feet into my hips and tossed me away. I went sailing into the air and crash-landed into the pool. I struggled to pull myself out, the water running red with my blood as I kept a firm hold on the wooden stake. The striga pounced. She dove into the pool and wrapped her arms around me as she dragged me under the water. She held me there, grip tightening around my torso as her hold cracked my ribs. I winced, trying to stay conscious despite the pain of it all. She's trying to drown me. I flailed as I felt myself losing oxygen. With the loss of blood that I'd already experienced, I found little strength to fight back. My eyes began to roll back in my head as the vampire kept me within her grasp. I desperately wanted air, but the surface was far out of reach. A set of talons latched onto the Striga's shoulder and pulled us out of the water. I saw stars as I took a breath of life and my head began pounding. Alexei had transformed and his claws were deep in the vampire's shoulders as he lifted us out of the pool. I managed to wriggle my arm free as I kicked the Striga off of me. I stabbed her in the heart, and the vampire let out a scream of pain, her head lolling to the side as I wrenched the stake back out, 
creating a mangled hole in her chest where her dead heart once resided. Alexei dropped the body, where it floated in the water as he helped me out of the pool. My vision swam as I took note of the room. Alexei had killed the vampire that attacked him, but the Striga that had gone after me had originally attacked. Kiara! Alexei gave a strangled noise. Adrenaline returned my senses to me as I saw her lying on the ground, her eyes distant and bleeding heavily from the neck. Her body twitched as she went into shock from the toxicity of the venom. We hurried to her side. Alexei danced nervously as I looked her over. She hadn't been completely drained, but she was even worse off than I was, and she wouldn't heal as quickly as I could. Check her back, Alexei rasped. Kiara's fingers twitched. I scrambled to find it, and it was only a few feet away. I rummaged through it until I found a common healing potion which we could use for an antidote. This would mitigate the effects of the venom and restore enough of her blood to get us out of here. I hoped. I tipped the potion into Kiara's mouth, and she drank it, although she didn't wake up. I got to my feet and searched for Kalina. My unease settled as I saw Arthur striding toward us with Kalina in his arms, trying to comfort her. Kalina was still crying uncontrollably, shaking her fists and screaming. The body of the Striga was scattered behind him. Arthur had torn off the vampire's head and dismembered the rest of the body, leaving her in pieces. Is she okay? I had to raise my voice so he could hear me above Kalina's wails. They didn't hurt her, Arthur replied. They definitely wanted to deliver her to Droga. They still could, if we didn't get off this train. The rest of the Striga knew we were here. The scent of spilled blood would make them come running. Arthur, we need a portal, I began, but I was cut off by the sound of another voice speaking. I don't think so. That voice, it made a cockroach skitter up my spine as I recognized it. I had to be insane from the loss of blood, because this couldn't be true. I recognized her blonde hair, though her eyes had changed to silver. Besides that, her features still resembled her own, although they looked false in a way, as if someone had reconstructed them from magic. Her head, which I had watched roll from her neck for my executioner's strike, had been sewn back onto her corpse. The stitching made a thin scar as she approached me with her fangs elongated. Chastity, I snarled. The sight of my ex-girlfriend, raised from the dead, made my lip curl. I'd say it was nice to see you again, but I'd be lying, Chastity hissed. The smell of Ozzy's blood was heavy on Chastity's form, and redness lined her mouth. She'd been the one who'd attacked him. How is this possible? I took a step in front of Arthur to protect Kalina. Chastity wasn't getting anywhere near her. Well, you did kill me in a violent way, if you so remember, Chastity replied. You deserved it for trying to poison my wife, I replied harshly. I should have finished the job, Chastity sneered. My parents are loyal to Queen Gabriella. She gave them the necessary materials to raise me from my grave. Although, I have to say, my life's been much better since I've been dead. Or undead, rather. All thanks to you. They cursed you, she laughed. You think being a vampire is a curse? I'm stronger than I ever was. I'm faster, more beautiful, and I'll live forever. I can hear every stupid thought that's echoing through your head. It's no exchange for being in the great hunting grounds with the gods. What a pathetic way to think. I am a god now, and this world is my paradise. I no longer need to worship anyone. I have the power to give myself whatever I want. Now hand over the baby. Why do you want her? I growled. As we spoke, more Striga began filing in behind Chastity from the doors that led into the illusion room. Dozens of them. They filled the area, watching us with hungry eyes. I would have collapsed in fear if not for the instinct to protect the child behind me. I'd die for her if I had to, and it could possibly be this night. She's remarkable. You really have no idea, do you? Chastity asked. Whatever. You don't need to know the details. You'll be dead in a minute. I'll be sure to make your death just as terrifying as mine was. You never deserved to be king, Ethan. The greatest joy of my life was watching your reign fall. Secondary, only to what I'm going to do to that little bitch wife of yours once you're out of the way. Chastity snapped her fingers, and the Striga sprung. 
Alexei lifted Kiara into his arms, and Arthur had seconds to create a shield as we began running in the other direction. The Striga slammed against the shield, creating cracks. Their claws tore at Arthur's magic as we escaped the room through the back door. That shield won't last forever. We need a new plan, Arthur cried. He jostled Kalina, who was crying harder than ever. Then make us a portal so we can leave, I shouted. We can't portal out of here, Arthur stated. Even if we do, the Striga will come right back to the estate or tell Droga where we are. We have to kill them all. How? There are too many of them, I panted. They can't do anything if they're nothing more than ashes. Alexei opened a pocket inside Kiara's back, and my jaw dropped as I saw several potion vials lining the inside. Explosives. Thank the gods for Kiara. The fire from the explosives should kill them. Yeah, and us, if we don't get off this train, Arthur yelled. There's no time to wait for the train to stop. We'll need to jump. Get to planting those explosives, I barked. I can set them all off at the same time once they're placed, Alexei said. But we need to have an exit. If we make a portal, they'll just follow us through. We'll have to leap off the back of the train, and I hope we don't break our necks, Arthur said. Can't we fly off? I asked. At the speed we're going, the wind will catch our wings and send us smashing against the train or onto the ground, Alexei said quickly. We'll have to fall on something soft. I can conjure something. I'm strong enough, Arthur insisted. It's the only plan we got. I used my magic to glue the potion vials to the wall. Alexei stumbled after us, clutching Kiara as Arthur headed toward the back of the train with Kalina. I heard a sound like glass breaking and the screeches of the Striga as they drew near. They've overheard our thoughts. They know we're going to blow up the train, Alexei yelled. Then let's move. We'd only covered half the train, but it would have to do. The train shook as the vampires stampeded toward us. The three of us fled to the back of the train, where Arthur was waiting. Come on, he shouted. He was waiting by an open door, which led to the caboose. I dared to glance behind me. My heart stopped as I saw dozens of Striga running on all fours, covering the walls, the ceiling, as they crawled toward us at super speed. Chastity was leading them, a vicious smile on her bloody face. The landscape raced by in a blur as we stepped onto the balcony. Terror bloomed in my gut as I looked below. The train had to be going over a hundred miles an hour. This was crazy. But it was either leap from the train or be eaten by vampires. Arthur blasted off the guardrail with his magic and clutched Kalina to his chest, protecting her. Alexei placed one last explosive on the back of the train. No! Alexei screeched. He took the leap, holding on to Kiara. We all followed suit, jumping off the train at the same time he did. The explosives went off, making a ringing sound in my ears. The platform we'd been standing on immediately went up in flames as a tunnel of fire raced down the hallway we'd just fled through. I swore I heard Chastity scream as she and her horde were consumed by the fire. At the speed we were going, I was certain we'd smash against the ground, breaking our bones to bits. The ground rushed up to meet me, and I closed my eyes to brace for the impact. Yet my body hit something soft, which immediately cushioned my fall. I opened my eyes as I rolled off whatever had caught me. It was a giant airbag, the kind that stunt actors landed on when performing dangerous acts. Arthur had conjured us a safe place to land just in time. He cradled Kalina against him, who looked fine. The baby had grown too tired to cry, and was making tiny mewling sounds as her wide eyes searched her father's face. I looked down the track. The Malovian railway was still going, momentum driving it forward as the explosives continued to go off, turning the locomotive into nothing more than a fiery bullet. Parts from the train ricocheted off as the train began breaking into pieces. Eventually, the train tipped off the tracks and landed on its side, going up in a fiery display. I heard nothing but the cries of dying Striga fading into the night as I got to my feet. When Alexei slid off the airbag with Kiara in his arms, it vanished completely. Arthur took a few deep breaths and said, Right, that's settled. We should get home. He cast a portal and waited for us to walk on through. Now that Kalina was no longer in danger, he had recovered his senses. Good thing, too. He could be as reckless as Emma when he lost his head. It wasn't something I wanted to deal with again. Is Kiara okay? I asked Alexei. She's still out of it. She'll be okay. But the venom will make her forget everything. We'll fill her in once she wakes up, he said. That was the craziest thing I've ever done, Arthur breathed. Yeah, and for us, that's saying something, Alexei added with a laugh. Do you think chastity... 
I glanced back toward the smoking remnants of the train. Gods, let's hope so. I never want to deal with the likes of her again, Arthur spat. She's definitely ashes with the rest of them, Alexei said with a resolute nod. I wholeheartedly agreed. The portal took us back to the estate grounds, where we appeared on the front porch. Alexei headed inside immediately with Kiara, but Arthur hesitated, giving a scowl as he jostled the baby. I noticed and placed a hand on his shoulder. You can rest easy. We got Kalina back. We almost didn't, Arthur said. This is my fault. If I had been a more attentive father... You lost your mate. You didn't abandon your children, I insisted. No. My children needed me, and I let them down. I've been so lost in grief that it's put them in danger, Arthur said firmly. I can't make the same mistake again. Kalina could have lost her life today. All of us would do anything to make sure the twins are safe. They're your children, but they belong to everyone here. We all love them, I stated firmly. We're here to support you with whatever you need. The door opened. Emma rushed out. Oh, gods. She started crying when she saw Kalina. She's okay. To see Emma so emotional was a rare sight that melted the core of me. My insides turned to butter as I watched her weep over the child. I knew my heart had made the right decision to put Kalina's life ahead of my own. Emma adored these kids. I wouldn't have been able to live with myself if I had come home without the little one. She's quite well, actually, Arthur said. In Emma's presence, the baby had calmed. Her little eyes lolled, like she was about to go to sleep. Emma brushed her hair back and kissed Kalina on the head. I'm going to give her a bottle and put her to bed. Little lass had a long night, Arthur said. He slipped inside with Kalina. Emma's shoulders slackened, and she said, You have no idea how happy I am to see you. I thought for sure. Don't speak of it. She's home and safe, and that's exactly what we hoped for. I'd tell her about chastity in the morning. We'd had enough excitement for one night. Emma wiped her face of tears and put on a smile. But since you're back, it's happened. What's happened? The best thing. She took my hand and led me upstairs. There was the sound of another baby, though I didn't think it was Chasm. I felt a grin spread across my face as I entered Stefan and Delmare's quarters. Delmare was lying back on the bed. In her arms was a precious little boy with a mess of black hair. Stefan's chest was puffed out like he couldn't be prouder. Ah, so this is why you were busy, I said as I entered the room. I shook Stefan's hand and said, Congratulations. Look at him. Isn't he perfect? Stefan boasted. He's so big for a newborn, Emma said, leaning down. Nine pounds, Stefan bragged. And he eats like a cow, Delmare added. She nuzzled him before she added, but he's ours. What's his name? I asked. Isaac, Delmare said. It definitely fits. How are you feeling? Emma asked as she sat on the edge of the bed. Delmare shrugged. Giving birth wasn't as hard as I thought it was going to be, and it came pretty quick. I am tired, though. Stefan brushed back his mate's hair with a look of affection. I felt so happy for them. It was a little odd, seeing a friend you'd known since childhood become a father yet endearing. Stefan had a family now, and another reason to fight for the future. With the birth of Isaac, things felt a little brighter in the world. Yet tonight could have just as easily ended in tragedy. Kalina was safe, for now, but if she was as powerful as Chastity hinted she was, others would come for her. They wouldn't stop either. Monsters and villains of all kinds would do whatever it took to have her in their grasp, unless we kept her abilities a secret and did what we could to suppress her magic until she came of age. We couldn't do that until we knew what kind of power we were dealing with. It was time to learn exactly what Kalina being a demigod meant for all of us, before it put her and the rest of our family in danger once again. Chapter 10 Emma I was glad Ethan had torn into those vampires and left them for dust. They'd taken our Kalina and gods. If they had done anything to hurt her, they'd have experienced the full wrath of the World Weaver. I thought for sure I was going to lose my mind waiting for Ethan to return with her, but come back he did, and with not a scratch on the baby. It didn't surprise me that Chastity had been behind this. The bitch was too bitter to stay in a grave where she fucking belonged. 
I was glad that Chastity had been consumed by the flames like the other Striga. We knew she was dead. She'd go straight to Droga if she wasn't. But that she'd dared to set a hand on our baby made me want to go to the underworld and kick her ass all over again. If she somehow made it out and came back for our family, I'd utterly destroy her. Chastity's parents wouldn't have anything to resurrect once I blew her to pieces. That was a promise. What are you reading, Emma? Odette asked. We were in the nursery, and it was nearly time to get the twins ready for bed. The twins were lying on a blanket on the floor, while Delmare was nursing Isaac. He really did eat a lot. He was like his dad, who was determined to eat my grandparents out of house and home. It's a book on the goddesses, I told her, holding it up. I read the chapter on Vesna to see if there were any clues that might help us find the Unseelie Stone, but I didn't learn anything about her that isn't already taught by the High Priestesses. No wonder I was so fond of Magdalena, Kiara said as she fitted a new shirt on Chasm. I swore myself to Vesna after all. We all did, in a way. I'm moving on to the chapter about Neva now. I turned a page. I'd already read about Milana, my own goddess, and hadn't found anything groundbreaking either. It was interesting, if a little repetitive. Neva's chapter of the book was the smallest. It was like the high priestesses didn't know much about her, even though, according to the book, she'd incarnated the most on earth out of all the gods. I read through the passages about her past lives, intrigued. The goddess of time had never directly interfered in fey politics or war, although most of her incarnations appeared whenever Malovia was in a time of peril. A new passage caught my attention. I read it aloud in a whisper, bringing the book closer to my face to make sure I read it right. Besides being the goddess of time, Neva is also known as the patron goddess of writers, most particularly journalists, as they are seen to have influence over time and space with the power of their words, which remain to influence others even after their passing. A thought came to me. Arthur had told me that shifters who fell in love with goddesses went mad with grief after they died. Oh my gods, I yelped. I nearly fell out of my rocker. Kalina let out an alarmed wail before she settled down. What is it? Kiara asked, fully alarmed. I've got to talk to my brother. I tucked the book under my arm and ran out of the nursery without another explanation. I had to pick up my dress skirt so I could move quickly, and I cursed myself for wearing it. I used to be a jeans kind of girl, but being queen had made me more comfortable in skirts instead of pants, and it was hard to break that habit now. Unfortunately, you didn't really move quickly in a floor-length tulle dress. He was in the library, where I supposed he would be. He looked up the moment I entered. He was surrounded by a stack of books on all sides. It's a bit early to be slamming doors open, wouldn't you think? Arthur said crossly. I tossed the book on the table and slid into the seat across from him. Why didn't you tell me that Vara was the goddess of time? He blinked. His mouth dropped open and he stuttered, What? Oh, gods. He hadn't known. I bet Vara hadn't either. I took a deep breath. Okay, this is going to sound insane, but I think Vara might have been one of Neva's incarnations. No, that's impossible, Arthur stated. I spoke to Neva during my naming ceremony. She didn't look like my Vara. She was a doll, like in all the stories. Did she ever transform? The gods have deer and fey forms both, I stated. Arthur stared at me. Then he looked away as he hunched over the table. No. It makes sense, Artie, I insisted. She loved being a journalist, and Neva is the goddess of writers. You haven't been right since she's been gone. What if it's more than grief? What if you're suffering from losing the love of a goddess and not just a mate? If she's a goddess, why didn't she tell me? He asked harshly. Because maybe she didn't know herself. Lady Magdalena told me she hadn't realized she was the goddess of knowledge until much later in life. I said, Farah didn't have enough time to remember who she truly was, or time to access her true power. That's why she wasn't accomplished at magic. That doesn't explain why she didn't show herself to me during my vision, Arthur argued. 
A realization slammed into my gut and made me feel guilty as hell. Maybe she didn't think you were ready to know. And I'd just blown the whole thing without a second thought as to how my grieving brother would take the news. I was a fucking idiot. Arthur fisted a hand in his hair. He appeared so conflicted. If this is true, I... I can't believe I never realized. I think maybe you did know in your heart, I said. You swore yourself to Neva at your choosing when it's unheard of for a shifter to be a patron of a goddess. You told me yourself you'd be interested in being part of Neva's harem, because you are. She chose you as one of her mates. Arthur frowned. He was still trying to convince himself it could be true. This seems all so circumstantial. I'm a researcher, Emma. I like facts. Where's the real evidence? Your daughter is the evidence. People are after her because she has power, I pointed out. What if she inherited some of Neva's abilities and is one of the she Fey? Arthur fiddled with his glasses. You may be right. Since the kidnapping, Arthur had been told about Kalina's demigod potential, but we hadn't discussed it in detail just yet. The door opened. Lucian brightened when he saw both of us. Oh, there you are. Come, we need to have a discussion about the twins. Looks like we were about to have that conversation right now. Arthur and I glanced at each other before we followed Lord Lucian down to the dining room. When we got there, I saw Ethan sitting at the center of the table, looking between both ends. Babka and Bapa were seated on one side of the table, my mother the other. Oh, great. I bet this was going to be a real brawl. You couldn't get my grandparents and my mother in the same room together without some kind of meltdown. I cautiously took a seat beside Ethan, and Arthur sat beside me. Lucian took a seat beside Mom and placed an arm around her shoulder as he said, Now that we're certain the Striga won't return, what we need to decide is how much precaution we're willing to take with Kalina. Lucian cleared his throat. Babka leaned forward and said, the Striga wouldn't want Kalina unless she had more power than they themselves did. And that kind of magic is tremendous. If we were unsure of her demigod abilities before, we can't be now. She is a demigoddess. It's dangerous if others have access to that type of knowledge. There may be more, I began. I looked at Arthur, and he gave me a nod. Arthur and I have been discussing. We believe that Vara might have been Neva incarnated. There were notes of surprise around the table. Even my grandparents looked shocked and nothing got to them. Ethan rubbed his chin and said, This is interesting. What are the odds that we had not one goddess in our midst, but two? Astronomical, Arthur replied, but still possible. When I look back at everything that happened, yes, it could be true, Papa muttered. If this is true, Kalina could have inherited Neva's abilities. A Sifei as well, a daughter of a goddess mother and a mortal father. Lucian marveled. That would make her the strongest sorceress of her time. Once she's come of age, I said. Right now, she's just a baby. And we have at least 17 years, maybe more, before she's able to use her magic to protect herself. We have to keep her safe during that time. There was a bout of silence, where Lucian said, we knew Emma was the world weaver before she was even born, and Kalina being a demigod is even more dangerous. We have to be willing to take drastic measures in order to preserve her life. What are you playing at? Arthur narrowed his eyes, and I similarly bristled. Lucian sighed. I beg you to forgive me, but the matter seems obvious. Arthur has to take Kalina far away from here and raise her on his own. One of us will take Kaz. Arthur immediately jumped up and slammed his hands on the table. Ah, fuck no! You aren't suggesting it! There may not be another option, Lucian said calmly. I'm her father. I have more right than anyone to decide what happens to her. Arthur growled. She needs to stay with Kaz, and I need to stay with my son. They've already lost their mother. There's nothing more important than keeping our family together. Being a parent means making sacrifices. 
Mom shot at him. Sometimes you have to choose. Shut up, Mom. This wasn't what he needed right now. My grandparents stiffened. I knew damn well Bobkia wanted to tell her off, but she kept her mouth shut. Wouldn't for much longer, though. Lucian drummed his fingers on the table. You have to consider the possibility that it might be safer for them to be separated. No, I'm with Arthur, I said immediately. It was cruel that you guys split us up when we were kids. We damn sure aren't going to let that happen to the twins. I, for one, agree with our grandchildren. We thought it was foolish for Ivana to take Emma and leave Arthur behind. It would be a mistake to do the same thing twice, Bobka said. You don't have a say in this. You're just a great-grandparent, Mom snarled. I have as much say as anyone. They raised me, which is less than I can say of you, Arthur bellowed. Mom wrinkled her nose and rolled her eyes, like she didn't really care what Arthur thought of her anymore. And maybe she didn't. She had Lucian now. Her kids might as well be meaningless. Arthur, sit down, Ethan said gently. We can work out an agreement that benefits everyone, especially the twins. Arthur slowly sank into his seat, but he was about to go off again at a moment's notice. Our twin bond was tight, like Arthur was a fuse that already been lit. Mom gave a long, dramatic sigh, like she was bored and this was taking up her precious time. What if both of the twins have these amazing abilities? It would be better if they weren't together, so whoever is after them wouldn't be able to take both of them at once. Chasm is normal, an average supernatural, perhaps not even talented, I stated. There isn't power in him like there is in Kalina. And how do you know? Mom asked. I didn't want to tell her about the key. Kinda because I didn't really trust her with that information, but more so because right now she was really pissing me off. I'm the world weaver. I can sense power. Chasm isn't as strong as his sister. He never will be. Mom waved me off. Ethan squeezed my knee under the table and I settled at his touch. Forget Mom. This was about doing what was best for the babies. I didn't know why she wanted to hammer this point home so badly. Didn't she regret separating Horther and I? Why would she want to do that to Chasm and Kalina? Maybe my mom wanted Arthur to experience some of that pain. So he'd know what it felt like, and she wouldn't have to be alone. <sighs> Understandable motives. Still fucked up. Listen here. There is no... Why, I'm separating my children so everyone here can get that out of their heads, Arthur seethed. What are our other options? You could leave the estate, Lucian offered. Take the twins somewhere even more isolated, where it'll be hard for anyone to find you. A surge of terror slammed into me, though I knew it was selfish. I didn't want the twins to leave, because I wanted them with me. But if it wasn't what was best for them... It didn't matter. I'd suffer if it meant keeping them safe. I don't think that's wise, Ethan said. Here at the estate, we have multiple people here to protect them. If Arthur is out on his own with the twins, they could be better hidden. But if there's an attack, he'll quickly be overwhelmed trying to fend off multiple foes on his own. We can't just do nothing, Mom complained. Why not? Bobka shot at her. The estate is a safe place for us all. It can remain so for the twins if we increase our magical protections and become even more cautious as to who's out there. Droga will find this place eventually. We all know that, Lucian said tiredly. Then give us more time, I pleaded. I'm certain we can find the last crystal and put a stop to all of this. Even if Droga is defeated, Galina still won't be safe. There is no shortage of evil in the world, and the monsters will always come for her, Lucian argued. But if we do defeat Droga, we'll be in a much better position to protect her, Ethan stated. We'll have more resources and won't be distracted. And Kalina will have to come back to Melovia anyway once she has to learn her magic. It's the same situation we were in with me all over again. Let's do it differently this time, I pleaded. We can't, Emma. The safety of my grandchildren are at stake, Mom spat. Give them a chance to prove themselves, Papa argued. Mom let out a cruel laugh. 
Why? I wasn't given the same option. I had no choice. But then Lucian laid a hand on hers, and something in her eyes changed. Her tone became less harsh as she said, You've got one more year to fix this, Emma. We can't keep bargaining with the safety of the family like this. I didn't have much time left anyway. I was fated to die next winter, if my prophecy was right. I was determined to make sure the twins were safe before that time came. You shouldn't be making demands. This is Arthur's decision, Bobka said firmly. Arthur is too young to understand. I was too young. I'm his mother. I have been through this, and I know the consequences, Mom shouted. He and his sister have been through more than you can ever imagine, Papa barked back. Mom snorted, like you would know. Okay, I'd had enough of this. This family war had crossed the line. I didn't care about it until it started hurting the twins. And right now, it didn't seem like anyone at this table could be an adult save for me, my mate, and my brother. You guys really need to make up, I said. The twins deserve a united family, not one that's arguing all the time. We aren't the ones holding a grudge, Bobka rebutted. Let's just lay it on the table. You don't like mom because she's prejudiced against Unseelie Fay, and she doesn't like you because she thinks she needs to be the center of dad's world at all times. I stated bluntly. How dare you? Mom belted. It's the truth, Mom. Don't try to act like it isn't, I said. My mom was totally the type to tell a guy that he needed to give up his parents and everyone else for her. Mom huffed and tossed her hair over her shoulder. I deserve to enjoy the twilight years of my life with the man I love after everything I've given up. Oh, gods. My mom was barely 40. She might be a grandma, but she was nowhere near entering the nursing home. Her twilight years. <sighs> Someone get her an Oscar for Actress of the Year. Arthur crossed his arms. He made his next statement very slowly. Even if you don't like each other, even if you hate each other, you have to act like you don't. For the twins' sake. They deserve to grow up in a stable family that isn't arguing all the time. As their father... I have to protect them from that kind of neglect. So I say anyone who brings any drama around my kids won't be around them long enough to do permanent damage. Arthur! Mom gasped. He heard me, Ma. I won't tolerate anyone act in this way in front of my children, Arthur said firmly. So either shape up or ship out. Mom stuck out her lip and pouted while my grandparents didn't say anything. I was certain my grandparents could bite their tongue and keep it together for Chasm and Kalina's sake. Mom, not so much. I think we've discussed all we can for now, Lucian said. We'll pick this conversation back up if the twin's safety proves too hard to maintain here. Mom couldn't wait to get out of there. She stormed out like some starlet who'd been told she couldn't have a new purse. Lucian didn't bother to rush after her, which surprised me. Papa and Bapka gave us nods as they left. They thought we'd done the right thing. At least they'd always supported us. You okay? I asked Arthur as I turned to him. Yeah, he said with a weary sigh. Just wish things weren't so complicated. That I agreed with. You still thinking about Vara being a goddess? He gave a ghost of a smile. Now that I've had a moment to process the idea, it's actually somewhat comforting. Yeah? My hopes brightened. It is. She's always with me. But I think I need some time alone with it to process. I totally got that. Let me know if you need me. Always will. Arthur squeezed my arm, and it gave me a sense of comfort. Our twin bond felt strong again. I knew he missed Vara, but maybe now that he knew she was a goddess, it could give him some sort of peace. Emma, Ethan, Lucian said briskly, I want you with me. Come along. Uh-oh. Were we in trouble? I'd probably been too straightforward during that whole conversation. We followed Lucian outside. It was a starlit night, perfect for spellcasting. The only sound that could be heard were the waves hitting the rocks on the cliffside. Lucian took us to the middle of the gardens, where he turned around. As he faced us, he said, If you're serious about keeping the twins here, you have to learn shadow manipulation, Emma. There can't be any gaps in your arsenal. 
you must be willing to use whatever power is at your disposal to protect them, even if it's painful for you to go into the deepest parts of yourself to summon it. I immediately felt resistance. I wanted to say no, but Lucian was right. Shadow manipulation was powerful. I could use it to defeat Droga and Gabby. I had failed to perform it before, but I wouldn't fail again because I had no other choice. I couldn't keep denying that I had to walk down this path if I wanted to be successful in my quest. I'm willing to do whatever it takes to protect the twins, I said. Lucian nodded. Very well. Sit down, please. Ethan, you'll need to anchor her. Perhaps with a mate, Emma will be able to access the darkest parts of herself easier. The three of us sat down on the grass. Ethan changed into a wolf and laid his head on my lap. I placed both hands on his fur to keep me grounded as Lucian began the meditation. Imagine you are going down a dark tunnel, deep inside yourself. It is dark there, with no light other than the one you hold in your hand. Lucian's voice faded into the background as I fell heavily into the meditation. I saw the tunnel that Lucian spoke of, and my spirit began proceeding toward the exit as if it had a form of its own. My illusion magic made everything seem real, just as it had before. This time, though, I could still feel my body back on Earth because I was holding on to Ethan. His fur was a tether, reminding me I could return to our bond at any time if I wanted to break from confronting my inner darkness. I got to the door at the end of the tunnel and opened it. I entered into the same gray forest I had months ago. Everything was identical from the dark trees to the overcast sky. Nothing had changed. Standing in the middle of the forest was myself. She still wore that same shroud of black, a veil over her face. I approached her with more confidence than I had the first time, though her deadened expression didn't change. She opened her mouth and her red lips whispered, You will die. A shiver ran up my spine at her words, but I remembered Ethan's touch and remained where I was. We all die, I said, repeating the words Lady Magdalena had said to me months ago. It really isn't anything special. Ethan will suffer. My throat got tight. I'd backed out when my shadow self had insisted I had to accept his grief, but I already had. The fact that it still hurt didn't change reality, or my willingness to be content with that. He's able to accept the consequences of my death, as am I. She raised an eyebrow. Are you really willing to let him go? I wasn't deep down inside. I would never be. But I knew what would be would come to pass. I'd learned that after Droga had destroyed Dolinska. We are each other's destiny, but I have another job to fulfill, I said. Aren't you afraid? Of course I'm afraid. I'm more scared than I've ever been in my entire life, I said. But I can't let that fear keep me from achieving what the gods have planned for me. I have faith that Ethan and I will be together no matter what happens. And at the same time, I have faith that I will accomplish my destiny. Somehow, everything will be alright in the end, even if it doesn't feel like it ever will be. When you're willing to accept the darkest part of yourself, that surrender becomes power, she said. Are you truly willing to surrender yourself to your destiny, no matter what might happen? Yes, I stated confidently. I don't have to change the future or try to rectify the past. I just have to keep moving forward no matter what happens. I believe in myself, and I believe that once this is over, life in Malovia will be happy again for all fey kind. That's worth any personal sacrifice. Even if Ethan and I have to part ways for a while, we'll never be away from each other for long. I love him, and he loves me, so I don't have to be afraid of the ending. I know he is mine, and that I belong to him. That kind of love transcends everything. Nothing can stop it, not even death. It's what Lady Magdalena had taught me, and what I knew to be true. Droga could raise all his armies, he could destroy the entire world, and it still wouldn't matter. There was a knowing in my heart that even if I died, 
Ethan and I would be together again. We'd faced evil kings, defeated demons, and ruled a nation as one. I was no longer afraid of losing him. Love like this didn't come along every lifetime. I was lucky to have experienced it at all, and I'd go to my grave grateful that I'd met him. Met all of them, actually. Despite everything I'd been through, my friends were worth it. I'd been so lonely before I came to Malovia, but now I had a family. A crazy, stupid family, full of nutty people who were willing to follow me anywhere, even to the worst of places. The happy days I spent with them always made the sun shine through, reaching me in my darkest moments. Somehow, even in this hell that Droga had made, they'd made it heaven. It would be an honor to give myself up for that. I knew in the end everything would be okay, because I'd decided it would be. I had my community behind me, and that's all I really needed. I'd been surviving for myself, but you know what? I wanted to live for them. Are you done getting in your own way? She asked. What do you mean? You don't have to wait for happiness. You can have it right now, at any time you wish. You just have to choose to accept it, she said. Why do you sabotage yourself? I took a minute to think about it before I responded. I guess I did sabotage my happiness. I didn't take care of my health as carefully as I should, because it was tedious, and being chronically ill was draining as well as tiresome. I pushed my friends away and isolated myself, because it was easier to be alone than it was to be with them. I doubted my own power and had given up hope that I could ever be queen again, because that dream seemed so far away now. Despite doing everything I could to achieve that dream, I hadn't been able to hold on to it, and more than anything else, I was worried about failing again. It'd been easier for me to be sad, because sadness was comfortable. When I was sad, I didn't feel the pressure to push myself. I could be alone and not put any expectations on myself, because holding on to the hope that those dreams could come true and experiencing the disappointment of losing them was worse than the depression. Sadness was safe. Loneliness was safe. My mother had kept me away from other people all my life, and so I knew how to be lonely, even if it hurt. Waiting for the end didn't require you to do anything. You didn't have to fight back. There was no change required on my part. That wasn't who I was, though. Not since I'd come to Malovia. After we lost Dolinska, I'd forgotten. You don't think you deserve happiness, my clone spoke, and what she'd said was revolutionary. I didn't think that I deserved it, and it wasn't because we'd lost the crown. That feeling had never left me, not since I'd first come to Malovia long ago. I had imposter syndrome beyond reasoning, a voice in my head saying I was putting on some kind of show, and someday... Everyone would realize just how weak I really was on the inside. Why? Why couldn't I be enough? This went beyond failing to feel gratitude. I still hadn't gotten to the core of my issues, and although I felt like I was about to unveil the truth any second, I still found another layer to peel away. Maybe I didn't have to feel like I was enough in order to become enough. My mind could feel unworthy, but my heart could tell me otherwise. Feeling unworthy was a thought just like any other, and I could change it by making a decision. It was like illusion magic. I decided what I created and what reality meant. There was no such thing as the truth, no such thing as boundaries on my abilities except the boundaries I put on myself, because at the core of me, I was limitless. I could decide what kind of person I was going to be despite my feelings. I do deserve happiness, I told her. I'm worthy of being loved and getting everything I want. I just have to make the decision to take it. My clone smiled at me. She stepped forward and said, Hold out your hand. I extended my palm. She pressed a shadowy ball of darkness into my palm and said, You can do whatever you want, including uniting the crystals at any time you wish. There's no stopping you. 
Remember, the only one who stands in your way is you. My clone disappeared, and the forest vanished around me as I opened my eyes. I found myself sitting on the grass, a ball of shadow magic weaving around my fingers. Lucian and Ethan watched me with awe as I commanded the magic to wrap around my form. My body disintegrated into shadow, and I became nothing more than a wispy form of smoke. I floated above the ground in a column, then flew around the gardens, finding that I could fly even faster in my shadow form than I could with my wings. The spell began to drain my energy, so I decided to touch back down before I got too tired. I was aware of the sensation of my feet hitting the ground as my body materialized from smoke to flesh. I touched my torso and found that I'd become solid again. Excellent work, Lucian praised. I always knew you could do it. I'm so proud of you, Onowilka. Ethan jumped up and down, letting out a bark and wagging his tail. I scratched his ears and said, It wasn't as scary as I thought it would be, facing my inner darkness. Once I was ready to confront her, I found I could survive hearing the truth. Even better than that, I could decide what I wanted to do with it. There's no such thing as the truth, save for what I decide. Precisely. Most fey are unable to embrace the darkness within. It's a remarkable accomplishment what you've done today, Lucian boasted. I'm not done yet, I said. I want to do more. Maybe you should rest, Ethan said warily. Your spell work isn't quite back to normal. I know my limits, and I haven't reached them yet, I insisted. I think my shadow self was trying to tell me how to find the last crystal. How? Ethan let out a mindful growl. Lady Magdalena said I had the ability to find the last stone inside of me. She hinted that I already had the potential, I just wasn't aware of it, I said. Maybe she was referencing something I had attempted before but didn't work the last time. So what have you tried that failed to manifest? Ethan asked. There was an unseelie locating spell in the grimoire, remember? I tried it before, when you were possessed by the Lashane, but I wasn't strong enough to pull it off, I said. But I'm much stronger now. And what if I can use the other crystals to locate the last stone? I was getting excited now. That would drain their power, Ethan argued. I'm not talking about pulling from them, just using them as an anchor, a way to call out to the Unseelie Stone, I stated. Would it work, Dad? Lucian rubbed his chin. Hmm, since you're merely using them as a base, rather than attempting to channel their power into your own, yes, I think it could. I'm wary of you trying that spell again, Onowilka. It backfired last time, and if not for me and our bond, it would have killed you, Ethan said. I don't think I performed the spell correctly last time, I said. The incantation states that I have to find my heart's true desire. I wanted to find the stones, but at the time, Ethan, we were broken up. All I wanted was you. And just as the spell was supposed to work, I cast it, then you came running, because you thought I was hurt. So maybe the spell did work, he mused. I suppose we should give it a fair shot, so long as it can be done safely. I'll gather the necessary supplies, Lucian said, already hurrying back toward the house. Meet me in my office immediately. A half an hour later, I sat in a chair in the middle of Lucian's office. The furniture had been pushed to the walls, and the five weapons that held the Crystals of Harmony were placed around me in a circle. I held a white rose in my hand and a small knife. Lucian and Ethan waited on the outside of the circle, holding their breath. I just knew this would work. There wasn't any doubt. I pricked my finger and let a droplet of blood fall upon the white petals of the rose. In a clear voice, I spoke, Fey ancestors of the briar, lead me to my heart's desire. I had no thought on my mind but the unseelie stone and how badly I wanted to unite the crystals of harmony at the sacred gathering so this war could be finished. I wanted it so terribly I could feel it deep in my bones. My magic reached out to the Crystals of Harmony in five blue tendrils. I didn't attempt to yank on the magic, just let the tendrils connect to my locating spell. 
their warm power braided into my spell, though nothing immediately came to me. Come on, I thought, calling out to the unseely stone. I know you can hear me. You want to be found, don't deny it. You want to be reunited with the others. Show us where you are so I can prove myself to you. My shoulders started to slump, and I felt my body completely relax. A feeling of falling came over me as I sank into some kind of vision. I was standing outside of my cottage in Edenmire. I fluttered my wings. They carried me toward the crystal cave that was just outside of it, and I soared inside. Though the cave was dark, I ignited a light in my hand, which flickered off the reflection of the crystals embedded in the wall. I kept flying forward for several miles until the cave ended and opened up to a wide world. The sky was purple, and giant mountains loomed around me. Spanning before me was a massive lake of ice as far as the eye could see. Time sped up. I soared forward over the ice, but I was flying faster than I had the capability to. I left the frozen lake and entered the mountains, winding around the snow-covered trails that were shrouded by birch trees. Then the trees parted. I came to a massive gate made of nothing but amethyst. I looked up. There, written in unseelie runes, was an inscription I couldn't understand. A voice came out of the distance whispering something in my ear. Ear regret. The vision ended. I was thrown back into my body so hard that I fell out of my chair. When I hit the floor, the blue tendrils connecting the crystals to the rows were severed, and the spell ended. I groaned as I got back on my feet. Lucian and Ethan rushed to my side. The Ancelie stones in Edemire, I stated. It's not even that far away. The entrance to the city is located through the crystal cave that's by my cottage. Remarkable that we were so close this whole time. Ethan marveled. What else did you see? I gave them a detailed summary of the vision. I'm sure I could find it again. The path is burned into my memory. Did you see anything of the city? Lucian asked. I shook my head. No, just the gate. But I heard a name within my vision, I said. Irigrad. Irigrid, the unsealy city, the city of falling snow? Lucian questioned, as if pressing to know I was certain. Yes, I'm sure, I stated. But that's impossible. Irigrid has been lost for centuries. It was leveled to the ground years ago by the Sealy Fae, Lucian argued. It must have been rebuilt by the unsealy. They used their illusion magic to disguise it somehow, after the Sealy thought they destroyed it. I stated, The city must move places in Edenmire like the Spring Princess's Island does, so it can't be easily discovered. Ethan mused, Which means the Crystal Cave acts as a portal to the road that leads to it. Exactly. All we have to do is go through the Crystal Cave and travel along the ice road to the city. Once we're there, the Unseely Stone can't be far off. We need to go there right now, I shouted. Hold on, Ethan said. This city could be dangerous, and you're still healing. Let's take some time to prepare, Onawilka. We don't know what we might face once we get there. I didn't want to wait. Every second that passed gave Troga another chance to find this city and get there before we did. But Ethan was right. I'd successfully performed two incredible spells today for the first time, and I was tired. I needed to rest if we were going to venture into Irigrad and get ready to fight whatever was waiting for us. We definitely had tasks in front of us we still had to face if the Unseely Stone was to choose us. The Unseely Stone was the most powerful and the darkest crystal of them all. Not to mention the most malevolent. It had proved capable of interfering in supernatural affairs, even killing people it didn't approve of so no doubt it put us through hell before it accepted us as its caretakers. I could only imagine what we'd face in the quest to prove ourselves. And if we failed the trials, or the stone didn't choose us, what then? Would we be forced to go home empty-handed? No fucking way. 
I wouldn't let that happen. We were coming back from Irigrad with the Unseelie Stone in our grasp, or we weren't coming back at all. Chapter 11 Ethan I insisted that Emma wait a few days before we headed off to the Unseelie City. She needed time to rest after performing the locating spell, for we didn't know what lay ahead of us, or what kind of magic she'd need to summon on our quest. Not that she was happy about it. We could have been there and back by now, she complained the night of April 29th. She'd hardly stopped saying the same thing since we'd made our discovery. Tomorrow, I promised. Then we'll finally be able to end this. I wish you'd let us come with you, Stefan complained. He bounced Isaac on his lap as we gathered around the fireplace in the great sitting room. Odette and Kiara played with Kalina and Chasm on the floor, while Alexei and Theo aimlessly tossed a handball back and forth. Arthur brooded by the fireplace. Emma was sharpening her sword, just in case we had to use it tomorrow. You wouldn't be able to get into the city. Only those with unseelie fey blood can enter, which means Emma and I are the only ones who can get in, I pointed out. Some of us have unseelie blood. Lucian and I could accompany both of you, Arthur argued. Please don't go by yourselves. This is something Ethan and I have to do alone, Emma insisted. The fewer lives we put in danger, the better. We don't know what we're going to face in Irigrad. Exactly my point, Arthur argued. You could need our help. You have children, Arthur. They must come first, I insisted. Emma and I have risked all of your lives time and again, and will ask you to do so once more before the fight with Droga is over. We aren't taking any unnecessary risks unless we're forced to. There's nothing to discuss. Arthur scoffed and turned away from me, but I did not acknowledge him. Emma and I had decided to go as a team and leave the others behind, for their own safety as much as that of the children here. They needed to protect the estate while we were off getting the stone. We would move quicker as a mated pair than we would as a large group. It was the most efficient plan, so that was that. Lucian entered the room. He was carrying some sort of wolf amulet suspended on a chain, which he handed to Emma. I thought this would aid you on your journey, Lucian said. It is an unseelie charm, infused with my strongest magic. It took me many days and all my magic to craft. It will hold any magic from any source you drain it from, deeming the power your siphoning isn't stronger than my own. And, unlike siphoning from another source, such as a crystal, this amulet is rechargeable. It will be a renewable source of energy for you, if you ever run out of your own magic to pull from. Thanks, Dad. Emma lifted her hair so Lucian could loop the amulet around her neck. I'm glad you thought of me. I always think of the welfare of my daughter, Lucian said affectionately, as he fastened the amulet on. The safety of my children and grandchildren will always come first. Emma opened her mouth slightly. I just knew she was going to say something snarky about her mother, but I shook my head, and she caught it. She cleared her throat and said, I know. I love you, Dad. Emma gave him a hug. Lucian embraced her back, and I watched them with a sense of happiness. Whatever complications presented with Ivonia, Lucian always took care to put Emma and Arthur first. He was a good father, no matter what anyone said. I would have liked a daughter to favor, but having children with Emma, whether it was possible or not, was the last thing on my mind in the middle of this war. I couldn't bring any innocent souls into this world until I knew it was safe for them. Kalina squirmed at my feet, and I bent down to pick her up. She gave me a gentle smile as I cradled her, and warmth settled deep inside my chest like a warm fire. Being an uncle would have to do. How old do you think Irigred is, Lord Lucian? Alexei asked. Do you believe there's anything left of it, or will it be in the ruin once Emma and Ethan get there? Well, seeing as how we were cast out of Edmire in the early Middle Ages, Irigred is probably much older than that. I'd be surprised if there was much left of it, even with magic. Lucian said. Back when we came to Earth, we didn't have a home in those days. Many of us spread throughout the world before we came to settle in Melovia. Is that why there's such a big unseelie population here? Emma asked. The Fey are inherently Celtic, Lucian stated. We lived in Ireland and Scotland first before the Seelie Fey immigrated to Eastern Europe and formed Melovia. What was left of the unseelie after the war mostly stayed around the area of the British Isles. Fay used to be immortal when we were in Edmire, Emma said. We lost our immortality when we started inbreeding with humans. But no Fay that I know of would willingly mate with a human. 
How can we have lost our immortal blood when we have mating bonds that clearly pull us toward other fae? Times were harsher back then, Lucian explained. Even if you bonded with a mate, it was no guarantee that either of you would live long enough to bear children. Disease and war were rampant in those days. It was a common thing for fae to choose spouses from the local population of humans after a mate had passed. This happened so often that eventually our immortality was bred out of us. A shame. I would have liked to live forever, drinking, fucking, and carrying on, Stefan said. No one wants you around that long, Delmare teased, and she lifted Isaac off his lap. Did particular factions stay in certain locations? Kiara asked in interest. Not necessarily, but Alicorns have a clear Scandinavian background, Lucian said. Huge groups of Alicorns remained in Norway with the Norsemen until Christendom took over the area. After that, the Alicorns joined up with the rest of the unseelie Fey back in Malovia, though some took their Viking spouses with them and maintained a strong Norse heritage. Explains why they're all blonde, Stefan said, reaching out to ruffle Theo's hair. He smacked him away. Living with the Norsemen gave the Alicorns huge benefits, most of all the ability to prophecy, Lucian stated. My studies have uncovered that most Fey were unable to access prophetic visions until they were instructed in the art by Vikings. Really? Odette gushed. Oh, yes. The gods of the Norse pantheon and our own gods are closely related. It is rumored they are one and the same, merely in different forms, Lucian said. Through the practice of Norse paganism, the Alicorns grew a greater understanding of our own seven gods and were able to utilize this knowledge to become prophets and receive visions. In this way, the Alicorn prophets were able to pass down this information to their offspring, even if their children were never instructed in the art. What do you mean? How can Odette access knowledge she's never been taught? I asked. Our ancestors passed their memories and knowledge on to us, Lucian said. There are scientific theories being conducted examining the idea of genetic memory. It is said that ancestors may be able to pass on their genetic memories to their descendants up to fourteen generations or more. Odette is a fantastic example. She is able to access this knowledge from her Scandinavian ancestors, who lived amongst the Norsemen, even if she was never properly taught it, and use it to access her visions of the future. Lucian rubbed his chin. Now that I think about it, this knowledge of the old gods could remain in the bloodlines of other Alicorns today. Possibly. This means I could rebuild the Alicorn court, Odette said eagerly. If I can find alicorns who have a strong Scandinavian line, they're more likely to be prophets. There could be other fae out there like me. This all sounds very similar to how we summoned the water sprite to discover where the Seely Stone was located. Water has memory and is able to pass that memory on. Apparently so does blood, I said. Exactly, Lucian stated. All of us are connected, more so than we could ever imagine. Do I potentially have knowledge in my genetic memory that I could access? Emma asked. I don't see why the gods would choose me to become the world weaver unless I had previous world weavers within my bloodline to draw inspiration from. You very well could, Emma, Lucian said. In fact, you may have already gained some spark of an idea from them, even if you haven't yet realized it. Your ancestors are here to guide you on your journey. If at some point you find yourself stuck, ask them for help. There could be memory in your blood that you could access, which would enable you to succeed in overcoming whatever obstacles are in your path. We'll have to keep this in mind, I said, as I mused on the subject. This sort of thing wasn't taught at Arcania University, so the idea was new to me. Radical, even. But Odette was proof that it was possible, so maybe the theory of genetic memory could prove useful to us. Neither of us slept very well that night. Emma and I both were excited to journey to the city, to see what it would hold. I felt more thrilled than anxious. We haven't explored Edmire in a very long time, and the thought of going out and finding adventure again was like a promise that things were turning around. The next morning, Emma created a portal for us in our bedroom. We had nothing but her sword and a couple of supplies that she carried on her back. We'd gotten up early to leave without saying goodbye to the others, just in case one of them, particularly Arthur, slowed us up with arguments about why we shouldn't be going alone. Emma had tried making a portal to the Amethyst Gate directly, but it failed to work. It seemed to get to the unseelie stone, and to prove that we deserved it, we had to actually make the journey, and not take any shortcuts. I stepped through the portal first, 
and Emma followed me. We emerged just outside of her cottage, facing the crystal cave. I hesitated outside the cave's entrance for a moment, sniffing the air for potential predators. Emma had no such reservation. She stormed into the cave like she was ready to get this over with. I hastily followed her, keeping my ears pricked for any unusual sounds. The crystal cave was certainly magnificent. Light blue and white stones grew like icicles along the length of the ceiling and all over the walls, giving the cave a silver glow. There was no light inside the cave, but no light was needed, for the crystals glowed with magic to light the way. This cave must have been here for thousands of years, completely undisturbed. Truly magnificent. What kind of crystals are these? I asked as we wandered through the cave. I think they're a combination of opal and moonstone, Emma said as she gazed at them. She put a hand on one of the crystals and paused. We should stop to absorb some of their energy. Opal is good for protection, and moonstone will guide us along the path. Good idea. I put a paw on a large moonstone that was growing out of the ground. I felt my unseely magic draining the stone, funneling its energy into me. Once I'd finished siphoning power from the stone, it completely lost its glow, turning dark in the shadows of the cave. The light resonating throughout the cave grew even dimmer when Emma had finished siphoning power from a large crystal. The amulet Lord Lucian had given her glowed, and she said, My amulet stores more power than I could hold all at once. It's a good reserve. Quite a valuable gift from your father. We roamed down the length of the cave until it widened up considerably. The cave continued to wind downward until it sharply jutted upward again. I had to help Emma climb up some of the more difficult parts of the cave until the ground leveled off. The tunnel became narrow once more, and I smelled fresh air replacing the stale must inside the cave. I knew we had to be getting close to the exit. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw a black flash. There was a clicking on the stone ground, like nails scampering over crystal, and a sharp smell like that of another canine. I instantly whirled around with a growl. I raised my lip to expose my teeth, but there was nothing there. What is it? Emma asked. She put a hand on my shoulder in alarm. I thought I heard. Smelled. I sniffed the air again and shook my head. The scent I had captured was completely gone, as if nothing had been there at all. Even if something had wandered through here hours ago, I should still be able to catch the scent. I knew I wasn't imagining things, but yet whatever I'd seen heard and smelled clearly didn't exist, for if it did, my nose would give me the evidence. She waited for my answer until I finally said, Never mind. It is nothing. Emma nervously looked behind her and kept her hand on me as we ventured forward. Light began to shine through at the end of the tunnel, and I knew we were almost at the cave's end. Do you find it disturbing that nothing bothered us in that cave? I asked. No, Emma said slowly. Do you? I did, but I did not want to worry my mate, so I said nothing. When we emerged from the crystal cave, I found myself walking in four feet of snow, with it getting thicker still. Snowflakes were falling heavily from the sky, already weighing my fur down. The clouds were overcast above our heads, and all around us were bare trees, vacant of any signs of springtime. The crystal cave was certainly a portal, though a cleverly disguised one. Emma and I weren't even sure of the point of transit within, although to my reasoning we'd only been walking for a mile or so. The cave had taken us from the comfortable warmth of Ed Meyer's spring at Emma's cottage to the dead of winter. In the distance was a thin line of mountains. I knew we were headed that way. Odd for late April, I said, looking up. The cave's mouth closed behind Emma, leaving us in the gentle silence of snowfall. I think this is a part of Ed Meyer that's always winter, like the spring princess's island is always spring. Emma said. She pulled her winter cloak tighter around her cotton sweater. Walking through all this snow will slow us up. We'll get there faster if we fly, I said. I ruffled my wings, shaking them with snowflakes as I said, hop on. Emma pulled herself onto my back. She adjusted her long wool skirt as she settled between my wings, and I took off. It was difficult at first, pulling myself out of those snowdrifts, but once my paws left the ground, I found that I could lift us into the skies easily. I flew around twenty feet above ground, staying close to the earth so I could land quickly if needed. Your white fur blends in with our surroundings, and the snowstorm is so heavy that it'll be difficult for anyone, monster or fake, in to see us coming, Emma said. That goes both ways, I pointed out. We don't know what's waiting for us out here, if anything. 
What kind of creatures could live in a land where it's always winter? Emma asked. The dark kind that need neither warmth nor food to stay alive. This was a harsh land. If there was any sort of life out here, and I was certain there was, it would not hesitate to attack for survival. As the mountains grew closer, the snowfall eventually ceased. There was nothing but a blanket of white beneath us until it changed into a pearly lake beneath my wings. The frozen lake was breathtaking. It was an array of different colors, light blue and shimmering amethyst, and went on for miles in every direction, stopped only by the mountains which circled it. For some reason, the snow hadn't fallen here, leaving the surface as crystal clear and perfect as the lake had every right to be. The clouds had parted so the sky could match the lake, blending in an array of purple and clear sapphire. I believe it had to be one of the most glorious sights of my existence. Imagine having our skates, I said excitedly as I looked down. I could not hold a human form here, at least not without certain pleasurable activities with my dear mate, but I would try in order to be able to skate upon that glorious lake under the looming mountains. It would be fantastic, Emma called out with glee. Oh, I miss the ice. I do, too. My shadow skimmed over the ice from above, and a terrible thought crossed my mind. Oh, my gods. What? I haven't shot a puck in over a year now. I felt Emma's fingers tighten on my scruff as she said, Come to think of it, I haven't skated in the same amount of time. It was a hollow feeling when she said that. I didn't think I had stepped on the ice since Emma and I had gotten engaged. Gods, that was a year ago. I couldn't believe something that had been my life for years on end had faded into the background so quickly. Hockey had meant everything to me at one point, as I knew skating had meant everything to Emma. How could something that was so dear to us be forgotten about so quickly? It was like abandoning a part of yourself that you believed was everything for more important matters. But what could be more important than being ourselves? When we return home, we'll find a rink and go skating again, I promised. Yes, Emma agreed. First chance we get. We had to stop twice, once to eat and another to rest. I had been flying for hours, and I was tired. The day had been very long, and there were only a few more hours left until nightfall. I very much wanted to arrive in Irigrad before it got dark, but at this rate we'd probably have to stop for the night. I had no desire to face something in the dark, and it would be a better idea to hold off on the traveling until both of us could witness what was coming. With my wolf eyes, I could see in the dark. Emma could not. Eventually, the crystal lake ended at the edge of a white birch forest, and I could fly no longer. I landed at the edge of the forest, and Emma poured out the canteen for me. I lapped at the stream and still felt unsatisfied. "'Can you keep going?' Emma asked, and she brushed back my ears. "'You seem so worn out.' "'I will carry on.' I took a few weary breaths. "'But I cannot go on forever. Soon I must rest.' "'My poor wolf.' She kissed the bridge of my nose and said, We'll walk until we find the gate, then we'll decide if we should make camp. It's not much further. Gods, I hoped not. My wings were aching. I folded them against my sides as Emma led the way into the woods. The trees were thick and tall here. I didn't see any signs of wildlife, no footprints in the snow, so I figured we had to be the only ones out here. I kept my senses ready for any signs of the strange smell I'd encountered in the cave, but all my nose caught was the brisk winter wind. We hardly walked for half a mile before the trees broke and made way for a large clearing. I craned my neck back as a large gate loomed before us. The gate was a hundred feet tall and constructed completely out of amethyst crystal. Unseely runes spelling out the name of the city were carved into the archway of the gate. On either side of the gate was a crystal wall spanning in both directions. It looked like the gate was the only way in. The gate was even grander than what Emma had described in her visions. I couldn't believe we were here. We found the gate, I said. Now, how do we open it? Emma summoned her wings. She flew up to the top of the wall, then reached her hand out. It seemed to hit an invisible barrier. I can't fly over the wall or see what's beyond it. There's some sort of ward around the city. Which means we have to get through that gate, I mused. Emma landed beside me again, and I stomped a paw in frustration. But how? Any time we had to discuss theories of how to open the gate were swept away as that bitter scent hit my nose again. My body froze and I growled, Emma, get behind me. 
She scampered to my side without any question, putting her hand on the hilt of her blade. From the trees, six black figures emerged. They were massive wolvens, all black in color, with clear white eyes that held no pupils. Some of them were larger than I, and drool dripped from their fangs upon the snow. Their snarls filled the area as they set their sights on me. I had heard tales of them in stories, and had talked about them at length with Lord Lucian in previous months, but was unsure of their existence. Now I knew. Wargs, I snarled, shifter spirits of the unseelie, sworn to guard the hidden king and his secrets, even beyond death. They had been following us ever since we entered the Crystal Cave. No wonder I'd lost their scent. Ghosts didn't really have a smell, and if they did, they took it with them when they left. I surveyed the six males standing in front of the gate. I'd seen the stance many times, when wolvens were about to fight over a sorceress. Emma summoned a battle orb and tossed it at the biggest warg. It sailed right through him without doing any damage and exploded against the crystal wall. The warg merely growled in response. I can't hurt it, Emma said in astonishment. What the hell? The wargs had their sights locked on me. They had no interest in Emma. Something became immediately clear. You must stay out of this. This is my fight. The gate will open once I defeat them. What? Emma snapped. You can't do that. You'll be killed. I must. I shall prove myself as Alpha and dominate the others in order to show that I deserve entry. This is something I must do without my mate's help. It is the way of the pack. Ethan, stay back amongst the trees. They won't harm you. They only want me. I proceeded forward. I heard Emma's footsteps as she retreated back, though they were reluctant. If they hurt you, I'm coming in there, Emma shouted. You'll do no such thing. Trust that I will win this fight. I faced the warg at the head of the group. He snarled at me. I showed my teeth back, ready to fight. All six of them pounced on me at once. I bounded out of the way, and four of them crashed together in a heap of snarls. The other two were quicker. One went for my throat, and the other grabbed my leg. I felt their teeth sink in, and I let out a rough noise as I felt my flesh be torn between their fangs. Ethan! Emma screamed but I blocked out the sound of my mate's cries as I shoved the nearest warg to the ground, breaking his hold on my neck. I kicked off the one who had my right front leg and leapt forward, pinning him to the ground. I stepped on his jaw to hold him down as I went for the jugular. As my fangs ripped it out, the warg gave a yelp and vanished on the spot, turning into nothing but black smoke. The warg who'd gone for my throat was bigger than me and was back on his paws. He charged at me, knocking me down with the bulk of his weight. He meant to hold me down, but I used my shoulder to shove him off balance. As he stumbled, I went for the throat again, and my fangs found success. I grabbed into his neck with vigor and ripped, turning the warg into nothing but a hissing vapor of smoke that faded into the air. The other wargs had untangled themselves from the snarling pile they'd landed in and were circling me again. Instead of diving in all at once, one would attack, and then the other. My head was smacked to the side by a paw, and before I could retaliate, another warg would bite my haunches. I couldn't get close before another warg bit my shoulder, and on and on it went. There were so many attacks coming from so many different angles, I couldn't be sure which warg was delivering them. Frustration and rage drove me into a crazed stupor. I couldn't defend myself, nor could I deliver an effective attack when they were taking turns going at me like this. One of the wargs had noticed I was missing a back leg and went to kick out the other from under me. He succeeded, and I went sliding down to the ground. The harsh fall exposed my tender belly, and he dove in. I managed to get my paws underneath him and kicked him off. He went sailing into a nearby tree, and I scrambled to get back on my feet. I wasn't in time, though. Three wargs landed on my back and began tearing my fur to shreds. I felt hot blood begin to course down my fur, and I gave a groan of pain as I felt the wargs mutilate my flesh. One of the wargs bit down on my wing and pulled. I nearly passed out with the pain. It felt like he was going to tear it in two, and at that point, I lost control. That same red fury overtook me until I turned into a wild animal. I completely exploded, my wings forced outward, knocking two wargs down against the snow and stunning them. I gave a hideous snarl as I pounced on the nearest warg and held him down. My fangs went for his belly, ripping out his innards. He gave a whine of pain before vanishing. I attacked his friend, raking my claws down his back until his spine was exposed. He yelped in agony until he went silent as my jaws broke his neck. I heard more snarls, barks, and whines, but soon 
Everything became white and soundless. I ripped out the artery of another warg, and there was more blood, then even more. I knew the blood had to be coming from me, and somewhere I felt pain, but I couldn't truly care. There was so much death I wanted to revel in it, until it felt like this creature was who I truly was. From far off, I felt a cool hand on my forehead, then someone whisper, Ethan, calm down. It's over. My whole body was shuddering. The red and white haze faded, and details came into view as noise came back into my environment. I saw Emma's beautiful face, clear and steady. Her fingers were laced through my fur, stroking my ears. The wargs were gone, and we were alone. I realized my teeth were still bared, and I was snarling. I hastily backed away, taking heaving breaths. Had I turned on her too, and hadn't realized? You'd never hurt me, Emma said calmly. Your destiny is to protect me. I'm not afraid of you. She was the only one, for I was afraid of myself. I took note of my condition. I was bleeding from several places, so much so that my white fur was stained red. I felt woozy from blood loss. I couldn't put much weight on my right paw, a bad situation, as I was already missing one leg, and this put me off balance. Even so, I was alive, and I had defeated the wargs. That was what counted. What's wrong with you? Emma asked. I looked away from her. I do not know, Ona Wilke. She stared at me, then said, Come on, the gate's opened. We can go through. Emma went on ahead of me. I slowly hobbled after her and squeezed myself through the gate. I nearly bumped into Emma as she stood completely still on the other side of the entryway. What is it? I asked, but I had my answer without her having to respond. The anger that had left me only moments before flooded back as I took in the sight before me. There were no trees, no buildings, no city. All we saw was a big hole in the ground, hundreds of miles long and wide, surrounded by an embankment that was beside the crystal walls. Within the pit were tall mounds made of stone and crumbling bits of rock. Nothing more. "'What's this?' I snarled. "'The gate has led us to nothing.' "'This can't be right.' Emma murmured. She began to pace back and forth along the ledge. I was certain the city had to be here. My vision showed me the truth. Another trick, probably pulled on us by the unseely stone, I growled. I let out a rough grunt of pain as I avoided putting pressure on my right paw. You should rest, Emma insisted. The battle with the wargs was hard on you, and you had a long flight before that. You're lucky you weren't killed. <laughs> I stated. Don't make me laugh. They were not a challenge for me. All the same, we can take it easy tonight, then go looking for the city in the morning, Emma suggested. We won't get anywhere with you injured like this. Her words were kind and welcoming, even with how frustrated I was. We'd come all this way for nothing yet again. The unseely stone was a cruel trickster. For some reason, it didn't want us to obtain it. What else did we need to do to prove we were worthy? Emma conjured a small cabin for us, to get us out of the cold. I hobbled inside and found the area filled with fur blankets and pillows beside a stone fireplace, but not much else. I fell upon them as Emma shook the snow off her cloak and shut the door behind her. Do you think it's safe to light a fire? She asked, kneeling by the fireplace. I don't want anyone to see the smoke and know we're here, if there's a better option. You will freeze without one, so we have no choice, I responded. My shifter warmth would keep me alive, but her fingers were turning blue. She'd already been out in the cold too long. Emma conjured matches and used them to get a fire going. Soon, warmth filled the cabin. She sat on a pillow next to me and pulled a blanket over her knees as a crackling sound swelled over the cabin's interior. Outside, night was beginning to fall. The fire was the only light we had inside the cabin. I waited for more wargs or enemies to show up, but none did. We were as isolated as ever, here in this little cabin in the middle of nowhere. I can use a cleaning spell to get the blood out of your fur. I want to check your injuries, Emma said. She waved her hand, and the dried blood vanished from my fur, leaving it white again. She hovered over me on her knees, her fingers parting the fur so she could examine the bite and scratch marks the wargs had left. They're healing already, but we should stay put for a little while, Emma said. You can't travel far on a hurt paw. The soreness is already fading. I should be able to walk in an hour or so, I stated. Do we have anything left to eat? I'm famished. I think so. Let me cook something. We'd brought food from Earth, 
since we didn't know if we could trust whatever we found in Edmire, and fey food conjured from illusion magic would do nothing to nourish us. Emma gave me a loaf of bread and conjured a pan to place over the fire. I wolfed down the bread in seconds, while Emma cooked a raw steak we'd brought with us for the journey. We split it, and she gave me the larger half. Emma took small bites of meat until we were both satisfied. The food put me in a better mood. A warm fire and a full belly could do wonders in the dead of winter, and inside, my spirit felt colder than the outdoors. I couldn't believe we'd come all this way for no reason. The gods wouldn't lead us here if there wasn't a purpose for it, would they? The thought of returning home empty-handed, hitting yet another dead end, was brutal. I wouldn't accept it. The answer would come in time. It had to. Ethan, Emma started. What happened back there? I contemplated it for a moment before I said, I'm not sure. I'm losing control of myself, Emma. It grows worse every day. I see blood and I can't stop. I want, I seek vengeance. The guys told me a similar thing happened when you were rescuing Finlay from Pruska, Emma said slowly. Are you sure you're all right? I gave a hefty sigh. No. Then what's wrong? Let's talk about it. There's nothing to talk about, Emma. I'm a monster. She didn't roll her eyes, though it looked like it took her a tremendous effort not to do so. You're not a monster. You're just angry. I'm more than angry, I insisted. I'm enraged. I'm furious that we lost the crown, that we allowed Droga to take over and kill all those people. We're better than that, and yet we allowed him to gain the upper hand. This is just as much my failure as it is yours. I failed to protect you and protect my people. Because of it, we lost it all. We're working on making things better again, Emma said. I gave a harsh laugh in my throat that came out like a growl. We can't change the past. Can't change the past? Of course we can change the past, Emma said. We don't have to accept what happened. In fact, we can rectify it. Continuing to feel like victims and feeling sorry for ourselves isn't going to set things right again. The only way we can change the future is by refusing to accept the past. We have to shape it to our own will. And what if it happens again? I asked bitterly. We lost the crown twice, Emma, not once. I've nearly convinced myself that we're too incompetent to have it again. So you become this crazed killer just because you're pissed off that we failed? She asked. Maybe I like killing, I roared. Don't take that tone with me, she scolded. You might think you're some big bad beast, but to me, you're just a puppy dog, and we're not leaving until we get to the bottom of this. What's there to discuss? Ethan, what matters isn't what happened, but how you think, Emma said forcefully. If you assume that we don't deserve to rule again, that everything we try will just lead to failure and let yourself be devoured by rage, then we're never going to get anywhere. We are going to lose because you've convinced yourself that we can't win. And what is the alternative? Because the facts are staring me in the face and they can't be denied. I snapped. Fuck the facts. What do facts mean in our world? Nothing, Emma stated simply. I conjured a cabin out of my own imagination in seconds because I felt like it and I wanted to. How is that possible? And yet here we are, warm and cozy. We became king and queen against incredible odds because we decided we were going to be. Because that's what we wanted. That's it. You make everything sound so easy. It's not easy, but it's straightforward. What you want is simple, Ethan. The only thing getting in your own way is what's between your ears. You're not a victim and neither am I. You're not a puppet for this rage, a slave to your emotions. If you accept that you are, we might as well be fucked. No matter how strong Droga is, he's not more powerful than the voices inside your own head. I'd rather face the Dark God than get in the ring with my own thoughts any day, but I've still got to do it because the only way to beat what's out there is to conquer what's inside yourself. I set my tail over my back leg. You speak as if you already know. I've learned that I'm my own worst enemy, and I'm tired of being that way, Emma said. I can do or have anything I want so long as I think that I can and I don't stop myself from going after it. All my life, I've held myself back for stupid reasons that don't matter. What are your reasons, Ethan? Because no matter how important they might seem, they're just bullshit. We lost Dolinska. So, we'll get it back. 
We have so much to do and so little time to accomplish it. The odds are truly against us. You're hung up on the details, but the details don't matter. I truly believe it's our destiny to rule over Malovia. I've known that inside since the moment the crown was placed on my head, Emma stated. It doesn't matter that Gabby's currently reigning, that Droga's raised from the dead, or that everything we love is gone. It can all be ours again, so long as we don't lose ourselves. That's the true danger, Ethan. Not whatever it is we have to face. I laid my head in her lap. You always know just what to say. Because I am you and you are me. You're my mate. You mirror what I feel on the inside. So I know what you need in order to overcome what you're going through. She stroked my ears back, and inwardly I felt content. Emma was right. I could control the beast inside. The monster didn't have to take hold of me if I didn't let it. And I would allow it to no longer. Not just for my sake, but for Emma's as well. I decided, somehow, some way, we'd save Malovia and get the crown back. The details didn't matter. We'd figure it out, so long as we claimed and knew what we wanted was already ours. Do you really think we can be king and queen again? I asked hopefully. I don't think. I know. With all my heart and everything that's in me. We have to have faith in our destiny more than we have fear of the future. It's the only belief we need to have, Emma replied. I am not afraid of anything, Ona Wilke, so long as you are at my side. I'm not afraid of anything either, Ethan. You're here with me, so that's all I need. I let out a yawn. I was very tired and strong emotions had been coursing through me since the fight. Emma had calmed them with merely a few words. She was a miracle worker. I found myself drifting off at her touch and resting into a peaceful sleep. I dreamed of crowns and castles and happier times. I hoped they could be ours again. When I woke up, Emma was curled up alongside me, rousing from a nap of her own. It was still dark out. We hadn't been asleep for long. I figured it was around midnight by the time we woke up. I felt completely refreshed. I put weight on my paw and found it fully healed. I was ready to start traveling again, though I didn't think we'd leave until morning, and at the moment, we didn't have anywhere to go. Emma rose to her feet with bleary eyes. She brushed her hair out of her face and went for the door. We should check out our surroundings, Emma suggested. See if anyone or anything's come by while we slept. They would have left tracks. Good plan. Emma opened the door and we stepped outside. The sky was still overcast and everything was cold. Below us was the same empty pit we'd faced when we'd come through the gate. I didn't see any tracks or signs anyone had been by. Nothing. I guess we're alone, Emma said. She turned to go back inside, and at that moment, the clouds parted. Light shone down from the sky as Edmire's moons illuminated the pit below. My heart caught in my chest as I watched the moonlight gleam, creating a scene out of what hadn't been there before. Emotion rose within me as I watched magic materialize, fashioning a city out of nothing. Emma, look, I said. Emma came to my side. She gasped in amazement as she watched buildings rise before our very eyes under the glimmering light of the stars. As I gazed downward, a sense of disbelief resonated through my bones. I was stunned that after all this time, we were finally here. The Court of Night. We had found it. Chapter 12 Emma The city didn't appear until it was underneath the moonlight. That was the brilliant thing about it. The pit was an illusion, a disguise to keep it hidden. If you were looking at it in the daylight, all you'd see was the surrounding mountains, rocky crags, and a giant pit in the ground that led to a very bumpy road. The road nearly looked like diverging paths, splitting off in different directions around the mountain's form. But once the moonlight hit it, everything changed, and the illusion fell away. The road and the paths became streets of silver glass, which reflected the clouds above. The craggy stones became buildings, shifting into beautiful monuments that had tall spires, monumental domes, and high-spired architecture that was both foreboding and welcoming all at once. There was a stone staircase leading downward into the city. Come on, I told Ethan. 
We hurried down the staircase, which ended on an obsidian sidewalk. We took the path forward, gazing upwards at the tall black buildings, which were adorned with spikes and pitched towers. Ethan and I walked through the streets with a sense of reverie. This felt almost like a holy ground, a church built as a monument to unseely power. We passed a massive, broken clock tower, a giant stone bridge, an abandoned cathedral, and a stained glass window that was completely made of dark blue glass. The city was draped in a midnight hue that blended into the colors of the night. Every surface appeared to be lined with a magical, glossy sheen that reflected your gaze like rippling water. In its prime, this city would have held thousands of people, but as of now, we were the only two that walked inside. It'd been abandoned for centuries, yet the city was still clean, pristine even, kept whole by a magic the Unseelie had cast upon it before the war had begun. The city's lonesome soul reached out to us now, as if beckoning us to come home. Throughout the city and written upon the walls were runes in the Unseely language. We followed the runes and came to a canal, where a boat with hooked edges was waiting. Do you think it's safe? Ethan asked. I think so. I don't think it's a trap. I nudged the boat with my boot, and it floated harmlessly to the side. I shrugged. We entered into the boat, and of its own accord, it carried us down the canal. It seemed the buildings grew taller the farther we went into the city. There were a few signs the place had been deserted, a few haphazard candles that hadn't been touched since the Middle Ages, pages of old books that fluttered through the wind, and a chilling howl that whimpered through the mountainside. Other than that, there were no signs anything about this city had changed, except for the lack of people. I was certain that protections and wards had been placed around the city to freeze it in time. The people who built this place knew their kin would return to it some day, and therefore only allowed those who had descended from the people who had lived here to enter. I was keenly aware that our ancestors had built it like this to keep it void of outsiders. This city was for our people, and this was where we belonged. Glowing lanterns hovered over the canal and above the city streets, providing us with light. I was stunned the magic had held on this long, and wondered where my ancestors had drawn the magic from to keep the illusion going for such a long time. I heard the sound of rushing water, and looked up to see that there were waterfalls pouring off some of the buildings, crafted in an articulate design so that they flowed seamlessly into the canal. We reached the end of the canal and disembarked the boat. I put a hand on Ethan's shoulder, and we wandered past the silvery gates that led to the center of the city. When we reached it, I gasped. A massive stone statue stood in the middle of the circular square. The statue was made out of the impressions of hundreds of people, all different expressions and faces, the images of dragons, wolves, griffins, and alicorns placed beside them. The monument rose upward hundreds of feet, blocking out the light of the moon. I skimmed my fingers over the stone monument and felt a chill echo through my bones. It was like I could feel the suffering of the Unseelie, as if the ancient war had taken place yesterday and not hundreds of years ago. We should get a better vantage point, Ethan suggested, and he jerked his head toward a nearby tower. This building looks taller than most. I nodded and climbed on his back. We took a set of winding stairs upward to a domed tower. Once we reached the summit, I saw that the trip was well worth it. The stone columns framed the big city below in a perfect picture, nearly identical to a painting. I slid off Ethan's back and placed my hands on the balcony of the tower to look down. At the edge of the city was a circle of runes which glowed teal in the moonlight. I looked carefully at the streets, and realized that each road and street were formed in precise patterns to create a design. If one were looking down at the city from above, they'd see the entire metropolis was designed in the shape of an unseely rune for everlasting life. The buildings appeared to little bits of starlight speckled along an inky black portrait, the mountain range spanning beyond. A bit of snow trickled over the scene and I felt a stirring in my heart that was neither love nor amazement, but rather a sense of home. I can't believe we're here, 
I whispered, and tears rose to my eyes. It's so beautiful. Indeed, Ethan agreed. Not even Dolinska in its prime was as magnificent as this. I can't believe the Sealy just destroyed all those people, I said. They didn't, for the blood of the people who built this city still runs in our veins, and even so, Irigrad survives. Ethan said, perhaps there will be a way to restore this city one day. Irigrad was too gorgeous to leave unpopulated. It was a wasted gift. It deserved to be treasured and inhabited. There may be, but it is not why we are here. Ethan reminded me, do you have any idea where the Unseelie Stone might be? I didn't, and Irigrad was huge. It would take years upon years to search everything here. It must be somewhere within the city. The Unseelie Stone led us here, but it's hiding. We still have to prove ourselves by finding it. But where do we start? This place is massive. My eyes wandered the city. Where would a sentient stone wish to conceal itself? Surely somewhere grand. Look at that building, I said, and I pointed to the north edge of the city. There was the tallest tower, a skyscraper that was more elaborate than the rest. I bet that's where Septius took it. Let's investigate. I pulled myself onto Ethan's back again. We took the stairs downward and crossed through the city in the direction of the tallest tower. When I saw it looming overhead, I felt a warmth radiating from my hip. I looked down and saw that the woven stone that was embedded in my sword was shining a bright blue hue, emitting a hum that nearly sounded like a woman's voice. Look at my sword, I said, and Ethan glanced back. The woven stone, Ethan murmured. It's glowing, I said. The stones are drawn together. That means the Unseelie stone must be close. We approached the tower. From ground level, it was massive. I figured it had to have a thousand steps or more on the way to the top. We should fly up, I suggested. It won't take as long. Are your wings strong enough to fly? They are still sore from today's flight, but a short trip won't bother them much. Ethan crouched down, then lifted off. We flew toward the top of the tower, and as we did so, the humming from the woven stone got even stronger. I went breathless as Ethan sailed over the balcony and landed on the tower's top floor. It was a circular room that was open to the air, surrounded by archways. In the middle of the room was a stone platform. Lying on a black pillow on top of the platform was the dark necklace. There you are, I whispered. It felt like I was approaching an old friend as I slid off of Ethan's back and toward the Unseelie Stone. I couldn't believe we had had it in our grasp during the King's Contest and had let it slip away. Not a chance this time. I reached out a hand, ready to grab it. Before I could, smoke materialized from within the obsidian glass stone. I paused, and my hand dropped as the smoke formed into the shape of a person. Features began taking shape, eyes, a face, long dark hair. I became speechless as I watched a woman form within the smoke, her eyes a midnight hue and her dress a rich shade of black. Ethan froze at my side, ready to attack at my say-so. The sorceress raised an eyebrow, and I said, This hasn't happened with any of the other stones. The other stones weren't willing to alter fate, the sorceress replied. I am. My mouth went dry. Are you the Unseelie Stone? I am a version of the stone, a replica of its magic which you seek to use to open Edenmire's portal. The sorceress pursed her lips. After all the effort I took to avoid you, still you've found me. I can't say I'm not impressed. All the other world weavers who have gotten to this point have failed. Why did you kill the other fae that owned you? I asked. The ones who possessed the dark necklace were all killed in horrible ways. When I was in her care, Lady Corva put a death spell upon me, that anyone who had the necklace in their possession who wasn't a member of her family would die, the sorceress replied. It was a protective curse to ensure no one outside her line would obtain the stone without punishment. Of course the bitch would do that. What about Septius, the warlock? 
the necromancer was useful to me, so I created a portal for him to Edenmire and used him to come here. My curses cannot affect those who have death magic, however, so I let the warlock go. And what about me? I wore you three years ago during the contest, and yet I'm still alive. The sorceress smirked. The curse cannot work upon one who has already been marked for death. Ethan let out a vicious growl, but I merely frowned. She wasn't telling me anything I didn't already know. Will you come with us? You are the last stone we need. If you give yourself to us, we can unite the crystals and this war can be done. I haven't yet made up my mind, the sorceress said. You have not proven yourself. Not proven ourselves, Ethan snarled. We searched for you across the globe and found you. We came here to Irigrad. What more must you ask? There is one more trial to face, the sorceress responded. Then what's my final test? I asked. My power did not kill you when you used me in the king's contest. By that alone, I am willing to give you a chance. Defeat me in battle, and I will surrender myself to you. The sorceress said, We will fight you together and put an end to this, Ethan growled. I am not interested in the strength of a wolf. It is the world weaver's power I seek to test, the sorceress replied. She wants me to fight her alone, Ethan. This is just like you and the wargs. I have to show her that I deserve it, I told him. You need to stand down. We don't know what kind of power she wields, Ethan argued. It doesn't matter. I know I can defeat her. I faced the sorceress and clenched my hands into fists. I'll fight you. The sorceress smiled. Show your power to me, world weaver. I will deem if you are strong enough to possess my magic. The sorceress cast out her hands. From within them rose flickering, unseely lightning, black in color and profoundly dangerous. It ricocheted toward me, and I jumped out of the way. The lightning hit a pillar and immediately blew it to ashes, sending stone fragments scattering everywhere. I went rolling to the ground and winced as I landed hard on my shoulder. Emma, Ethan growled. He crouched down, preparing to defend me. Ethan, stay back, I told him. He bared his teeth, but did as I said and stayed out of it. I immediately summoned a battle orb and tossed it at the sorceress. It disintegrated the moment it came near her into nothing but blue smoke. She cackled, then sent another lightning bolt racing at me. This one slammed into my arm and I gasped in pain. I pulled back the sleeve of my robe and saw that blisters were bubbling along the edge of my skin and my veins had turned black. I found I could still move it, but not without pain. I used my illusion magic to conjure dozens of swords that spun in the air. I hurtled them at the sorceress, but she dodged most and disintegrated the rest. While she was distracted, I ripped my sword out of its sheath and ran at the sorceress with a crazed yell. I swung it at her, and my mouth dropped open as I watched the blade sail through her body like she was made of nothing but the wind. The woven stone in my sword made the hilt shake when it made contact with the sorceress's body, and I had to grip it tightly so it didn't fling itself out of my hand. The sorceress gave a cold laugh. Is that really the best you can do? I scowled. Okay, blades wouldn't work to take this sorceress down. I slid the sword back into its sheath and began dual casting with both hands. I formed a shield around the sorceress to keep her spells contained, but she touched it with one finger and the shield burst apart. With my other hand, I cast a whirlwind of blue and silver magic, intending to wrap it around the sorceress. My goal was to imprison her within the whirlwind and keep her contained until I found a spell that could damage her. But my whirlwind turned into a pitiful gust of blue sparks as the sorceress waved it off, slamming her hand back down so fiercely it created a crack in the tower. Ethan shook, falling to the ground, while I struggled to remain upright. It was time for some heavy artillery. I created cannons out of nothing and shot them off, but the cannonballs broke apart with a flick of the sorceress's fingers. I attempted to force my way into the sorceress's mind and take control, but I found every avenue blocked. 
It was an iron fortress with nothing inside but a deep span of black that I could tumble inside forever. I froze for a moment, locked within the reservoirs of the stone's mind before I found myself thankfully loosened from its grip. My legs turned to water at the effort of breaking free. A sorry attempt, the sorceress replied as she kicked me out of her mind. That won't work on me, I'm afraid to say. I wiped my brow of sweat and gritted my teeth. The unseely stone was sentient, but it didn't have a true consciousness like a person did. I couldn't overpower the stone without putting my own mind at risk. I tried whatever ideas broke into my head. I rained down arrows. I created explosives. I attempted to make her see visions and hallucinate. Each spell died out before it had the chance to take effect. Nothing faced her. The pain in my arm eventually faded into numbness as I continued to hurl spell after spell at the sorceress. Everything I cast either faded into nothingness or sailed right through her body, failing to do any damage at all. At this point, I was just tossing spaghetti at the wall to get something to stick, and every attempt failed. Meanwhile, the sorceress was keeping me on my toes. She used her unseelie magic to destroy the floor I walked on, creating holes in the stone that, if I were to fall through them, would cause me to plummet downward. I had to watch where I was stepping as the stone crumbled beneath my boots. The pillars in the room fell over, threatening to crush me before I spun out of the way. I used telekinesis to hover the broken bits of brick in the air, tossing them at her with all the force I could muster. I must have sent ten massive bricks hurtling at her at once, but all she had to do was look, and each one turned to dust that scattered across her shoes. One of her lightning bolts hit me in the chest and I gasped. I swear I felt my heart stop for a minute before it kick-started again, and I fell to my knees. I clutched at my heart before I had to scramble out of the way. I flung up a shield at the last moment to defend myself, and it broke into pieces almost instantly the moment her unseelie magic hit it. Ethan watched from a distance, letting out low whines as he watched every spell I cast fail. The sorceress gave a horrid laugh as she began twirling her hands over her head. A black orb spun above her, spinning outward farther and farther until I got caught up in the fray. Not of my own accord, my wings appeared. The energy the black orb carried sucked me backward, pinning me against the wall. I watched as tendrils of blue magic floated out of my chest and swam away, entering the body of the sorceress as she continued to let the spell fly. She was taking my magic for herself making her even more powerful, which was the last thing we needed. I attempted to stop her and put up a block like I had when the Lashane had attempted to drain my power, but she burst through my defenses easily and continued taking what she wanted. The familiar scars from the King's Contest, where I'd worn the Dark Necklace, began to burn like a hot iron against my skin. I screamed aloud with the torturous pain, and Ethan gave a few worried barks. I was reeling from her power as she finally let the spell die. I slumped against the floor, my head spinning. My body ached with incredible pain, and my limbs shook with the effort of standing once again. At this point, I barely had any magic left. She was draining me inch by inch, like she drained my energy during the King's Contest. Nothing I was doing was working. The sorceress was unconquerable. Every spell I had in my arsenal did jack all to harm her. I wasn't going to win if I approached it like this. What was I missing? I studied her carefully for a moment, pausing to assess the fight. I didn't know how I could defeat her if my magical reserves were so low. I might be able to hover a teacup, but that was it. The unseelie stone was just too strong, and she kept getting stronger with every bit of power she took from me. I had no magic left. You do have magic left, I thought. It's just not Seely. The answer became clear. I was fighting like a Seely, and that was the wrong call. My destiny was to be a powerful Unseely Fae. I was in the city of the Dark Fae, battling a powerful Unseely sorceress. I was going about this all wrong. The sorceress was a Dark Fae. She could only be defeated through Unseely magic. And shadow manipulation was my most powerful tool. 
I pushed my seely self aside and used the woven teeth I'd brought with me to draw from. As their power funneled into me, I called to my shadow self as easily as I remembered my name. I became the inky form of my darkest inclinations, my body turning to nothing more than a column of smoke as I took off sailing around the room. The sorceress shot her magic at me, but I outmaneuvered her lightning and whirled around to slam into her chest with as much force as I could muster. The effect caused her to stagger backward as I felt my shadow self float through her body, much like a ghost could, tearing at her insides as I did so. This was the first one of my attacks that had any effect, so my theory was correct. Unseely magic was the only way to beat her. I twirled around and managed to tackle her a few more times before the sorceress changed, too. She used shadow manipulation to become a violet column of smoke and took off after me. She entwined her smoky form against my own, attempting to overwhelm it, but I forced her back out of sheer willpower. I felt my unseely power explode out of me and found that my powers were weakening as she took them for her own. I pulled what power I could from the wolf amulet Lucian had given me and used it to channel my spell. Lucian's magic erupted out of my shadow form so strong that smoky tendrils wrapped around the violet column that was the sorceress and dragged her back to earth. My spell forced her to change back and remain in her physical body as I continued my assault of dark magic. The sorceress managed to raise a shaking hand. One of her lightning bolts wrapped itself around me and tossed me into the wall. I slid down it, going back into my physical body. I managed to get onto my feet, but not before she cast a spell straight at my neck. It avoided cutting off my head, but sliced off a significant chunk of my hair and the necklace Lucian had given me. It skittered to the other end of the room, and I found myself completely defenseless. I'd run out of unseely objects, and the necklace was out of my reach. I panted heavily as the sorceress stumbled upward. She rounded on me, preparing to deliver a killing blow. My mind raced to come up with some sort of solution. Lucian had taught me you could pull dark magic from things that weren't objects. What could I pull from that was here and nearby? Without having to think about it, I followed my instinct to a fierce sense of community. My ancestors had lived in this city, and this is where their magic resided. It had for thousands of years. I could pull directly from Eovigvad itself and harness the dark magic within the city to prove myself. If I channeled my ancestors and worked together with them, we could defeat the Unseely Stone together. I reached out to the city itself, pleading for it to come to my aid. I felt dark energy like never before come pouring into my body like a relentless stream coursing through every part of me. My skin began to glow with a deep violet sheen, and my limbs shook with the effort of sustaining that much magical energy. My unseely ancestors had been strong, and they'd put all their power into protecting and defending the city they'd loved so much. I allowed Irigrad's power to come rushing out of me, and what burst out of my hands shocked me. A pack of shadows formed at my intention, unsheathing weapons and circling the room closing in on my enemy. There were hundreds of them, ghosts of the unseely fey that had lived and died here, fighting at my command. I sent the shadows running at the sorceress. She attempted to flee, but from my unseely magic I conjured dark thorns, ones that sprouted out of the rocks and latched themselves onto her legs and arms so she couldn't run. The shadows I conjured tore into her, ripping her dress. Black blood dripped from her pale skin as the shadows ripped into the sorceress, the thorns tightening their hold until they mangled her limbs to ribbons. I continued my assault of shadow manipulation, slamming into her with my unseely form as harshly as my powers would allow. I heard bones breaking, and the sound of her innards being smashed as my form rammed through her again and again. Stop! The sorceress cried out. I yield! I drew my thorns back and told my unseely ancestors to back down. My unseely magic dissolved into smoke, and I landed on my feet as my form became solid again. 
The sorceress knelt on the ground, her head bowed. She took a few deep breaths before she looked up at me, giving me a sinister smile. You have proven yourself, the sorceress replied. You may call me your own and obtain the unseely stone. Use my magic well, world weaver. I do not care if it is for good or evil, as long as I am used for power, for that is what I seek most in the world. I will use your magic to accomplish what no other fay could, I said. This I promise you. The sorceress nodded. Her body faded into wisps of black ash until all that remained was the glimmering face of the dark necklace on the podium before me. I staggered forward, reaching out a hand. I grabbed the dark necklace and felt its familiar cold energy surge against my hand. I hadn't realized how much power it had when I used it in the king's contest. Now that I was an advanced sorceress, the magic within it caused my own to resonate with strength. You did it, Emma. Ethan rasped. He patted to my side. We did it, I responded, thinking of my ancestors. I couldn't have done this without them. I shook out my hurt arm. It looks like the unseelie stone is willing to help us. We finally have all the stones, Ethan said eagerly. We can return home and unite them all. Your quest is nearly over, Onawilka. I am so proud. It is over. My shoulders slumped in relief as I put the unseelie stone into my bag. I can't believe I did what Milana asked me to do. Almost. We still have to go to the sacred gathering, Ethan reminded me. Can you get us back to the estate? I don't know if I'm strong enough to make a portal back to Earth. That fight took everything out of me. We might be stuck here, I said. Pull the magic from me. I have strength yet to make the portal home, Ethan said. I channeled Ethan's power through our bond. I felt his energy surge into my magic, giving me a boost. Still, it took every reserve of our power for me to open the portal. Once it was formed, the portal itself shook and twisted, as if struggling to maintain the connection between the two worlds. We need to go through it now, I said, giving a wince. Ethan wasted no time. He used his teeth to grab me by the back of the cloak and pull me through. The portal snapped shut behind us immediately once we emerged on the other side. We were very lucky we weren't caught in the middle of it. We could have been lost, drifting in the middle of the portal's bridgeway forever. It was becoming impossible for us to get to Edenmeyer and back. We had to reunite the stones as soon as we could. I'd transported us in front of the estate. I looked around and found things eerily similar to how they'd been the morning we left. We'd spent nearly two days in Edenmeyer, but here on Earth, only a few hours had passed. Ethan changed back and put his hand on my shoulder. Should we tell everyone the good news? Yes, right away. I rushed inside. I found our friends sitting at the dining room table, having waffles. Everyone looked up immediately when we entered, faces expectant. I smiled, then reached into my bag. I lifted the dark necklace into the air and waved it around. The room burst into a monumental explosion of cheers, applause, and victory. I felt Kiara and Odette rush to embrace me while Stefan, Theo, and Alexi piled on Ethan. You got it! Stefan cried out. You got the Unseelie Stone! We have all of them now! Kiara wiped tears away from her eyes. I... I can't believe it's nearly done. Told you we could do it without you, I teased Arthur. He shrugged, but he couldn't hide the grin that was ebbing over his face. Might have been here an hour earlier if I had come along. I'll put this in the vault for safekeeping with the others, Babka said, and she held out her hand. I gave her the dark necklace, and she and Papa hobbled out of the room. I took a seat in the nearest chair, because I didn't think I could stand for another moment longer. Yay for Emma! Ozzy said as he loaded a couple of waffles in front of me, covered in strawberry syrup. I added extra raspberries for you because you deserve them! Finally, Jasper muttered, an expression of relief on his face. These can be over with. I agree, Mom said shortly as she took a sip of her mimosa. I don't want to deal with this anymore. 
Lucien's face was warm and bright as he approached me, bringing me into a tender hug. Well done, Jika. Well done. Well, let's get it on with, I said. Once we're done eating, we can go to the sacred gathering and... Emma, we can't go today, Ethan protested. It's been a rough journey. So, I pressed, though I wavered in my seat. Let's just get it done. You need time to rest, Ethan insisted. I can feel through our bond that your magic is weak. You're about to pass out. You need time to recover. I scowled. Okay, so the fight with the Unseelie Stone had been hard. The sorceress had drained a lot of my energy, both magical and physical. But honestly, was now the time to relax? Yeah, and tomorrow's your birthday, Odette piped up. You can't miss your party. I don't care about my stupid birthday. I care about uniting the stones, I said, throwing my hands up. Emma, you're weak from your journey. Reuniting the stones at the secret gathering and opening the portal to Edenmire is going to require a great amount of magical energy. And we can't afford for the ritual to go wrong because you're too tired to perform it, Lucian scolded. Once you've recovered your strength, we'll head out at once. Yeah, yeah, I grumbled. Lucian was right, but damn. We had the stones in our grasp. I didn't want to wait, and it seemed stupid to do so, no matter how tired I was. But I guess if I did fuck it up, the portal to Edenmire could collapse completely, and then there'd be no fixing it, because we'd all be dead. If I didn't have enough strength to complete the ceremony, it would kill me and everyone else. It was better to listen to what Lucian said. Good thing, too, because I nearly fainted on the way up the stairs after breakfast. We'd told everyone about our journey, the Unseenly City, and about our battles with the wargs and the sorceress. Recounting it all was nearly as exhausting as living through it. Ethan and I ended up sleeping most of the day before we had a quick dinner of corned beef and hash and spent the rest of the evening playing with the twins. As I rested, my mind kept going back to the crystals and on what I had to do at the sacred gathering. I must have run down the vault at least five times during the night to check if the crystals were still there. Sure as shit, all six were nestled safely in the vault, completely untouched. I was being paranoid, but no one could blame me. I wasn't letting a single thing go wrong from this point on. Our birthday party was held outside under the sunshine of a beautiful spring day. Ozzy had baked us a massive cake five tiers tall and presents were piled beside a table that was loaded with a variety of food and drinks. Everyone was in good spirits, laughing, chatting, and playing games while dancing to the music. I got the feeling that we weren't just celebrating a birthday, but also our success at obtaining all the stones. I was glad we were celebrating. It felt good to give ourselves a pat on the back after everything that had happened over the years. Twilight began to fall, bathing the estate in hues of purple and orange, stars dotting the horizon. I was wearing my charm bracelet, along with the special key that came with it. A couple of my friends had gotten me more charms for the bracelet as a birthday gift, so I wanted to be kind and show them off, although I was planning on putting it away as soon as the day was over. We still didn't know what this strange key did, and personally, I wanted to keep it away from Kalina. Did you get what you wanted for your birthday, Arthur? I asked. I sat beside him, bouncing chasm in my lap, while Kalina laid on a blanket on the ground. Ethan was in his wolf form, making growly faces at Kalina to make her laugh. Arthur took chasm from me and gave a sad smile. What I really want for my birthday, I can't have. But you do have us, and always will, I told him. Don't forget, we're always here for you. What about you? Arthur asked. Does it feel any different being 21? It's been a pretty good day, I said. But I'll feel better once I've finished opening the portal. Then we can focus all our attention on bringing Droga down and getting life back to normal. What is normal? Arthur gave a small chuckle. I think this is, I said, looking around at how happy my friends and family were. And I want to get back to it. Whatever's happened in the past, we can start over again. Maybe we can forget. Some of us can, Arthur replied. Don't know about all.
I watched Finley chase Samantha around the gardens, and my heart lifted with a bit of hope for my brother. Do you think you could move on to find another mate like Finley and Amantha? No, Arthur said immediately. I could never. It's just not in the cards for me. I didn't respond, but inwardly, I prayed he'd change his mind eventually. Arthur was so young, too young to be alone for the rest of his life, even if he'd mated with a goddess. If he couldn't move on from Vara, at the very least, I wanted him to move forward and find someone else, even if it took him years to do so. Arthur dropped his voice to a whisper as he said, Are you ready for tomorrow? Yes, I told him. I'm not afraid anymore. I know it's what's meant to happen. I'd convinced everyone that we needed to head to the sacred gathering tomorrow. One day of rest was good enough, and if my powers weren't back to normal by then, screw it. I was doing it anyway. I wouldn't take chances when Droga was still out there. Ozzy! Jasper! Odette called out, giving a little hiccup. She twirled around the party and nearly fell over onto Theo. Has anyone seen them? My friends had gotten drunk and had run into the woods to play a game of hide-and-seek. Oh, bother, we lost them, Theo complained. Not that we can see straight anyway, he giggled. What are you talking about? Delmare asked as she put a coat on Isaac. They went into the woods with you. Yeah, but we can't find them now, Alexi slurred. And they're not coming out either. I can still smell them, Ethan said. They were just here not too long ago. Well, then, they're too damn good at hiding. Odette put her hands on her hips. And we're done playing, so it's time to come out. I hadn't seen Ozzy since he'd brought the cake out. And come to think of it, that was hours ago. He must have slipped away to fool around with Jasper while they were playing hide-and-seek. If you can't find them in the woods, they must be in the house, I offered. Cheaters! Odette squeaked. We said that was off-limits! Ethan changed back and lifted Kalina into his arms. Well, they aren't known for our compelling honesty. Any of us, really. It's not surprising they cheat to win a game. It's all in good fun. I'll go get them. I stood up from the table and walked inside. I wandered the halls, calling out, Ozzy! Jasper! Where are you guys? There was no response. How drunk were they? Game's over. Time to stop playing around. Worry nodded in my stomach when no one answered. This was a big house, so they probably didn't hear me calling for them. I checked the kitchens and their bedroom, but didn't find them. I circled the bedroom, taking in my surroundings. All of their stuff was still here. It wasn't like they'd just up and leave, right? Guys? I called out again, louder this time. Ozzy would hear the fear in my voice. He wouldn't let me be worried. He'd say something back. Except all I got back in return was the quiet. Okay, now I was starting to panic. Had something happened to them? Check the vault, a voice inside whispered. Panic turned to absolute terror as I broke into a run, heading toward the basement. I flew down the steps my heart in my throat as I took the stairs in a rush. A wretched breath escaped from my lungs as I saw the vault door was open. I ran inside, clutching at my neck as I surveyed the nightmarish scene. I wanted to believe this was a dream, but the blood rushing through my veins told me this was nothing more than my cursed reality. The vault was empty. All of the stones were gone. Even my sword was missing. I gave a horrible cry of grief, and tears poured from my eyes as I hit the floor. Ozzy's words about his mate's strange behavior came flooding back to me. Traitor, I thought, and sickness welled inside of me. I realized the truth. The crystals of harmony were nowhere to be found, and Jasper had betrayed us all.